Uh, good evening. Uh, good morning. Uh, and uh, welcome to the uh, Committee of Council for Wednesday, June the 12th. Um, all members of Council are here. Uh, and before we begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of our uh, students that are here, but I'm going to hand it over to uh, Bruce uh, just to uh, um, acknowledge them. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted uh, to point out to Council, I, I know how uh, interested and concerned you are with uh, youth uh, in, in the city and, and employment, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware that you had in the audience today a group of our uh, top uh, bright students who are working for us this summer in the engineering area. They're doing uh, road resurfacing projects, uh, design work, construction supervision, so they're all in the top row back there. Can you guys stand, stand up? up guys. <laughs> so I just wanted to demonstrate firsthand that we uh, that we get it, and uh, we appreciate having them with us very much. I oh, appreciate that. And thank you so much, guys, for coming today. Um, so we're going to begin with the agenda. Uh, number one is approval of the agenda, adding or removing anything, uh, any item today. Council Willens. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair, I'd like to add a quick, uh, quick item, a discussion item regarding the wheelchair program opportunity at Pillmore Hospital for Council to support. That's through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe then that would be under community services as proposed new business item, and that would be uh, nine point, uh, excuse me, ten point three point one. 10.3.1. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon. Uh, I have three additional items. Uh, first is uh, the addition of a Portuguese proclamation. So, Mr. Chair, that would be item uh, 4.3. Second is an addition of a park naming. Mr. Chair, that would be proposed item 10.3.2. And third, I'd like to add a delegation by Mr. Jermaine Chambers regarding Family Festival. Through you, Mr. Chair, that would be delegation 6.12. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Councillor Singh. Um, uh, to the clerk, could I get just clarification on where um, the second one was placed? I, I didn't catch that. That Councillor Madero. Uh, uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, Councillor Madero is adding a proposed discussion item on a park uh, naming, yeah. and it would be identified as proposed item 10.3.2 under community services section. 10.3.1? 0.2. Oh, 10.3.2. Got it. Okay. And um, I would like to add uh, two items. So, firstly, I'd like to add a uh, discussion and close on uh, labor relations or employee negotiations and the position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. So, through you, Mr. Chair, that would be proposed item 13.5 uh, <coughs> in closed session. And uh, secondly, I'd like to add a delegation from Bill Baring on Brampton Warriors Sports and Cultural Club. Through you, Mr. Chair, that uh, item is, um, the clerk's office has been advised of that, and that's in regard to item 9.2.1, and that would be proposed uh, delegation um, 6.13. Okay. Is that it, Mr. Uh, Councilor Singh? Yep. Uh, Mayor Brown, you're on the board. Yes, if I uh, could add um, a position plan procedure criteria or instructions to be applied to any negotiation carried out or carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board to in camera. So, Mr. Chair, that would be proposed item 13.6. Is that it, Mr. Uh, Mayor Brown? Yes. Okay, Councillor Fortini. Uh, thank you. I'd like to, uh, through the Chair, I'd like to add a discussion uh, 
back on uh, some driveway uh, widening. There's, I think we got a lot of emails. I think there was some miscommunication and misunderstanding. I just want some clarification on that. And I also like, secondly, uh, remove uh, point consent 8.2.8. So you want to remove 8.2.8 from yes. the agenda? So through you, Mr. Chair, the proposed item from Council 14 on driveway widenings would be under corporate services. It would be item eight, proposed item 8.3.1. And uh, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Council 14, I uh, consent items to be added or removed. We'll get so to the I think you want to remove 8.2.8. So, um, so add 8.3.1 and remove 8.2.8. So, um, Councilor Pelesh, are you done? Yes, yes thank you. Councilor Pelesh. Um, just really quickly on clarity on the driveway resurfacing, can we include, um, or sorry, driveway expansion, as, as Councilor Fortini said, can we include driveway resurfacing in that discussion as well? Is that all encompassing? Chair, if it's the will of committee. Then I'm sorry, can you, um, can so we repeat that? Councillor Fortini's added item was on driveway widenings. I yeah. would like that discussion item to include driveway resurfacing. Does that have to be a separate added item, or is Councillor Fortini okay with that? No, I'm okay. No, I'm fine. I was going to talk about that, too. It's fine. So that is 8.3.1 still, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to uh, expand the scope to speak about... Uh, driveway resurfacing. Re resurfacing, is that correct, Council Yes, please. Okay. Um, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to request to add a discussion item on winter maintenance. It won't take very long. So, through you, Mr. Chair, that would be proposed discussion item 9.3.2 under Public Works and Engineering Services section. Okay, so uh, that's, somebody would like to move approval of the agenda? Uh, Councillor uh, Williams, all in favor? Carries. Um, number two, declarations of interest under the uh, Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Seeing none, we're gonna move on to consent. Would anybody like to add or remove anything to the consent agenda? Councillor Singh, are you on the board? Yeah. Right. I'd like to add 8.2.3 and 8.2.4 into consent. Okay. 8.2.3 and 8.2.4. 2.4. Is that all? Yep. Yeah. All right, Councillor Vicente. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, since we're adding so many things to the agenda, another uh, time saver, since we've all been briefed, to uh, put item 9.2.2 into consent. Um, so 9.2.2 is the uh, Brampton Stormwater uh, Management Charge. I think there was a, a few questions that I had uh, in regards to that. Okay. So, uh, as uh, another suggestion, Mr. Chair, seeing as we have... Uh, I'm sorry, I believe there's a presentation in regards to that right. as well. If we could also move that presentation up to the head of the agenda, as we have uh, here in the room um, some experts uh, whose time is very precious, and um, if we could move that ahead. to it. So, so we do have uh, quite a few public delegations. Um, so right after delegations, if possible. Through you, Mr. Chair, it actually is listed uh, as delegation presentation item 6.10 out of 13 delegation presentation items currently on the agenda. So we'll deal with it then. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Brown. Yes, I've got a few items to put in uh, consent with Council's uh, indulgence. Um, item 8.1 associated with 8.27 with the recommendation 2B. I think this is pretty straightforward until we've developed an adequate uh, collection of email addresses. I think we should continue with the existing printing option. So 8.1.1 and 8.27 
with option 2B being adopted. The second thing I was hoping to put into consent was 9.21. This is pretty straightforward. It's just the new cricket equipment we need to, to, to cut the grass um, shorter for, for the plane of cricket. And lastly, item 13.4, which is in camera with the staff recommendation. So if I can look to the uh, clerk, I believe there's a delegation on 9.2.1. Uh, yes, so 9.2.1 has an added delegation, so committee should receive that delegation before considering the report. Okay. And through you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, so I just to confirm, um, with adding um, to consent the presentation 8.1.1, and the corresponding report 8.2.7 with the recommendation for 3B. 2B. 2B, sorry, my apologies. Thank you. And also adding to consent closed session item um, 13.4 with the direction as set out. Yes. In the report. Sorry, um, 8.1.1, is that correct? Yes. Um, all right. Councillor Pleshi. Hey, Mr. Chair, I'd like to add 9212 into consent and 931 into consent. And 9.2.12 and 9.2.931, the school um, safety minutes, but uh, I'm at the will of council if they would like to keep that out of consent. Mayor Brown, are you still on the board? No. So that's the consent uh, agenda. Um, to what end? That's removed from the agenda already. Somebody want to move uh, consent agenda? Council Medeiros, all in favor? Carries. Um, we are at announcements, and uh, 4.1 is a proclamation. Um, for Nigerian uh, Democracy Democracy Day. Um, and we have Uche George uh, Okugo, uh, who's the convener of uh, Nigerians in the GTA. Um, he'll be here to uh, accept the proclamation. Yep. Do you want to read it, uh, Mr. Mayor? George Okego, who is here, um, we have the proclamation for Nigerian Democracy Day. Uh, we have a large and growing Nigerian community in Brampton that we're very proud of. Um, the Nigerian Democracy Day is a national holiday in Nigeria. It was originally celebrated on May 29th when the president was sworn into office. It was later changed to June 12th, the date when the freest and the fairest election was held in Nigeria in 1993. Nigeria, the most populous African country, is also known as the giant of Africa, with almost 200 million people and over 300 tribes. Nigeria is blessed with vibrant cultures, resources, arts, and crafts, music, hard work, and ever happy people who thrive in their diversity and embrace unity. Nigerians in the GTA is a nonprofit group of Nigerian professional immigrants who have made Canada their home, with the majority of residing in the majority residing in Brampton. On Democracy, on Democracy Day, Nigerians in the GTA organize a multicultural event where they showcase culture through music, food, fashion, games, debates, and drama. The aim of the celebration is to promote culture and unity and raise awareness, instill civic pride, and raise funds for those in need. So on behalf of Brampton City Council, as mayor of the city, I proclaim June 12, 2019, as Nigerian Democracy Day. About a decade ago, I went to... 2007, more than a decade ago, I represented Canada at the Commonwealth in Nigeria. And when they say uh, that it's ever happy people, 
Uh, it's a perfect description, and uh, I've been to a few of the events in Brampton, and this is just a, a beautiful community, so it's nice that we can honour and recognise the community today. So I'll, I'll bring this proclamation. So, um, Mr. Mayor, if you could go up, and then if anybody from the Nigerian community wants to, to come down, and then uh, after that, if, if you want to say a few words, you definitely can. So if anybody who's from the Nigerian community wants to come down for the photo. There's a lot of Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, yeah. So, Uche? Yes. Yeah? Okay, and so who's going to... I'll give this okay. um, right. yeah. 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 just if you just introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Kemi Amush. I'm the president of Nigerian Canadian Association, an association that represents over 300,000 Nigerians in the GTA. Uh, people don't actually know that our population is this much, and I want to give uh, credit to our young professionals here. We have about 250 of them, and um, you have done a good job by organizing this. So today, and uh, I hereby introduce uh, the press, uh, please introduce yourself. I'm the chairman of the board of directors. <coughs> My name is Benjamin Allison, and I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the Nigerian Canadian Association. So Nigerian Canadian Association is the parent body of all uh, associations that are of Nigerian descent living in Ontario, not just uh, in the GTA. But in the GTA, we are about, uh, like I said earlier, about 300,000 of us. So we form a strong political bloc. We've been working very closely with uh, our mayor. Thank you so very much for giving us recognition all the time for working with us. We recognize you too. Thank you so very much. Today is a very, very wonderful day for us in Nigeria. Today represents a day that uh, democracy got a different meaning. Earlier, we've been having elections, we've been having different things, but that was when we had the first free and fairest election in Nigeria, even though uh, it was annulled. But years later, we were able to actually get our mandate back. And um, just yesterday, the president of Nigeria, um, Mohammed Buhari, signed into law this day as a wonderful day for us in Nigeria to be celebrated by all, all over the world. So that is why we are here, and I give credit as a democracy day. So thank you, City of Brampton, for actually uh, um, thank you, the mayor. Even though the, the notice was short, thank you for working with us to actualize this day. And uh, 
like my brothers, they have mentioned earlier, we have a huge community here in Brampton. We are all over because obviously about 300,000 people cannot be in just one, one place. So we are all over in the GTA and working closely now with uh, Brampton, we want to do a whole lot more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the mayor and council, councillors, representatives of the corporation of the city of Brampton and our fellow Bramptonians. I would like to greet you first in three Nigerian languages. Um, in Aosa, I say in Akwana. In Igbo, I greet Ututwoma. In Yoruba, I greet Ekaro. These are the three largest spoken languages in Nigeria. Okay. It is a great honor for me to be here with fellow country people to receive this proclamation in recognition of Nigerian Democracy Day. On June 12, 1993, under a military regime, Nigerians experienced her freest and fairest election ever held. Although democracy was not restored until May 29, 1999, the six-year clamor for it made June 12 an iconic date that was eventually recognized as a national holiday called Democracy Day. Nigerians have enjoyed it since then and can proudly say that democracy is now sustainable. Sustainability is a concept that we, Nigerians in the GTA, are currently riding on. We are a group of over 250 professionals, largely based in Brampton, who decide to put our resources together and create programs that give back to the society. We do pro bono work with various organizations, partake in and organize immigrant orientation programs and hold networking events. We also organize social events to help create a sense of community to both old and new immigrants. We take advantage of our diverse professional backgrounds and synergy as evident in our slogan, which is moving forward together. Finally, we have decided to make Brompton our home, and we look forward to eventually playing our part in contributing to our commercial and industrial development through investments while helping new immigrants fit in. We Nigerians in the GTA hereby accept this proclamation, and we are greatly honored by it. God bless the city of Brompton. God bless Canada and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, we just want to uh, thank the entire Nigerian uh, community uh, and uh, congratulations as well. And so um, we're going to move on to the next announcement, which is uh, the proclamation for uh, Filipino Heritage Month. We have... Uh, um, Federation of Filipino Canadians of Brampton uh, and Rolando uh, Assis, who, who's here, to accept the, the proclamation. And we're going to get the mayor to read, read it out. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon. And I would note uh, we actually presented this to a much larger crowd of the Federation yesterday when we had the flag raising. Uh, that Councillor Santos did such a wonderful job, and she spoke in Tagalog too, which was uh, great to see for the first time at our flag pole. But we'll do this again, and Roly, thank you for being here so we can make it official at City Council. Um, Filipino Heritage Month. Filipino Canadians have contributed tremendously to the socioeconomic fabric of Brampton. Filipino Heritage Month acknowledges the long and rich history of the Filipino community in the city of Brampton, Ontario, and across Canada. The Filipino culture and tradition are deeply rooted and reflected in the communities across the city. Filipino Heritage Month coincides with Philippine Independence Day on June 12th, a day that celebrates democracy, freedom, and culture. It is a day to reflect on and learn more about the outstanding contributions uh, Filipino Canadians have made in our society and all over the world. Um, so June 12th is a very significant day for a number of communities in our city. And I would note on Thursday we have our Hallow Hallow celebration uh, at 5 o'clock at City Hall. So I'll uh, present this to... Um, rolling. Yeah, and if uh, Councillor uh, uh, Santos. Santos, if you can go up and join the mayor as well. Award. Thank you to the members of the council, uh, Mayor Brown, and I would want to invite everybody to join us tomorrow from 5 till 8 at 
in the evening at the atrium for the first ever Halo Halo here in Branson. You're gonna see what kind of dessert is this one, and we are also including some of the delicacies that we, that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to 4.3, which is uh, uh, the proclamation for uh, Portuguese Heritage Month. And so, uh, Mr. Mayor, we're going to get to you in one second, but I'm going to hand it to uh, Councillor Medeiros, then we're going to move to you. Uh, and then after that, what we'll do is ask uh, yourself, uh, Councillor Medeiros and Councillor Vicente to go up uh, for the picture. So, uh, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Dillon. Um, as this is our, uh, I believe, second year um, proclaiming uh, Portuguese Heritage Day. I think it's a, um, it's a great uh, uh, special for me and, and I'm joined this year uh, with the second Portuguese, uh, Councillor Vicente, uh, and uh, certainly I think we have Mr. Eduardo Vieira, uh, as everyone in council knows uh, from the Lusophonia Festival, I would invite uh, to come down so our mayor can uh, read the proclamation. And just lastly, colleagues, I would hope that everyone joins us uh, for the picture and that's uh, all of council that comes up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, and thank you to Councillor Vicente and Councillor Medeiros for the leadership role on uh, the big event happening this uh, Saturday. Um, Portuguese Canadians have contributed tremendously to Brampton's economic, political, and cultural fabric. Portuguese Heritage Month recognizes the richness of the Portuguese culture and the importance of educating and reflecting upon this heritage for future generations. The city of Brampton acknowledges the valued contributions that the Portuguese community of Brampton have made to strengthen our society and contribute to making Brampton one of the fastest growing and most multicultural cities in Canada. Raising the Portuguese national flag is a perfect opportunity to showcase Brampton's diversity and celebra celebrate our Portuguese heritage. This is proclaimed uh, on behalf of Brampton City Council for June of 2019. Do you want to speak first? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I want to, in name of the Portuguese community, I want to thank you to, to the city, to all the councils. And this weekend is going to be a, a nice weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And I'd like to invite everybody to, to be with us. And special, the 3 o'clock Saturday, we got the, the flag raising uh, on the city. Uh, in a, and uh, after that, we're going to have like, a lot of music, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fun and a lot of gastronomy, Portuguese, everybody can try, and all the communities from Brampton, the councils, everybody is invited the Saturday and Sunday to enjoy with us, to celebrate our day, Portugal Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, as per um, uh, Council Medeiros' request, he's asked uh, all council to come up for the uh, picture. So we're going to give a couple minutes. If anybody wants to uh, leave, uh, we'll give you about two minutes for everybody to clear out. Uh, and then we'll uh, regroup.
You're on the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, at the committee's indulgence, I would like to move forward item, what was the item for? 10.3.2 regarding park naming. Uh, and this is in relation to uh, the portrait celebration this weekend. Um, I have a motion that I put forward uh, to the naming of the park, uh, Zorus Park. Um, and this is in recognition uh, of the Portuguese community, as many uh, my colleagues already know, and, and many people in Brampton, that the uh, majority of the Portuguese community, uh, and historically the immigration that came here to Brampton, come from the, the region of the Azores. Uh, as such, um, I think uh, as part of uh, their new naming protocol, um, when based on one of the five parks, uh, I know we uh, had previously named uh, one of them, and I would like to put forth a motion uh, which recognizes uh, the value of contribution that the Azorian community has done to Brampton uh, by the naming of Azores Park. And this will be, uh, uh, if past colleagues, uh, hopefully the, the mayor will have the opportunity to announce it at our flag raising uh, at uh, this upcoming Saturday. So, um, with, um, so Councillor Madeira says move. So we're, we're going to bring up 10.3.2 right now. Uh, and so it's the motion is on the board for, uh, well, from uh, Councillor Medeiros. Um, and I'm going to get Councillor Vicente on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, echo Councillor Medeiros' uh, uh, words about the significance and uh, value that we have for people from the Portuguese community, many of them who came here to Brampton from the Azores. And uh, I am happy to support this motion. Uh, naming of parks and naming of other municipal uh, places is one way that we have to recognize the significant milestones in the community. And so I'm very supportive of this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Brown. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dillon. Uh, just to note, um, first of all, I think this is a, a great idea. And thank you for the initiative, uh, Councillor. Uh, Medeiros and Vicente, uh, and I hope that we can have that, um, just like we did with Black History Month, if we could have the sign available uh, to present to the community um, when we have the big event uh, uh, this weekend. But I would note, uh, we passed a motion last week um, setting out a process for the naming of parks and streets. I realize that's going to take a few weeks um, for the staff to make that official in terms of the committee that we set up, and thank you, Councillor Dillon, for helping us put that motion together in terms of um, the appropriate staff and the and the ward councillors. Um, but I think given the fact this event's coming up soon um, and given the fact we haven't had time to set up the process, I think doing this directly uh, puts the, the time sensitivity that exists on it. I would note we have three other motions that were passed at council with the Vietnamese community, uh, with uh, the Saigon Park, uh, the slain um, uh, religious freedom uh, advocate um, uh, body from Pakistan uh, and the ride for Raja. Those three presentations happened and were passed. And just a reminder to staff um, that I think this and those three um, were dealt with prior to we starting the committee, but then going forward we should use the committee structure uh, that we set up. But just a reminder, I hope that the three other ones that were done previously aren't lost in the, um, in the process. And maybe we could hear from, from, from Bruce uh, that there's some plan to deal with those three. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So, so I apologize. I'm not sort of totally prepared for for this item, but yes, I, I agree with you completely. We have a process in place for each of the decisions that have been made previously by council for the renaming, and so we we would move forward, and we certainly could do the same with this as as you've recommended. Um, I do have to say it's going to be an aggressive schedule to have a sign ready for this weekend, but we will do what we can for you on that. And, I, and I, if I recall from the last time we discussed this, there was five parks that have been yet to be named, and so this means that we have four. Uh, that means we'll be, we'll, we'll be caught up. That is correct. Okay, great. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Brown. And so there is a motion on the board uh, moved by uh, Councillor Medeiros. All in favor? Yep, that carries. Thank you so much.
Okay, so we're going to move on to um, Government Relations 5.1, uh, a briefing report from uh, Lowell Ruben Vaughn. Is there any... So we'll just let you um, do the presentation. Perhaps through the chair, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through the, um, the presentation. It was distributed. Happy to answer any questions. Um, but I did want to highlight just two points within the, um, the presentation. Uh, the first is just our um, update on Bill 108. We are continuing to obviously um, track that. It has huge implications for the City of Brampton. Um, what I really wanted to point out today is we have been engaged with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to ensure that the city is part of any upcoming consultations on the regulations. Um, so what I'm here to do is hopefully get uh, council support um, to ensure that staff can engage, advocate, and, and advance uh, council's priorities and comments and issues with the bill with the, uh, with the provincial government. Uh, so that's one out today. And then the last, and I would be absolutely remiss if I did not um, highlight the point that um, FCM has opened the policy window for submitting policy resolutions. This council has raised the fact that we need to become more engaged at FCM, so um, we're going to be taking this back as staff to identify any potential issues that could be um, submitted to FCM in time for this uh, September uh, board meeting. And given that we also now have a board member, I think this is a really good opportunity for the city to advance our federal related issues. So with that, I'll just leave my comments there. Happy to answer uh, any questions on the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Will. Councilor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair, and so happy that we do have a representative from Brampton on the board to bring our resolutions forward. Um, I just hope it's on the deadline of July 10th, because I think that's our last meeting for the summer before we break. Um, I'm wondering, though, if we could also highlight because uh, just to make it crystal clear to um, federal government in the election period with the resolution advocating for direct funding access from the federal government to municipalities. Um, if there's a clear motion or resolution that we could bring forward from Brampton, um, that would be fantastic. Through the, uh, through the chair, yes, we can look into that to see if there is anything. And then also there, there's going to be two other... Uh, policy resolution opportunities up until next AGM. So if, for whatever reason, we can't hit the July 10th, um, I get that is short turnaround time, there will be three, uh, two other opportunities throughout 2019 and 2020 that we can proactively act against. And do the Board of Directors meetings actually happen in Ottawa, or do they happen conference call, or how does it work? Uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the chair, um, there is one meeting that's dedicated in Ottawa, that's November, and that ties to the advocacy days where the FCM board members go meets with um, MPs. I believe that that's still happening this year, even though it is a election year. And then they do move it around um, Canada. I also believe that there are meetings that do, I think there is also conference call capabilities as okay. well. Okay, great, thanks, Lou. Um, thank you, and so um, Lowell, uh, Lowell's is 5.1, the presentation, that is a 5.2 as well. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, there is. But in Lowell's presentation, 5.1, he did have a slide up moving, um, recommending some uh, motions, but a member of council will have to, member of committee will have to move those. Right, if that's so, um, Councilor Santos, you want to move those? Yeah. So there's some motions on uh, the board. Uh, does anybody need any time to read them, or are you guys okay with it? You good with it? Okay, so moved by Council. so Councilor Santos, you have a question? About the report, uh, specifically. So 5.2. Yeah. So let's handle 5.1 first. Okay. And then, so you're going to move it. Yeah. Uh, everybody, in, any, all in favor? So that carries. 5.1, and now we're going to get to 5.2, which is the report and the recommendations. You're on the board. Thank you. Through you, Chair. So. Um, Thanks for the report, Lowell. I'm happy to move it. Um, my only question is regarding the timeline. If we do want to send somebody to the board of AMO, um, our timeline to actually pass a resolution in order to do that um, from our council, I'm just concerned if that we might miss that window. And I'd hate to call a special meeting just to have a motion passed <laughs> to send someone to AMO. Uh, through the chair, 
Um, in terms of any member of council who's interested in participating at the AMO board meeting, the sooner we can get a resolution. Now, AMO does have kind of proposed um, council resolution wording, so we do have a council meeting next week. So if there is any members of council that is interested, we can bring forward a motion then, and then that would be part of a package. Once AMO does open up their, um, uh, their nomination process, then the city of Brampton would be ready to go. Perfect, so if we can just um, bring that forward as a item on the agenda for next week for council, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, so um, Councillor Santos, do you wanna move 5.2 uh, as well? Okay, so 5.2 is on the board, the recommendations. Uh, all Through in favor? The chair, just uh, one really sh quick update. Um, the I should just mention to council that the um, opportunity to request delegations are now open, so we can do that as if council approves this. So. Thank you, Bill. So, um, did you want to get on board? Right, so, all in favor? Carries. So, um, next is the uh, delegations uh, portion of the agenda. Um, and uh, just a note uh, to council colleagues, we're gonna keep, uh, uh, keep it at five minutes, uh, unless very urgent, we can extend time. Uh, and so next is 6.1, um, delegation uh, regarding the notice of intention to amend uh, the mobile licensing bylaw. Um, which is, uh, we're also gonna bring up 8.2.5 uh, as well. And so I'm looking to the clerk, if you can just uh, advise who the delegates are. Through you, Mr. Delegates. Chair. So there are, the, the delegations are open to anyone who wishes to speak to this item, which is changes to the taxi licensing requirements and amendments to the mobile licensing bylaw 67, 2014. We have three individuals that have requested to delegate so far. Uh, Doug Taylor, consultant, Bram City Taxi and A1 Taxi. Uh, Zafar Tariq, taxi industry member, and Narinder Pander, taxi industry member. So if those three individuals can come forward in that order, and they'll each uh, be given five minutes to speak as, as indicated by the chair. Thank you. Uh, so if you could just, uh, just quickly state your name as well, and then yes. you have five minutes. My name is Doug Taylor. Our company is Wise Training Concepts. We are consultants to the taxi industry. Um, I'm here today to speak on behalf of Bram City Taxi, A1 Taxi, and other industry stakeholders. Uh, we are, in responding to the staff report, I'd like to address some items to ensure clarity and transparency regarding the statements from staff. In addition, on behalf of my clients, I'd like to explain their requests that were previously listed at the meeting of council in February of this year. Firstly, that the City of Brampton put an immediate freeze on the issuance of any new taxi plates until an appropriate formula that will reflect the current transportation environment. A formula that relies heavily on population is doomed for failure and has been proven in the City of Toronto using the Coopers and Librand reports. Coopers and Librands are a consulting company that has done extensive taxi reviews in the City of Toronto, which a lot of municipalities uh, outside of Toronto have used as guidance. Uh, a discussion paper in 2012, as recently as 2012 by Cooper and Librands, reported the following, and I quote, the results of the study suggest that there is either an adequate number or potentially an oversupply of taxi cabs operating in the city. Researchers noted long lineups of cabs with the exception of the entertainment district on Saturday night, and no lines of passengers waiting for taxi cabs. So no one was waiting at cab stands for taxis. Furthermore, the average wait times for taxi cabs at cab stands was 39 minutes, and the longest wait time recorded was more than two hours. It was recorded that the wait time for all passengers was less than one minute. These results suggest that the demand for taxi trips by residents and tourists is more than met by the current number of taxi cabs operating in the city. The pattern of, pattern of long waits between fares supports the taxi cab industry's assertion that new licenses would, event, would negatively impact driver incomes and add to overcrowding at cab stands. Industry view during the consultations, the city heard from the industry that there is an oversupply of taxi cabs as well. Too many taxi cabs shared amongst too few fares were negatively affecting driver incomes and the health of the industry. Furthermore, on page five of the final report of 2013 of Coopers and Librand, they state the following just briefly. It is our conclusion that based on the current passenger service levels, current number of taxis are appropriate to meet the current demand. 
Please note that this study was conducted in 2012 and finalized in 2013 at the infancy stage of TNCs or PTCs. As confirmed by city staff in their conclusion, the number of trips completed by taxi cab cabs has dropped by 16%, but the number of trips completed by PTCs is twice that of the taxi industry. With this admission by staff, there's apparently no reason to issue additional taxi cab plates as of this date, and furthermore, formulas, future formulas should include less weight assessed by population and more weight considered on change to business industry. Secondly, uh, increase the shelf life of current unused taxi plate. When an owner returns the plate to the city is for the purpose of safekeeping. Allowing plate owners the opportunity to settle estates, transfers, hardships, or other. We recommend that if a time limit must be placed on an unused taxi plate, that it be for a minimum of two years. This allows owners to make decisions based on the current economics of the industry, their own health and long-term commitments. Regarding cameras not required uh, for taxis, cost of this equipment is prohibitive for taxi cab operators. While staff concludes the importance of in vehicle cameras, if it is a mandate of the City of Brampton to protect the safety of the public and the driver, then based on the previous conclusion that PTCs accommodate twice as many completed fares, then the City must direct all vehicles for hire to do likewise or compensate the taxi industry for this punitive financial burden, as well as the financial losses of the taxi cab plate values. Uh, no restrictions for taxi cab brokerages to be open 24 hours a day. We ask why is it so important to embrace technology as it pertains to ride sharing companies when they, are no, when they have no bricks or mortars. Isn't it enough that taxi cab brokerages employ local people when they could quite easily use offshore resources such as those used by massive corporations. People in general like apps, they requested apps, uh, and apps were pushed as a major marketing tool by TNCs and PTCs. This is not new to the taxi industry as they have been using apps for years long before those companies. So if it is good enough for those companies, why should brokerages be forced to pay unnecessary staff wages during times when calls are minimal and can be taken and dispatched immediately as the same as the PTCs. Reduce taxi plate renewal fees and eliminate CPI increase to renewal fees. Taxi cab operators, brokers, and staff seldom, if ever, receive CPI increases, and by demanding these increases annually, it further cuts into the income of all parties mentioned. Um, uh, You've reached five minutes. Do you want to wrap up? I'm just about finished, right. uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Remove all inspections for all licensed taxis. The current situation requires operators to ensure their vehicle is safety certified by a licensed mechanic. Vehicles on extensions that are older than seven years require an inspection, an inspection by the city which requires a fee. The waste of time before a vehicle can go into service can be affected by weekends, statutory holidays, and any other for unforeseen circumstances such as staff shortages. It is imperative for the operator to get the vehicle on the road as soon as possible in order to start paying the mounting bills associated with the taxi industry. In reference to the staff report of 8.2.5-14, it shows the decrease in value from 2015. I suggest that there is more than a 16% decrease in business, and furthermore, I'd like to point out that prior to the invasion of PTCs and other TNCs, the value of taxicab plates was even higher. Owners, brokerages, drivers, and employees have devoted their life and in some cases their life savings to the taxi cab industry in Brampton, and they've played by the rules set up by municipal regulatory authority. It seems contradictory that others don't seem to have to do the same. The taxi cab needs the ability to compete in a more beneficial financial manner and less in a restrictive manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Mr. Zuffer Zarek. Uh, and you, my you name have, is. Yeah, five minutes. My name is Zafar Tariq, and good morning, councillors and everybody. As you all know, that tax industry is growing, going through turmoil, and now we have received the staff report for certain changes in the bylaw. The recommendations made by the staff are good, which are given in public notice, but there is still room for certain steps which have a lot of value for tax industry. I will discuss only three, which staff is looking towards the council to make the decision on. 
Number one, vehicle requirement be removed for renewal of inactive plates. Your Honor, I have a taxi plate which I purchased for $110,000 to secure my job. I paid about $3,000 to the city of Brampton in just to transfer that, that deal, to complete the deal. Now this plate is in, at the shelf at the city of Brampton since November 2018. The reason is only because drivers cannot, drivers can drive for ride sharing and city has put many restrictions on taxis which cost a lot of money. The result is drivers are not available. This taxi plate was supposed to be renewed on May 31st. One requirement is that I have to bring vehicle with camera and insurance in place which will cost me at least $15,000 just to renew it. As there is no drivers available, so as soon as it is renewed, I will giving back to the city at the same time. Your Honor, I don't feel that it is reasonable to spend so much money and renew that plate. It is not only me, there is about 35 to 40 individuals whose plates are sitting there. So all I'm asking is, please remove the requirement of vehicle registration for inactive plates, number one. Number two, review the formula of new taxi place issuance. I'm not saying do it right now, I'm saying in future review the formula. Why? There are so many factors, but I will discuss two factors just for your knowledge. Number one, as staff reports, that 16% business has gone down since ride-sharing companies got legal. But this factor is totally absent in the formula of issuance of taxi plates. Number two, secondly, in present formula, there is another factor of Sheridan College population. Your Honor, this population is always increasing but the, to be honest, the young gen generation is using the smartphones and the ride-sharing apps. They do not use taxis very often nowadays. So in short, there are many, many factors which can be discussed and can be reviewed in, because the current formula is not representing the current situation. My last point and the third point is, that remove the requirement of vehicle cameras. As per staff report, city of Mississauga, Markham, Oakville, Niagara, and all surrounding cities, most of them, they do not have the camera requirement in the taxi cabs. Even Bolton, Georgetown, Caledon do not have it. And if they have it, ask to the staff if they have it. In my information, they don't have it. Only difference is that these cities put responsibility on the drivers that if you want to have it, nobody stop you to have it. If you don't feel secure, you can have it. So all I'm saying is don't make it mandatory that everybody should have it when the citizens are very, very nice. You know, from our surrounding cities, the Mississauga cab drivers, they can just cross the border of Steeles Avenue and come and pick up the passengers from here in Brampton. They do not have to have a camera, but we are forced, the Brampton taxi drivers, to have the camera. Just the same, all other cities, all they can come and pick up the passengers, but we have to pay for it. You have, you have 30 seconds, Mr. Tharp. So, Your Honor, all I'm saying is that remove the requirement for camera, or otherwise consider to pay for camera, or use the dash cameras. Your, Your Honor, these are my suggestions which are already in place in Mississauga. And the beauty is that their staff brought, brought that report 18 months ago to implement, those, to implement these things. But all I'm saying is that our city is just like Mississauga, Oakville, and Vaughan. So please do it. Thank you. So, so a couple of, uh, I just got a question for clarification. Councilor Fertini wants to get on the board, I believe, as well. Uh, you gave three uh, recommendations. Number one was remove the registration of inactive plates. Yeah. Uh, number three was requirement of, uh, remove requirement of cameras. What was number two? The review, review the 
formula for issuance of new taxi plates in future. So you want to review the formula of new uh, taxi plates? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Fatini, do you want to speak after or? or you, pardon me? No, we have one more delegation. Okay, so I, th I believe Mr. Narinder Pandit. So he's not speaking anymore, and so that concludes the delegations. Right. Are, is there anybody else here who wants to delegate uh, in regards to um, this this issue uh, regarding taxi? Seeing none. Okay. Um, we're going to get to. Uh, we're going to bring the report forward, uh, and we're going to see if there's any uh, questions from um, council. Councilor Fertini, you're on the board. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I was just going to call for a recess because there's lots to go through this. And, you know, we just, most of it, some of it we got uh, the other day. Uh, maybe if you could call for a 10-minute recess. Okay, so Councilor Fertini has asked for a 10-minute recess. Do we... So, um, so he's moved 10 minute recess, all in favor? Okay, so sorry, before we get to that, we're gonna uh, get to Councilor Bowman. Do you wanna speak on yeah, that? Yeah, I just, I just uh, thank you for you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thanks for you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify um, Councilor Fortini's request for a recess. Why, uh, what, are we, what are we gonna discuss or are we having a meeting? Or? I think he just wants to clarify some things. He said there's a lot of stuff that um, that the delegate delegations have brought up, uh, and so he just wants to go through it. Oh, so Councillor Fortini, you want to talk to staff? Is that is yeah. that what it is? Yeah. Okay, because I know we've got a lot of we've got 13 delegations, so I don't want to have no, I know. all the other delegations being held up. So 10 minutes. Yep. So 10 minutes. All in favor? I just thank you. Can we see a, can we see some hands? We, so we got a we got a a, a, a we're voting on seeing if there's a 10 minute uh, recess. So all in favor? So that carries. Thank you. So we'll be back at 10:46. Uh, uh, if I can ask uh, council members to uh, come back to the chambers just so we can get quorum. Okay, so recess is over, and uh, we are back, and so the delegations uh, were completed, and uh, um, Councillor Fatini had requested a little bit of time uh, just to get some clarification on some of the uh, requests from uh, the delegations, and he wanted to uh, uh, get some clarification from um, staff. And so, uh, Clerk, if we can bring the, the report uh, up on the screen and the recommendations as well. Right, so these are the, the recommendations, uh, and I believe uh, Councillor Fortini uh, wants to uh, add some amendments to this. Uh, and so, uh, Councillor Fortini, do you want me to uh, read it over? Uh, and so, um, there's some amendments he wants to add, so, he, so it would be, so I'll read them off one by one. Uh, number one is to renew uh, inactive taxi plates without uh, registration uh, of vehicle, like Mississauga. Uh, number two would be uh, review the formula for new taxi plates uh, by 2021. Um, number three would be the, uh, like Mississauga, have optional cameras. 
Uh, number four would be allow taxi brokerages to use app at night uh, and to remove the requirement for the 24-7 call taking. Uh, and number six would be for the stickers, the required stickers, allow them to be detachable. So you can take them, uh, put them on or off of the vehicle. Is that okay, Council Fertini? Sorry, I'm going to get you on the board. You're on the board. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely, because some of them, uh, to compete against Mississauga, we're getting a lot of Mississauga taxis coming here, picking up people, and they don't obey the same rules. So between Uber and them, they're really having a hard time. And on the car, also the stickers is because they only have a second car. Uh, always, and it's, it's very hard to, to uh, operate two vehicles. Um, I also wanted to add on that is uh, uh, to uh, bring back the taxi committee, even if we meet twice a year, uh, they requested that, and I think it's a good idea to meet twice a year with them. Right. And, I, and I'd like to sit back on the committee. Right. So you want to amend in number three to, uh, re to, to state that the taxi cab in uh, the committee, the advisory committee for taxi cab industry should be reestablished. Reestablished, even right. if we meet twice a year. It's, uh, yes. That way they don't have to come to council all the time. Right. So that's an amendment added by you then, right? So uh, there, there, it's, uh, there's some amendments moved by uh, Council Fertini for number uh, two, and then also he's amending number three. Uh, and I believe uh, Mayor Brown wanted to uh, second, uh, second it as well. I'm oh, sorry, Mayor Brown. Thank you. Just to uh, add to this, uh, th thank you for um, uh, Councillor uh, Dillon and Councillor Pertini for, for really engaging in this, and Councillor Singh for engaging in this uh, um, discussion. <coughs> Obviously, the, there's been a real distortion uh, of the industry with the advent of Lyft and Uber. It's changed it everywhere, not just in Brampton. And technology is, is a disruption. Um, I think that's why it's important to create a level playing field. I think Mississauga um, has tried to achieve that by creating a level playing field between Uber and the taxi industry, and I think this is equitable. Um, if, if there wasn't one industry that was able to compete without um, these amendments, then, then you wouldn't have to do this. But I think this is a recognition um, that uh, there's people that have poured their livelihoods into this business, uh, and we want to make sure that they can compete on a fair ground. This is not about, um, this is not an industry asking for a subsidy. This is not an industry asking for a leg up. All they're asking for is a level playing field. Uh, and I think that's fair. And I, I think the amendments that were designed uh, by Councillor Fertini and Dylan and Singh uh, make a lot of sense and uh, it has my full support. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Councillor Singh. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge the work of staff on, on this report. I read it. It was qu quite thorough. So thank you for the work. And uh, I think the amendments are a result of the industry changing and, and it becoming much more competitive. Um, but I just wanted to take time to acknowledge uh, staff for, for their hard work on this. Thank you. Um, thank you. And so uh, are we, a uh, question to, to uh, the clerks, um, are we getting all of these amendments on, on the screen? Through you, Mr. Chair, we will, not at the moment, because we're still trying to figure them out, but I just want to be able to summarize for committee so I can understand what it is that Councillor Fortini has moved. Right. So as I understand it, Councillor Fortini has moved the staff recommendations on the board with, um, as amended to delete D, which is shown highlighted, and replace D with the following, to renew inactive taxi plates without registration of the vehicle, which is the Mississauga model. Yep. And then to add after 2H, so I, J, K, um, uh, first review formula for the new plates in the future to report back by 2021, um, to allow taxi brokerages to use an app at night um, and therein removing the requirement for the 24-7 call taking. And the additional one is to allow stickers to be detachable on taxis. As he, and he has also um, moved as part of his motion to strike out um, Clause 3 on the screen and instead replace it with a recommendation to reestablish the Taxi Cab Advisory Committee, if I understand it correctly. 
So through you, Mr. Chair, then uh, staff would report back with terms of reference for that committee and the composition and um, frequency of meetings and things so like was, that. Was there mention of the, the optional in-camera as well? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, to have an optional camera um, on taxi cab vehicles um, similar to the Mississauga model. In taxi cab. In vehicle. taxi cab, my right. apologies. So if we can uh, just quickly get those on board, if there's any other uh, questions from council? No? And so uh, just... Okay, Councilor Pleshi. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I was kind of waiting through the amendments to see what I could support here. And I think I can support um, everything except for the uh, option of uh, the cameras. Um, I think we heard uh, from our heard from the police was it this term or last term um, the importance of having uh, these cameras or maybe it was bylaw that um, uh, uh, provided that information to to committee or to council I, I don't recall the number but I think it was it was fairly high in terms of how many crimes were solved because of the cameras that were in Taxi cabs, one in particular in, in the area that uh, Councillor Willens and I represent. Um, so I think, oh, thank you, Councillor Willens, for uh, some stats. And, and there seems to be there's a there's a high number of uh, um, photo extractions and uh, um, apprehensions when it comes to uh, using those devices. And from my understanding, in talking talking with the uh, with the industry, our um, I guess we request that a certain type of camera uh, be used, and that camera seems to be awfully expensive. Um, and with technology uh, the way it's ever changing, um, I, I think we I would hope that we would be able to uh, give them the op give. Uh, taxi cab drivers an opportunity to use uh, different types of technology that may be less expensive. Um, ride sharing apps already have um, all of the information for the, for the people that are, that are using um, ride sharing. Um, and if, uh, if taxi cabs are able to, to use um, <clears throat> an application that uh, uh, gets the same amount of information, that's great. But Taxi cabs currently uh, pick up, uh, you know, at the airport or, or uh, side of the road, um, where we do, they don't have that information. Um, so I guess I, I can't support making it um, um, at the will of the uh, at the driver of the company, um, but I can support having them giving them the opportunity to utilize technology in in different ways and try and find a, a cheaper solution. As long as that cheaper solution doesn't um, doesn't uh, give us the best quality of image that uh, um, that the police can use in, in solving crimes. Any so sorry, I thought you're done. Would you like a, to split it up? I would like to split okay. it up and, and maybe just have staff comment on um, the, uh, um, the 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 video or the camera inside the the taxi cabs, if, if they may. Through the chair to the councillor. Um, the camera specifications don't narrow down to just two cameras themselves. It can be any camera that meets that act those actual specifications. So it is very wide open as technology changes. It allows for different companies to meet those same specifications and provide very good video evidence for the police. So, in, in those specifications, are they um, are they strictly related to um, to the quality of the image? It is around the quality of the image, the security of the image, of who can download it, how, and the, for the privacy aspect of the passengers and the drivers, and the memory capabilities, uh, eight gigabytes of memory as opposed to what we originally had, which was 256 mega, um, megabytes. Um, so in terms of memory, is, is, there, is there an opportunity, and just as an example, can a, can a driver uh, at the end of the day <clears throat> automatically upload um, 
uh, that data to say the cloud or, or something along those lines um, to free up the memory so that uh, they don't need to, because when you talk about memory, you're talking about dollar signs. Uh, increase memory, increase the amount of dollars. Um, so is that is that an opportunity? Is do we get, do we provide that opportunity to them? Uh, through the chair to the council, the way the system works is that it's al always recording over images. So eight gigabytes gives at least a month worth of time. And in a lot of cases, the drivers will find that an issue happens, they didn't think about it uh, at the time. As soon as you open the door, it's going through triggers of taking photographs and that. And you don't want to erase information that, that's been saved on it. Eight gigabytes is quite a bit. Um, it, but it's at nowadays, you're looking at 16, 24, 32 gigabytes mm -hmm. of memory now. Eight is actually a low, That's the low threshold. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I just asked for that one, um, one item of the amendments to be uh, voted on separately. I, I, I strongly feel the need that, that those cameras should be there. Um, I don't know why. I, I've spoken to some drivers that that don't want them, and I've spoken to others that say that uh, they do want them, um, and they're going to have them, but I guess there are some that uh, uh, don't feel that they need them until it's too late. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fortini. Thank you, through the Chair. And I, and I get it that we went through this last year, over a year and a half ago, two years ago, but the taxi industry here in Brampton is having a hard time between Uber and now. We're getting Mississauga taxis coming here picking up people. They don't have any cameras. They don't have anything in there. So how can they compete when we have other jurisdiction coming in, picking up people and dropping them off? And they're not allowed to have cameras unless they wish to. And we have Uber now. So that's why I'm trying to make it, at least for them, the same rules as others. It's a playing field for everyone, and everyone should be equal. It's not right that they come over here and pick up people, and we, we don't allow them. We don't even stop them if they have cameras or not. So how can these poor people compete? So the way the crime is over here, it's all peel. We're worried about crime. I get it. So I'm just trying to make it fair. So uh, I don't know if we could defer this, that the camera part, maybe to the committee, if they wish, uh, since we're establishing six months on the road, or you know, and uh, see what Mississauga is going to do. Maybe we could also put a stop on the Mississauga taxis coming in. Are we allowed to do that? through the chair to the councillor. Uh, Mississauga taxis, if they are coming into Brampton, are coming at the request of the customer and they're taking them out of the city of Brampton. That would be the only bylaw approved way of them doing that. Uh, Mississauga in 2013 chose not to upgrade their cameras. And as I mentioned in the report, those cameras are were originally issued in 2003, they were very, very outdated, as were ours when we updated our, our process. So City of Toronto, which is a much larger city, has mandated that cameras stay in the taxis, citing the same reasons that we did in our report. So how could we help them stop the Mississauga taxis coming here? If they're going to come here and pick up people, and they don't need all these expenses, they cannot compete. It's like someone... I mean, two stores, one gets the stuff free and one's got to pay. There's no competition. So between the Uber and them, I just feel for these people that they put a lot of... So, sorry? Can I suggest a friendly amendment? Sorry, I'm going to speak to board. So, so maybe... Sorry, do you want to let the mayor jump no, in? No, I have to jump Sorry, in. I'm going to let, I'm going to let <laughs> you get on the board one sec. If we just say to Councilor Bertini's point, I, I think recognizing Councilor Pelushi's concern, we say camera or equivalent technology, um, all the taxi companies are developing their own apps as well. And so in lieu of a camera, use a, a similar app that, uh, um, that Uber or Lyft would. I, I, we all say we want a uh, level playing field, and then we can have the taxi advisory committee uh, approve the, uh, the app meets the security protections that, that we want. So camera or equivalent technology. Um, and that way um, we send a signal to the taxi industry where we recognize that we, we, know, we know you're losing business to Mississauga right now. We know that we're, we're, you're at a disadvantage and we're going to work with you to find uh, uh, something that doesn't put you at a financial disadvantage. So camera or equivalent technology. Yeah. 
there'll be a kit like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, and the committee right. will come back with recommendations. Yeah. And, that's, and we can come back with it and, yeah. you know, and help them out because we're, we're having a problem with the tax. Even you know, the tow trucks are having a big problem for that same reason. I mean, they're paying the fees here. In other places, they don't pay the fee. So we got that. So, and so, I'm, so I'll be okay with that one there, bringing that one forward. Thank you. For strike of like Mississauga. Okay, so um, Council Fletcher, you're still off the board, is that correct? Uh, no, I'm not. So we're going to move to, yep. So uh, the, there's an amendment that was added, uh, which the, the clerk has put on the board um, to add, to have optional cameras, and we added uh, or equivalent technology. Um, and now we're going to move to Council Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's all been stated, but just to summarize, I, you know, the taxi cab industry here in our city is asking to have the option to either choose to have the equipment in their cabs or not. And that levels the playing field. If, if a taxi cab operator decides that they want to use an app and that means that they have the identity of the person who is using the cab, um, then that is their choice. If uh, a taxi operation wants to be picking up uh, customers uh, from the streets, they don't know who the customer is, they would choose to have the camera technology installed to act as a deterrent and also to help solve any potential issue that may arise. So giving the taxi cab uh, companies and operators that choice on how they choose to run their business um, is the prudent option for us, and I support the uh, motions and the amendments as they are on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. So there are a motion. There are motions on the screen, not emotions. Um, and so I just want to add uh, uh, very quickly as well. I think the um, um, taxi industry has followed the rules for decades. They've been decimated now by ride sharing. Um, and, and I guess what we're trying to do is make it a, a level playing field. We're not asking to do what Quebec did, and I think they paid uh, taxi drivers out $250 million, like 56000 per driver. Not asking that. We're simply saying let's make the uh, uh, playing field level, uh, and, I, and I appreciate uh, the, the motions, uh, amendments, sorry, brought forth by um, Councilor Fertini and uh, the mayor, and I know uh, many council members here have worked uh, directly with uh, and closely to the um, taxi industry and so the amendments are on the screen but I believe Council Plessy is back on the board. Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, I just don't see uh, option 2J um, being um, in terms of what Count, uh, Mayor Brown had stated that's not um, what he was saying. I, 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 that's not how I took it anyways. <clears throat> and I think I think what we're saying is cameras or equivalent technology um, be looked at by the um, the reestablishment of the taxi cab advisory committee, and for them to come back with a uh, with a recommendation. So through you, Mr. Chair, perhaps then 2J should say to have optional cameras or equivalent technology subject to review by the tax the reestablished taxi cab advisory committee. To review and recommendations. Um, Council Fertini. Yeah. Yeah, recorded vote, but uh, I think what the taxi industry had requested was that um, that the discussion be had later on, and that the um, the option for the camera be put in place immediately, uh, and so not it to be not to be subject to a later decision by the taxi cab advisory committee. Um, or is that is this what it is on the board? Is that what you'd like to be uh, passed now? So the uh, so is so until there's a decision made by the taxi advisory committee, uh, the the uh, the camera option, sorry, the cameras will still be uh, there. Is that correct? Absolutely. We're, we're, we're still for Okay. So okay. So the the we'll move to the optional cameras when the taxi advisory committee when it's formed. Uh, when they make their recommendations, is that correct? Yes. Okay. 
Is there something, sorry, I think the CAO uh, would like to add something, and I believe James would add, like to add something as well. Uh, through the chair, thank you, and, and James, feel free to jump in. Just a comment on number one uh, for council consideration. I was wondering whether that one could be ref referred back to staff for a report uh, simply because we have legal advice which dictated why the recommendation was given the way it was. This presents some potential uh, changes and risks that aren't uh, that council needs to be aware of prior to accepting this. So we would appreciate the opportunity to come back, provide that rationale, and then if council makes a decision that way, then so be it, but to at least give you that update. Do you think uh, that could be done by next council meeting? Through the, to the chair, that is correct. So to the clerk, um, so with number one being referred, is that a separate motion? Or is that within the, the body of this, these, these recommendations now? Through you, Mr. Chair, it could be part of this. It's just that uh, um, the main motion is what's on the screen, moved by Councillor Fortini. Uh, and if somebody is moving um, the referral of A, Part 1, back to staff for a report back to Council next week at June 19th. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I'm just going to look at the, the taxi industry right now. Um, if they totally understand what's going on with these recommendations right now. So number one, there's information. The motion is there, but it's being referred to staff uh, because they feel there's pertinent information that we know uh, before we make a decision. And so they'll have this by next week's council meeting. And so I'm just, everything else on the board, uh, I'm just looking at you to see if uh, you understand what's going on. I'm going to give you a minute to look at it, whoever wants to read it. So what we'll do is um, we, uh, we're going to allow you to get back up because I don't think we moved uh, received delegation. So you can come back up. You can come back up here. That motion where the equal app, that, that will take a lot of time again. But all, we are not saying that cameras are not useful. We are saying that cameras are very useful, but put that man, not mandatory. If we pick up most of the time very good citizen offering the coffees and teas and everything. So put that responsibility on the business. You want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, you are scared, you can have a camera. If I'm working daytime only picking up the citizens here to there, and I have to spend $2,000 this camera and new plates to put for the new drivers, it's very tough. That's all we are concerned. We are not seeing cameras are not using. Maybe I will not remove from my car. It is already there. There's 300 cabs. They might have already there. They will not remove it. We are not saying remove it. We are saying give them the option. If somebody, maybe newcomer is coming and he could not put a new car, maybe he will not put the camera over there. So make it option. That's all we are saying. So, uh, Mr. Tarek, what I'm going to do is this. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the mayor, um, so Mr. Tarek has said that he would like the camera option, um, you know, uh, to be, uh, to go right now immediately, but maybe if you could just provide the rationale again to, to him why you feel um, it should be uh, a recommendation made by the Taxi Advisory Committee. So uh, speaking to uh, Councillor uh, Fertie Anderson, part of the challenge is the request that every four years you have to upgrade them. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're suggesting here is that we look at the cost here. Uh, we have the Taxi Advisory Committee look at a way that is more financially sustainable with um, a comparative, comparable uh, uh, digital or technological way to have the security. So with an Uber or Lyft, you get that uh, um, GPS tracking and you, you get the name. So we can look at some technology that, that would replace that. Uh, and the Taxi Advisory Committee can meet quickly to work with the industry to look at what would be uh, a comparison, understanding the, the, the challenges that the industry is facing right now. And that's why we said comparable 
um, what's the word we used? Uh, uh, equivalent okay. technology. Okay. So it's going to go back for discussion with the taxi advisory committee when it's when it's formed. Yeah. But the question I have, uh, James, is there any renewals for uh, these cameras coming up from any 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 taxi uh, cars? The only uh, through the chair, the, the um, cameras are not having to be replaced every four years. One, uh, they're only when they're changing vehicles, and that as. There, you're seeing a lot of changes. All of the taxis currently have, all 371 taxis have cameras in them at this point, and they meet the, qual the, the specifications that are there right now. The only time that an individual would actually have to purchase a new camera is if he's coming into the business for the first time and is not able to purchase a rental. In a lot of cases, cameras are moved from vehicle to vehicle at a cost of two to three hundred dollars, and that's including the meter and all of the other equipment that they need to operate as a taxi. Okay, and sorry, do you foresee anybody, any new cars coming in that would be required to have, that would, you know, meet, have to meet the requirement to get the new cameras? At this time, any vehicle that uh, would then register as a new vehicle or change a vehicle would have that option not to have that. And with 24 plates, 26 plates on the shelf at this time, any one of those 26 plates could choose to not have a camera when they come on the road. So if somebody, one of those 26 plates was to come on the road now with the new vehicle, would they be required to have a camera now? Currently, yes. Okay. Um, a camera that meets the specifications again, which it means that you can recycle, use, have used right. cameras at that so point. So if, if the likelihood of any of those 26 coming onto the road in the foreseeable future, what, what are your, what's your take on that? Do you, do, do, do you see that? That we would be seeing 26 cars? Or any, how many of those would you expect in the next six months? Over the next six months? We could see a lot of changes over the next six months <coughs> of vehicles as drivers leave and new drivers come in with that as an option that they don't have to have the camera anymore. That would certainly be one of the shortcuts that they, they, that they would take coming into this industry. So, uh, and I'm going to throw it back on the floor again. Um, if, if you, because there could be any of those 26 new plates that could come on, they'll have the requirement um, to get the camera. Uh, and again, I'll ask the movers of the, the amendments that if they feel that um, having this implemented immediately um, would they like to implement this immediately, uh, or would they like to, um, sorry, let me reword that. If they want the, the, uh, to have this discussed at um, the Taxi Advisory Committee and continue uh, with the requirement for the camera, um, or if they want to just move to optional immediately right now and have the discussion later. So I'm looking at Councilor Fertini and just, just because he's bringing up these these new points of, of any new drivers coming in, new vehicles. When was the cameras first established in the taxis? You know, or you know? Certainly, the cameras were yeah, first established that. in 2000 and 2001. 2000, when, sorry? Um, 2002. 2002. They were after, and I think it was in... 1999 or 2000, one of our cab drivers was murdered in a, in a taxi, right. and the industry asked that we look okay. into safety. So part of those safety requirements were the camera training, and we were also looking at the uh, emergency lights on the vehicles. And that was also all the region of PLU, Mississauga? Uh, no, actually, at, the, at that mm -hmm. time, it was um, both Toronto and Brampton implemented those. Uh, I was in Mississauga at the time. Uh, our industry felt that through better training, um, they could eliminate some of the issues and they didn't see the same risk at that time. And they were implemented later when we so, found that most of the GTA had already implemented cameras. And I remember, I think a couple of years ago, the, our Peel police said the cameras and the cabs or the taxis are not actually uh, connecting with them, so they had to change it already twice 
in those times. So they change them twice. What happens if they come back in six months is you have to change them all over again because they changed them already. And Mississauga is still driving with no cameras. So at the end, they're facing expense on top of expense on top of expense all the time. Through the chair, um, the cameras that we had when Peel Regional Police came in were had been implemented in 2002. Mm. It was 2013 that count that uh, Peel Regional Police came to us. Mm. They were the same cameras. We were using Windows 98 computers to make sure that the cameras could actually work, and we were seeing that that those computers were failing. We went through a two-year implementation of the new standards, and that was a recommendation through TAC that made the cameras that updated the new specifications on the cameras. Okay, well, I'll leave it. I'm going to leave it to the committee, I guess. Uh, we'll see what I, you know, some of them wanted to you know, and move it over. And since we're establishing a committee, we'll talk about it more, and then maybe we could get more of them because some people want it, some people don't. That's why we figure it's an option. Mississauga doesn't have it. Thank you. Councillor Vicente, the last speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what Jay is saying is that cameras or equivalent technology are optional. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Are you asking me? Yes, sir. Wouldn't you, so are you, are you referring to what uh, James had said? No, referring to the wording on the screen. Oh, Just sorry, Jay. I want to be clear um, that if, if this is passed, then operators would have the option whether or not to choose to install technology or cameras. Is that uh, correct? No. I think what they're saying is that it's saying to have optional cameras or equivalent technology subject to the review and recommendation. So this would go to the, tax, the newly established um, Taxi Cab Advisory Committee for discussion in um, you know, whether it's equivalent technology, whether it's to have cameras or not have cameras, that's going to be discussed there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'll look to the clerk to clarify. So through you, through you, Mr. Chair, recommendation two is saying amend the mobile licensing bylaw to do A through L now through this motion. I through L. I through, uh, actually A through L a through because L, okay. there's a number of um, matters set out in the staff report. Um, you are correct, Mr. Chair. Um, J would be a, an amendment that would not proceed at this time because it is conditional on a review by the Taxi Cab Advisory Committee if this motion carries. And for you, Mr. Chair, if, if according from the delegation, the request was for that option to be in place now. And if we wish to, per, to move that, that option comes into force now, subject to reviews perhaps every year or every two years, I think I could accept that because I'm, I'm hearing what the delegations here are saying is that they want a level playing field. And for us to strike up the Taxi Cab Advisory Committee and to then review this matter and subject to all the different uh, analysis of this question, it could be a very, very long time which further hurts and impacts the taxi cab industry. And so, as I mentioned before, there's a reason why the PTCs don't use cameras because they know the identity of the persons who are entering their vehicle. And so there's a measure of security. There's a, 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 a sense that they know their customer. If a taxi cab operator wishes to install equivalent technology or technology in order to secure their vehicle, it is their option. And I, I would, I feel that if we just wordsmith J to allow for that option to come into effect today at council's wish and make that decision subject to a yearly review, should we find that we do not want to continue that in the future, that could be then done at the recommendation of the Taxi Cab Advisory Committee and, of course, ratification through Council. I, I, perhaps, members of Council, you would find that satisfactory to your needs and to everyone's concerns. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you want to keep your options open in the future. But the idea is to uh, help the industry cope with the changes. They understand the risks 
and they know what technologies are available to them should they choose to employ them to secure their operators. Um, and I believe that's what um, uh, the, the uh, members of the taxi industry were uh, asking for. But again, and, and I'll look to the uh, movers of the amendment to, to perhaps uh, provide uh, a response to what you're suggesting as well. So I'll look to Council Pertini and Mayor Brown to, to, to respond to Council Vicente. I think it's better to let the taxi advisory committee deal with this rather than um, they, I, and I think there's a willingness to meet quickly um, from, from what I sense. Um, so I think the motion that, that Ed's written tonight, um, is a fair balance. So, so uh, Mayor Brown and, and to Council Vicente as well, do you want to put perhaps possibly like a, a timeline on when uh, the uh, committee could be established and when um, just potentially they could make some type of recommendation? recommendation? So t it's June 12th today. Would you want to uh, give a September um, deadline yeah. for when, so the committee should be established before that uh, and any report that um, or that uh, staff could bring to them should be done so by, you know, maybe September. Yeah, that seems good. So I'm looking to the, to the clerk to see if that uh, uh, language could be added. Through you, Mr. Chair, it is possible. The terms of reference, if Part B carries and are ratified by Council next week, would be reported to the July 10th Council meeting. If Council approves the terms of reference and composition, clerks will work with the Department to uh, um, establish the committee in terms of uh, driver, industry, and other representatives, so the meetings can start in September. Yes. Yeah, so would we need to wordsmith uh, B and in any way as well, or? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, because I think we've just added wording to 2J. Um, which sort of says, you know, one of the first things that the, the new committee will be doing is reporting in September. So that is enough impetus to establish the committee and, so, and get it up and running. So would any relevant information from staff be um, uh, ready by this September meeting in, ter yes. in terms of the optional cameras or equivalent technology? Presumably, yes. Presumably, yes. Okay. So are you okay with that, Councilor Vicente? If it's the will of council, yes. Yep. And uh, so... Um, Mayor Brown, are you done? Yes. Right. So, um, Councilor Fatini. Yeah. Thank you, through the chair. So, do we have to go through interviews again or something? Or we just establish the. You're gonna. Staff, so you guys are gonna do it, right? Or do we have to? Through you, Mr. Chair, that will be dependent on the composition of the committee. Yeah. The committee in the past has been comprised of uh, drivers, brokers, um, other citizens, representatives from the Accessibility Advisory Committee. So. Uh, subject to the terms of reference being approved, it is a, um, a smaller universe of individuals to recruit from, um, but th there, it, presumably it would be a fair and open process to allow those that are interested to, to apply. So, um, just sorry, uh, Pertini, when, when, when's it, what, like, what's an ETA on that? So through you, Mr. Chair, if this carries today and Council ratifies it next week, uh, a report will come to the July 10th Council meeting with the proposed terms of reference for Council approval, and then immediately thereafter, if Council approves it, staff will work with the industry to establish the composition so we can start meeting in September. Okay. So, yeah, so we do have to do the interviews and establish everything, so it'll be by September. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think the CAO would like to add something. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to clarify, uh, or at least confirm, I believe the delegate for 2I, instead of where it says in the future, I believe it's to be done by 2021. Correct. Okay, so uh, the motion's on the board, I believe, uh, members of the taxi industry. So uh, we're going to let uh, Mr. Mr. Taylor, right? I'm going to give you just an opportunity to walk one quick minute, just one minute to add something. Um, As it pertains to the cameras, um, we're now into September. Um, uh, 
we heard a comment that it's only an extra hundred or two hundred dollars. Well, it's a hundred and two hundred or two hundred dollars for this. It's a hundred dollars for uh, renewal fees for or extension fees on vehicles past seven years. It's another hundred or two hundred dollars for CPI. It's another hundred or two hundred dollars. This industry is suffering. And if you're concerned about cameras and vehicles, then you must be concerned about cameras also in these uh, transportation corporations. It's what they are. The city of Brampton taxi drivers are, are losing the long trips to these companies. Well, the drivers sit on stands and posts doing trips to no fares. And why are they doing those trips to no fares? Because the people that are going to the grocery stores are on fixed incomes. And they know what the fare is going to be to go to no fares. And when they come out, the fare hasn't changed, albeit for traffic or traffic lights. So very respectfully, can you get to the point? My point is, is that Move on this today, please, because waiting till September, we know that this has dragged on far too long. It didn't take this long in right. other municipalities. So I think this is the fastest route that we can take, and I think this is the most thank you so much. And responsible one. Um, and, and we've heard everything here today, but we thank you. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll get a couple more speakers now, uh, and, and then we'll take a vote then. Thanks. Thank so you so, so much. Councilor Bowman. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. The only way I'm going to support this motion is this stays as it is we've already heard that every single taxi cab out there right now james has these cameras we've got 26 plates how long have they been sitting on the shelf that number fluctuates all the time uh, right now any of the plates that weren't renewed would have to be renewed by um, within 90 days to the end of august so we'll probably see plates come on at that time during so those times Okay, so by the end of August, we're going to see a few more. Yes. For a few more plates, I'm willing to support this motion as it stands, and we can look at it in September with the new Taxi Cab Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bowman. Uh, and so we have no other speakers. So um, uh, the recommendations and the amendments uh, are moved by uh, Councilor Fratini. Um, um, Mayor Brown uh, has indicated he'd like to second it. Uh, and I believe Councillor uh, Singh has mentioned that as well. Uh, and so uh, they're on the board and we're going to take a vote uh, right now. Uh, moved by Councillor Fratini uh, and amended by him. All in favor? Oh, sorry, a recorded vote. Electronic or standing up? So he's requested a standing vote. A recorded vote has been requested through standing. All in favor, please stand to be counted. Showing in favor is Mayor Brown, Councillor Singh, Councillor Fortini, Councillor Williams, Councillor Medeiros, Chair Dillon, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Pileschi, Councillor Willens, Councillor Vasante, and Councillor Santos. Mr. Chair, the motion carries unanimously 11 to 0. Thank you so much. And so um, a motion to receive the delegations moved by uh, Councillor Singh. Uh, all in favor? Thank you very much, everybody. So um, I believe um, there's been a request to move up 6.8 just because of time. I believe it's going to be a very quick uh, uh, delegation and a... Um, Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there's been a request by the delegation for 6.8. Uh, Joshua Bernard, uh, Habitat for Humanity on the purchase of city surplus land at uh, 1524 Countryside Drive. Um, this is a matter for which there's no staff report, but there's a brief presentation as he has another commitment uh, down in Toronto shortly. If five minutes or less. Right. Uh, Three minutes. minutes? Okay. We'll give you five. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Bernard, and I'm uh, the new VP of Real Estate Development at Habitat for Humanity. Um, I'm going to try and make this as quick as possible, but this is not working. Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm just here to talk about uh, uh, 1524 Countryside Drive, uh, disposition, disposition of surplus city land. Um, uh, but first, I want to start uh, um, by acknowledging uh, the city for its continued support um, in the development of affordable home ownership projects. Um, Habitat GTA has benefited from the city's financial support on five previous projects, including the disposition of surplus city lands at uh, 8600 Torbum Road. Um, Habitat GTA 
uh, ultimately we cannot uh, deliver um, on our mission without the continued support of the city. Um, um, so, you know, we, have, we are greatly appreciative for that. <clears throat> so today, uh, just a quick update on our, 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 um, our mortgage model, as well as uh, we're looking to su uh, support financial considerations in the disposition of the surplus city site located at 1524 uh, uh, Countryside. Um, so, just to give you some perspective um, on our home ownership model, uh, we are looking to, to implement a modified home ownership model which provides uh, long term affordability. Um, so, uh, meaning that it's, it, it's not just for the first um, home buyer. And again, the thing to remember is that people are actually buying habitat homes. They're not, we're not giving them away. It's a, it's a hand up, not a handout. Um, uh, there's lots of focus on uh, rental solutions, but uh, ho home ownership is a very important part of the housing continuum. Um, so just to give some background on 1524 Countryside Drive, uh, uh, City of Brampton uh, or the council motion uh, uh, motioned the city uh, retail real estate department to engage in exclusive negotiations with Habitat GTA for the sale of the land um, both parties have come together to work on uh, a uh, agreement of purchase and sale, which has now been signed by Habitat for Habitat for Humanity. Um, the one challenge for us is uh, the direction uh, was it wasn't explicitly said, uh, you know, how how uh, the market pr or the sale price should be considered. So right now we're looking at a, a sale price of a million dollars. Um, and if, if I go back to uh, Torbrum, which was a very similar uh, situation, um, uh, it was a market value of 780,000, I think, and uh, we got the land for, for free. Um, so we're hoping that uh, today we can get direction from council uh, to work with uh, uh, city staff to look at alternative options for us to make this project even more affordable. Um, and specifically, <clears throat> some proposed um, some proposed alternative considerations uh, could be a purchase price reduction tied to the long-term affordability period, um, long-term uh, land lease of either 20, 49, or 100 years, um, vendor take-back mortgage, and I'm over my time, so I'm just going to finish up. Um, and then the other option is. Uh, uh, you know, by doing this, again, it just allows us to provide a deeper level of affor affordability um, to uh, community members. Um, so the last thing is just looking for uh, direction from city uh, to city staff to work with us on to explore this and come back with a report. Uh, thank you. So we're going to get Councilor Singh on the board. And uh, I did have an opportunity to meet with uh, some of the members from Habitat for Humanity. So I'll, I'll refer this back to staff because I believe it's in our area as well. And uh, if staff could also contrast this with the uh, Brampton Christian Fellowship because uh, we had that recently in our area, um, just to illuminate the similarities and differences uh, as well. And I look forward to uh, the report back from staff. Um, so uh, uh, Councilor Singh has moved uh, uh, the referral. Um, there's no other speakers, all in favor? That carries. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Uh, so we're going to move on to, um, so 6.1 is done, 6.8 is done. Uh, we're going to move uh, to 6.2, delegation from Tom, Tom Allen, um, Stan Laurie, and John Crawford from the Kiwanis Club of Brampton in regards to the lease renewal uh, and request for rent relief at 247 Murchie Avenue South. And so before you begin, I think uh, Councillor Bowman is on the board. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I know that this is a very important topic for uh, one, of the, one of the biggest um, social service providers, uh, Kiwanis. So I believe uh, Tom probably needs about an extra three or four minutes, if we could grant him that. Yep, if required, uh, we'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor of allowing extra time if required? That carries. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Your Worship and uh, councillors. And we appreciate the opportunity to uh, put ourselves in front of you today. Um, we'll, we will get to the uh, issue at hand, but uh, just uh, for your benefit, 
to get some sensibility about who we are, our long history here uh, in, the, uh, in the city. Let's see how this works here. So who are we? Hey, it works. Um, so for those of you that may be less familiar, Kiwanis is a not-for-profit volunteer organization that fundraises and dedicates service hours to strengthen our community by improving the lives of children. Simply put, Kiwanis is for kids. So why should you care? Why should you care? Schools, hospitals, governments, other not-for-profits, corporations and foundations and more have all reaped the benefits of collaborating with Kiwanis and continuing to work together. We can accomplish more in areas of need. Just to reflect past uh, on giving, uh, for us the giving exists in two dimensions. The first is the quantitative side of the equation. That's the easy part in terms of quantifying the money we raise, the money we spend, the more difficult part to quantify is the qualitative side of the equation, the intrinsic value that, uh, that comes to improving the lives of children in this community. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate uh, two or three points to kind of amplify that for you. So to quickly reflect back, back on yesterday, we have a long history of being fully engaged with this community, and we're not just a check writing club. We are engaged with the community. Here's uh, just a sampling of some of the uh, things that uh, we've been involved with historically. We go back to uh, 1957, a year later uh, from our charter in 1958, unbeknownst probably to many of you, um, we were responsible for initiating what is now known as uh, Brampton Caledon Community Living. Uh, in 1967, Kiwanis organized the association for what is now Big Brothers Big Sisters. Back in 1967, it was known as Big Brothers, uh, and since now Big Brothers Big Sisters, and its founding president was actually our current sitting president at that time. And then if we go to 1994, uh, Kiwanis adopted a city park um, known as the Brampton uh, Kiwanis Memorial Park. City representatives were very enthusiastic about our involvement, and to this day, Kiwanis continues to administer uh, the tree dedication program uh, the park offers to our community. So those are but a few of the uh, past uh, moments from an engagement point of view. Today, um, started by a, a notable brand Tony here, Joe, uh, Joe Harley, seven years ago, uh, which reaches out to community and looks to recognize volunteer, volunteerism and those who rise above in the cause of giving back to community, if you will. And that happened last month. And then the list goes on. I won't go through it all, but you can see here uh, scholarships. Uh, again, not just writing checks to support scholarships, but actually engaged in the process of interviewing young people who are coming forward and developing their own self-confidence and learning skills in terms of applying for those scholarships. Uh, the Family Life Resource Center and uh, the kids and the children, children's Christmas party. So writing checks, yes, but also engaged in the community. And today, you look at where we are in terms of those uh, community partners we support, it's pretty substantial, uh, quite frankly. And um, we continue uh, to give to this community. And in this time where uh, we're all stretched for resources, um, we are doing more with less. And at the end of the day, given the size of our club, 25 card-carrying Kwanians, um, and the resources we have, I would suggest or submit to you respectfully that we are punching well above our weight class in the community. Some notable numbers. Um, National service dogs, 165,000. Again, coming back to that intrinsic value piece, 
That represents training 12 dogs for the benefit of autistic children and their families locally here in Brampton. And at the end of the day, how do you measure that value when those families come back a year later and share their story about the life-altering experience that those, those dogs provide? Um, Salvation Army, scholarships, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, and many, many more. So over the last dozen years, uh, basically our funding contributions to the community, $635,000. Uh, if you go back, rewind 60, 62 years in the community, it's millions of dollars. So what brings us here today? Um, our lease comes up uh, in 247 McMurchie. Uh, we've had it for 20 years. Just to give you a little bit of background, in 1998, uh, Kiwanis approached the city of Brampton uh, with a brand new idea, which subsequently became known as the Kiwanis Youth Center for Sports Excellence. And for the next 20 years, our home. The idea was bold and not without risk. Never before had the club committed such a large sum of money uh, for such a long period of time. And this is just an extract, the terms and conditions of that lease as they exist today, um, which comes to an end September. Uh, up front, payment of $52,000 and then subsequent payments of $5,000 a year for the first 10 years and no payments for the remaining 10 years. So not to be confused if you're looking today and seeing, well, is Kiwanis paying its way? If you look at the whole picture, that amounts to some $5,100 a year over the 20 year period. So again, respectfully, we would submit that we have been paying our way. Uh, and what does that get us? That gets us exclusive use of some uh, office space in 247, uh, some storage space, the use of the club, of the, the use of the club boardroom, uh, which is ours exclusively every Wednesday, 52 weeks a year. Um, the club is allowed to personalize the boardroom with our own club belongings, and uh, signage on the building, uh, which has been come to known now as the Kiwanis Center for Sports Excellence. So tomorrow, the future. This is uh, what has been proposed by the city as we now uh, undertake to um, rewrite a lease and uh, secure our future uh, going forward. And coming back from the city, the proposal is a five-year lease, annual payments of 12,800 and change, uh, current market value subject to 2% with, uh, subject to an annual 2% increase, exclusive use of the office space, uh, unchanged, uh, the storage space reduced to half, uh, the boardroom uh, remains uh, ours uh, every Wednesday, 52 weeks a year, and uh, the personalized belongings of Qantas in the boardroom to be vacated, and we keep the signage on the building. So the problem for us today is we raise approximately $50,000 a year annually through our fundraising efforts. The days are gone 10, 15 years ago with TV auctions and bingo where smoking was allowed and we were generating $80,000, $90,000 a year out of bingo. The reality is today, we're sitting around $50,000 uh, in fundraising efforts. And the dilemma that we're now challenged with is financially the market value lease proposed by the city of 12,842 represents about 25% of the current annual funding efforts that uh, we provide to the community. Of greater importance, every dollar raised goes to work and every dollar that goes towards paying rent is one dollar less that goes back into the community. So the ask and what we present for your consideration Oh, the suspense. <laughs> um, we would ask the, the city to consider um, a 10-year lease, uh, taking us out to 2029. Annual rental payments of $3,000 a year, subject to a 2% annual increase. And with a proviso that should the city at some point in the future decide to repurpose the building or sell the building, that included would be some 
uh, some uh, consideration that we would vacate the property um, should uh, its, uh, its uh, intended purpose be changed. Um, we keep the office space, we accept the reduced storage space, uh, the boardroom space remains unchanged, and we get to keep our personal belongings in that boardroom space, which, is, which really frames who we are, if you will, and signage on the building to uh, remain the same. So, said differently, and it's a number I'm not actually quite used to, or a percentage I'm not quite used to, uh, the amount of annual rent relief we're asking the city to consider is $9,800, which by our calculation represents 0.001 of 1% of the current $800 uh, city budget. And I apologize if those numbers aren't quite right in terms of where the city budget is, but it's really more to give you some sensibility. So again, coming back to an earlier point, uh, aside from the quantitative measure of our contribution to the community over the last six decades, which is the easier part to manage, it's really the intrinsic value uh, that we've contributed to improving the lives of children and their families in our community. And not just here or there, along the way, but consistently for 62 years. So, what is the importance of having a place to want us sorry, to call home? Sorry, we've, we've passed the extension as well. Um, how much longer do you have? Two slides, all right. Thank Please. you, thank you, thank you, absolutely. Continuity and a stable environment to continue our community work. So I won't go through this. I'll just simply end by saying this is why we volunteer. Kids need Kiwanis. We're happy to answer, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Tom and company for showing up today and waiting for so long. We're sorry. Uh, delegations usually are a lot quicker than this, but thank you for staying. Um, I am happy to uh, move receipt of the delegation. Um, however, uh, we do have a report coming up in closed session for, uh, for the options for Kiwanis. So I think we should wait until this afternoon uh, when we have our closed session for any, any debate or questions since it is in closed session. So I'm happy to just move the delegations at this point. Um, thank you, Councillor Bowman. And so, uh, Councillor Pelleschi and Councillor Fortini, this is in closed session. And so, um, are your... What are your questions related to? Acknowledge me and I'll tell you. <laughs> what if I don't want to? You have to. All right. Councilor Pleasure. Well, Councilor Fortini was first. So you're on the board. We'll go with you then. We'll go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the delegation. I would ask that the report come forward now and be released to the public for us, for our discussion and debate. I think we, uh, a lot of things go into closed session. I think this is one report that uh, we can have that debate in open. So uh, I'll move we'll, br we'll bring that back in a minute. We're just going to uh, move to Councilor Pertini. Well, thank you. And I was going to ask, through the chair, I was going to ask the same thing. Like, uh, I know we're going in camera unless it's something private or legislation. I don't see why we can't have it here. Uh, thank you, Tom, for coming. And I know they do a lot of great things. I was just over for the Big Brother Big Sister giving scholarships into the community. We could see uh, they did mention if they ever sell it, the future something you're willing to leave. I want to ask staff some questions on this. A uh, couple of questions on it. Um, Sorry. I want to perhaps ask perhaps we should. I'm looking to um, if we uh, if we if we if this is in camera already, then if it gets. Uh, if, if it's been moved by Councillor Pelleschi, if it passes, then we can get into discussion. Okay, I'd right? like to keep my name on the board, though. that's fine. Okay. I'll wait. I'll wait. And, and so, um, Councillor Pelleschi, uh, I'm going to look into um, the clerk before that. Is there any, any legal issues arising from speaking in, in uh, public? So, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot give any legal advice, but I can advise committee that the matter, related matter on closed session is item 13.2, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. It is within the committee's jurisdiction if they wish to consider the matter 
in, in public or not. The, the practice <coughs> convention of committee has been um, for, for a committee or council to uh, receive information in closed session to protect the interests of the corporation um, before property related matters are discussed in public. But it's entirely within the discretion of the committee. Right. So before we go to that, is there any is there any discussion in, in regards to this that any anybody on council feels that particular discussion that should be in camera? So, um, Council Vicente, I'm on the board. So we're going to get back to you. I'm oh, just, I oh, just okay, want to get some thank clarification. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it's not only practice uh, for us to discuss um, these types of matters in camera. It's for the protection of the corporation and also for the protection of the entities involved in the lease negotiation. So I would uh, encourage Council to receive the delegation and to, uh, when the time comes at the end of the meeting, when we normally do our in-camera discussion to discuss this item in camera. I'm not a lawyer, but I think that is the prudent choice. Okay. So, um, Council Fertini, still on the board. Council board, they don't have. Okay, so we're gonna. Do you want to? Do you want us to get back to you, yes. or are you off the board? No, no. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll go to Council Bowman first. Sorry, uh, Derek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, so the only thing I would uh, uh, suggest is that there will be some, if we make this a public report, there will be some information in terms of comparatives and other information we won't be able to discuss in open council with you. So while the Kiwanis Club has uh, pretty much put what we've discussed with them, there is a holistic and context that we would not be able to provide in terms of what this means in terms of some of our other arrangements that wouldn't be able to be discussed in the session. So I'll just leave that for council's consideration. I'm on right. the board. So you're, you're on the board. Yeah. Council, just give us, give us a minute. I'm going to see if I'm Councilor Bowman's board. finished. Yeah. Councilor Bowman. Sorry. Oh, Sorry, who is on the board now? Councilor Council Bowman. Yeah, you're on the board. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I fully respect Derek, thank you for providing us that information. Um, I do think that we should be seeking legal advice on this before we go too much further into it. I respect the fact that uh, other contractual obligations exist, which may be uh, brought up in the discussion. So, Mr. Clerk, we can discuss the outcome in open council after we have our in-camera session, can we not? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, and uh, depending on what, there may be matters that uh, may, by necessity and law, have to be discussed in public, depending on the, the deliberations in closed session. Okay. It does, is Joe want to speak to us on? Through, through, through the chair, as, as the clerk has indicated, there are matters that if, and reports that must go into public and they do so. There are other matters that can go into closed session with uh, approval and consent from the city solicitor, but at the end of the day, it is council's decision as to whether or not a matter that we are recommending for closed be moved into public. There are, as, as the director of, of recreational services indicated, there is some sensitive information in there that pertains to other items beyond simply uh, Kiwanis, and that is part of the reason why we want to maintain it in closed session to have that dialogue. We recognize the value and importance of having this debate in public, um, so I don't know if there's an opportunity to have uh, the dialogue now without the report uh, or quickly going to close, presenting that item, and then coming back quickly if that's possible. I think we should... Um, get through with the delegations uh, and then move into closed session because there's some delegations that are waiting here. So what we can do is accept uh, receipt, uh, move into closed session and uh, following closed session, if there's any public uh, discussion we need, we can have it at that time. Uh, and I'm looking to the clerk. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, sorry. So um, I think you said two different things. So 
One is to receive this delegation, continue with the additional delegations, then move into closed. Yes. And then at the end you said to receive this delegation, move into closed, nope. consider the matter. So what we can do is can we receive receipts now of the yes. delegation? Yes. Finish off, sorry, of this current delegation, finish the rest of the delegations, move into camera, uh, and then if necessary, uh, if council decides, we can have a public dis uh, discussion on them. Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Right. May I offer just one closing comment? Yes. We would ask uh, council to be mindful of, and this is where we get into um, the land of ambiguity, because it's the intrinsic value that's less measurable. And while, and certainly we respect that, you've got arrangements in place with a lot of different entities, um, the piece as it pertains to Tawanis is really the intrinsic value that translates to improving the quality of life for children in this community. So at the end of the day, what we hope we can avoid is that current precedent won't trump the, um, uh, the sensibility about lending a hand to an organization that has demonstrated its worth in the community. Absolutely, point taken, and uh, uh, everybody, I think everybody around the table really uh, understands that, and so um, I, I think we'll, what we'll do is, um, so I think Councillor uh, Bowman wants to move receipt, uh, and so I think there's some information that's, uh, uh, you know, I think that's important that staff share with us in camera, and so when that's done, uh, we'll be sure to come out and uh, whatever comes, you know, whatever we're able to. I move the motion. Do you want to get on the board? I am. All right. Let I'm me get you on the board. The board from before the pre okay. So tried. let's do this. Let's do this. I was trying to clarify things. You're still on the board. You want to finish your point, and then we'll okay. get back to okay. Councilor Kalesh. Okay. So Councilor Fortini, you're on the board. Thank you. Just I don't know if you can answer this, or we have to go in camera. Uh, on the on the on the part where it says personalizing uh, with the club belongings. Uh, you know, and again, you don't have to answer unless you ha you can. If we were allowing it before, now we're not allowing it. So, no, no I'm, I, asking, I'm asking staff, I'm sorry. sorry. I got to ask them. And the part of, uh, uh, sorry, that the square footage, why did we take uh, the space away from our reductions, even though they're okay on it? Who, sorry, who, who is this co staff, question to staff? staff? He doesn't so, have to answer. Yeah, so does anybody have questions of the delegation? I'm going to ask them to have a seat. So do you guys want to have a seat then? Just so you guys don't have to stand up. Right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Eh? So question to, to staff from Council Pertini. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the uh, first, I can answer the first item that you talked about, the belongings. Uh, that's really not a major issue. So oh, sure. that's not a major issue. The okay. second one is something that I'd like to defer in to uh, in camera. That's fine. That's, okay. that's great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so okay. Councilor Pelesi, you're on board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm happy to um, withdraw the motion on bringing the report forward now for discussion. But what I would like to move is that when we do go into closed session, we only discuss the sensitive nature of the report. The debate and the options be come out into public where we can have that discussion in a public setting. So I've heard from staff, um, when I kind of asked for the, uh, for the report to be made public, the solicitor wasn't here, the solicitor is now here, but I think staff have done a great job in letting uh, members of the committee know that there are sensitive details inside the uh, closed session report, and so I would like to hear though that sensitive um, information, but actually have the options come forward and the debate in open session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is what I move, with along with receipt of the delegation. So, are you, did you catch what Council Plus she was saying? No, because I didn't. Talking. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I was having a discussion. I apologize. I no, I completely understand it. It's a confusing situation right now, and with uh, so I'm moving receipt of the delegation, and that um, we only go when we when the report comes forward in closed session. 
we're only in closed session t to discuss the sensitive nature, the options, and the debate come out in public after we've heard the, uh, um, the sensitive items that are captured in the report. So um, what I believe Councillor Plushy is, 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 is indicated that he wants to move receipt and any uh, sensitive uh, item that should be discussed in camera only be discussed there, that everything else be discussed in public. After we hear the, the in-camera discussion from staff. Mm -hmm. Which is I think what we were going to do anyways, which is normal practice. Okay. So uh, the motion has been moved uh, by Councillor Pileshi once again to have the in-camera uh, and then any public debate come out uh, immediately following uh, and, and have that. Is everybody, is everybody okay with that? Okay, so all in favor? Carries. Um, what we're gonna do is, because I know it's, uh, we've been here since for uh, quite a bit. We have delegations left. We have uh, 6.3, uh, and then we're gonna, which is uh, a request for additional parking for 50, 60 Chesterwood, and we also have 6.4 to 6.6. Um, which are all related to 8.2.6. Uh, so I think if we finish the delegation, looking around the table as well, do you guys want to, the council colleagues, do you want to finish the delegations off and then move to lunch? And then what we could do is have a, uh, a working lunch uh, and have our closed session at the same time. Yep. Okay, so we're going to move to 6.3 uh, uh, Baljot Singh Randhawa. Uh, Jignesh Modi, Sweetie Shah, and Ripu Rupinder. Are they here? Yep. Do you guys want to come up? So if you could just uh, state your name and then uh, you'll have five minutes as well. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just want to ensure we have quorum. I need six members in their seats, please. Thank you. Yep, you got five minutes, thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jignesh Modi and I'm the owner of the Bonnyville's Drugstore. I've been open for three years, about three years and now. With those three years, I have seen the extent to which my pharmacy has positively impacted the residents within and around this community. Bonnyville's Drug Stores mission is to provide our patients with, be, with the best possible patient care, and we have done just that by providing local residents with the counseling, med check, many more services, and beyond all that, trusted care. I support my patients and their health, and in return, they support me and my business. The issue I find, however, as a growing business, is that although many community members would like to receive the trusted standard of prescription support guidance that we provide and they can not do so. Why? Because the issue with the surrounding parking. Around these live and work units, there is a very late, limited parking issues by the city or municipality. Throughout the whole day, it is inconvenient for the customers and community members to visit my pharmacy because of often that not, there are no parking spots available. During the week, the parking is filled by parents dropping and picking up the children from the school, 95 Bonivers, uh, is a, I think uh, standard one to eight, great. School bus, community members visiting the park. I have few photos that showcase uh, in this case. During the winter season, customers 
in Queens seniors are forced to walk quite a long distance in icy, snow, and risky conditions just to receive the medication or seek help. Additionally, there are no handicapped or expected mother parking spots are the people who often have need to visit in my drugstore, which is far closer than other pharmacies in the plazas. I sincerely request additional in and out parking to be added or extended parking to be added on the main road on Bonnie Brace or James Potter. Not only for my businesses, but there are another 14 business units coming up, which is came up, which numbered from 60 to 74 Chesterwood Crescent. And lastly, I would say, Ontario preaches the supporting small businesses as so as one myself, I would like to have your support, my growth, which at this point in time, we can only be done through the additional parking. That's all. Thank you, um, Councilor Medeiros. Thank you, uh, Councilor Dillon. Um, I guess uh, before, just a questions of clarification. Um, can you tell us the impact on your business? Because I know, um, you know, I've heard we visited uh, your businesses many yes. times. And when you, I guess, bought into this concept, did you understand what you were buying into? And was the image sold to you different than what it is now? I agree with you, completely different than what we saw it or what we've been offered. There was no school parking was indicated because obviously school is across the street. Parents are using the parking because that's elementary school, I believe. So There's a couple, couple so of the more. Can you just clarify that point then? So I think it's an important point. What was told to you, that parking that is available was only to the businesses. You got it. Yet schools. Yes. So that's my understanding. The yep. parents are, and people yep. in that area going to that school are using that parking. Definitely. And have you brought this to the attention of city? Of Not city? yet. No. I think Ms. Rupi, she's the owner of the Mega Mine, the educational things. And I did see, bring it up to Sonia or Kamal Khaira when they uh, came by. Well, I. I yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm not sure. CDC yeah, I think, I think our, our bylaw officers were called several times uh, regarding this, but that's fine. I, I, I didn't into that. But uh, you can just talk about the impact on your business. So there's been a negative impact. And, and I guess at this point, and not to prolong it, um, I would like to refer this uh, to staff uh, to report back on what could be some mitigation uh, uh, strategies. And also, um, I think another uh, miscommunication was there was an understanding there's parcels of land which are currently empty uh, across, uh, I believe, on the north e uh, northwest. North Northwest of Bonnie Brazen James Potter, which is an empty, and it was told to, I guess, the business owners that there was going to be a, a mid high rise in the right. area. Uh, so, as part of staff report, um, come back, and staff can also reach out and speak to uh, the store uh, the store owners uh, to get their sort of feedback as well. And uh, in terms of timeline, uh, I'll let the staff uh, based on what you think accordingly. Does that sound okay? Does that sound good with you? Yeah, yeah that's okay. Yeah. And uh, what else you had to say something about uh, the uh, winter? Yeah, time? it's the same thing. Good afternoon, first of all, everyone. Uh, so is it the same thing? Because as I'm running tutoring center over there, uh, so the main uh, problem is for children. So it's a long distance. They have to come and then enter into the center. So we, I want security for children also, because we are doing good, very good parents and community members. They are uh, people. They are very happy as we providing uh, and then doing uh, on their. Uh, uh, what I could say. Uh, sorry, I just forgot. <laughs> um, just people. Uh, we are providing opportunity to. Um, uh, so that they can learn more children better need, uh, for their uh, better needs. And uh, moreover, uh, especially after school program, parents, those are working and uh, children, uh, they come, we help them out in finishing homework and then they more, can more excel in their uh, studies. But the only concern is parking. Because sometimes parents, they don't get uh, uh, that uh, spots for parking their cars. And uh, then they have children, uh, sometimes they want to just drop by 
the same uh, again if they don't get the right spot and then they have concern if any emergency happens and then we don't have handicap parking over there so that does mean yeah and, and i just think uh, thank you very much uh, and through the chair if also can staff um, address the transit uh, service in that area to ensure uh, especially when we're trying to promote uh, more livable healthy communities um, that it's easily pedestrian friendly and and in terms of active transportation. So looking at all those modes in terms of how it services that area, especially when uh, this is the type of concept that we want to promote through the city. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So referral to staff has been moved by Councillor Medeiros. All in favor? That carries. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes 6.3. And so um, we have um, the next we have 6.4, 6.5, and 6.6, .6, and 6.7 uh, is not here. Uh, so these are all in relation to um, 8.2.6. Uh, and so for 6.4, is Sylvia here? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to do it up there or down here? It's up to you. And so, uh, Sylvia, when you come up, just uh, state your name and then you have five minutes as well. Hello, my name is Sylvia. Uh, the topic is the sidewalk snow removal. It's in relation to this winter, but also previous winters, and its impact on the Ontario Human Rights Code. The current policy that we have, the current bylaw we have for snow removal is from 1976 and the character of Brampton has changed substantially then, and so has Canada's concept of human rights. We no longer forcibly sterilize indigenous people. We no longer steal children from indigenous parents. We no longer have racially segregated schools. So Canada has improved on its human rights view since then. Currently, this policy says 11 a.m. the day after the snow event is declared. So in effect, you get at least 36 hours to clear the snow. The issue is, this doesn't work with how Brampton has changed. In 1976, we had a very basic bus system with Brampton and Bramley having just amalgamated with a very basic transit ridership. Now Brampton has a higher transit ridership percentage than Portland, which is known for its transit. So we have many more pedestrians to deal with. And for children getting to school, this is also an issue because 11 a.m. is quite a bit after the school day at, it start, after it begins. So, as I mentioned, it's urbanization and shifting, shifting transportation usage. But the other thing we have to remember is the elderly population in Brampton is rapidly growing. And that presents its own challenges. Suburbs were built to be around 30-year-old healthy people and small children they could um, drive everywhere. That doesn't work anymore for Brampton. So the reason I'm here is because this winter, I was actually injured. I was hit by a car. It was the sidewalk was covered in snow. It's the sidewalk is the city's responsibility, even if the bylaw says that the residents are supposed to clear it. And I tried to repeatedly call it into 311. 311 couldn't find the address, even though I can find it on the city's parcel bureau. Consequently, a six-foot pile of snow compacted down and became impossible to remove. So I was forced to walk in the street. One evening coming home, I was hit by a car. Since then, I have suffered from chronic back pain. It's any position I, I am in chronic pain. So it's the answers are, well, here's some painkillers or physiotherapy. I don't qualify for OHIP's physiotherapy because I'm not a kid and I'm not a senior and I'm not on ODSP. My concern is this winter, this coming winter, I'm gonna have a hell of a time with the snow because apparently hard packed snow that's uneven with holes in it that makes it very difficult to balance. A lot of people seem to think that's apparently okay for snow removal. So for the Ontario Human Rights Code, the relevant portions are public places, amenities, and utilities, such as recreation centers, public washrooms, malls, and parks. If, I phys you, can, if you have a perfectly accessible building for someone in a wheelchair, but it requires a step up to get into the building, it's not accessible even if internally it is. Some of the service provide, it mentions municipal and provincial services. You have a transit fleet that is 100% accessible. 
except if I can't actually get to the bus stop because of accessibility reasons, it is functionally not accessible to me. So the two proposed changes are to update it. In Toronto, they have a 12-hour snow removal bylaw. So you don't get until 11 a.m. the next day. So if the, the city declares a snowfall over at 1 o'clock today, I would get until 11 a.m. tomorrow. That just doesn't work. In Toronto, for the areas that the city does not do snow removal of the sidewalks, which is actually most of the city, you have 12 hours to clear it. The alternative is, this. the issue is, this require many more bylaw officers to do and more 311 people to deal with. The alternative is so Ottawa. So one, one minute yeah. remaining. Ottawa actually clears all of the sidewalks. No. So they think the city estimate was 3.2 million for this. If you say it's $4 million, you're talking about $25 a household. I don't believe that qualifies as undue hardship for the city. This is trans help. The costs are exploding actually taking care of the sidewalks in the city would be one way to contain this growth. As you can see from 2019 to 2022, that is a $10 million increase. If you can shave a portion of that for $4 million, that is a massive benefit to the city. So I would like staff to report back on possibilities to update this. Either the city reduces the amount of time homeowners have that's likely to be unpopular, or have the city actually look into um, taking over the snow removal, and you may wish to do a scientific survey, a poll like you've done previously for consultation. And I believe if you phrase it to residents as, are you willing to pay $25 more per household so you aren't legally required to clear the snow, or you get a $400 fine, it wouldn't be so crazy. And that's 1% of one year's operating cost. So the cost for that's quite reasonable. Yeah, loops around, I guess. That's my delegation. Thank you. Councillor Vicente is on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sylvia, for raising this important issue. Uh, later on during the work section of the meeting, we will be discussing and trying to move forward from the work that we did this week at the winter maintenance workshop. So I would uh, move for receipts of the delegation and that we bring up some of the questions that Sylvia Menez has raised here when we do that discussion a little bit later today, Mr. Chair. Can you repeat that? You want to receive the delegation? I was having a discussion with the clerk. I apologize. So you want to receive? Through you, Mr. Chair, I think what Councillor Vasante is asking is, uh, after hearing all the delegations bringing forward the report 8.2.6, committee also consider at the same time the added item on winter maintenance that Councillor Vasante added to the agenda. So we're bringing, we're going to bring forward 8.2.6 now. Okay. No. So you want to hear the delegations, and then what do you want to do? You're on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my motion was to receive the delegation and to engage in discussion about some of the points raised here right. and some of the other discussions that we are about to have later on uh, with respect to 8.2.6 and the workshop. So we're not bringing, you don't want to bring 8.2.6 no. now. Okay, so we're not bringing, we'll listen to the delegations. Thank you. Um, so thank you. So move by House Vicente all in favor. So we're going to move to 8.6.5. Is um, Christine Abdu and uh, Mikkel Gayed here? So you have five minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine, and I'm one of the homeowners of 528 Edenbrook Hill Drive. We received two charges on our property taxes that I will address separately. So on February 1st, we received the first notice. February 2nd, the pictures from the contractor of our sidewalk shows the first before image. And then February 4th, it shows the before and after picture of when the contractor claims to have removed the snow. We had cleared the snow from the sidewalk a few days later from when the notice was received as we were entering from our garage door and did not see the notice on the first. As soon as we saw the notice, we cleared the snow. This was before February 4th. 
I reviewed the photos from the contractor as I was confused how there could be photo evidence for work my husband and I did. When reviewing the photos from the contractor, it is very evident that the snow is on our neighbor's sidewalk in the before image taken on the day of removal. The house number in the image shows 526, not 528. In the background of the image, you could see that my sidewalks have been fully cleared. I was advised at the meeting with the bylaw enforcement supervisor that we could be charged if the contractor was sent to our house. However, the contractor was in the neighborhood for other houses, including our neighbors, and also the notice states otherwise. The notice states that if the city undertakes the work, the cost will be added to the tax roll for the property without any further notice. However, it is very clear that my husband and I undertook the work and therefore we should not be charged. On February 8th, my husband received results on his back. He was diagnosed with scoliosis, degenerate disc disease, spondylar arthritis, which is arthritis in his back. And then we received a second notice on March 5th. The snow had fallen over the weekend and it had froze overnight into a very thick layer of ice as we were very high north. This was during extreme cold weather alert. We have a news article provided in the agenda. Uh, when we received the notice, we removed the top layer of the snow and we placed salt on the ice to remove the slippery conditions as section two of the notice advises that removal may include being treated with ice melting or, or traction material to remove any slippery conditions. It was physically impossible to clear the ice. On March 8th, we noticed blue salt was placed on the sidewalk and we were concerned as we had already placed the salt. The contractor did not remove any of the ice as they most likely also found it impossible to remove. The photos by the contractor showing the before and after are not clear to show any removed snow and once again showing the work we completed in removing the first layer of snow. On March 9th, there's also a calendar, you could see that the temperatures began to increase and there's photos and videos of my husband actually removing the ice from the sidewalk despite the diagnosis on his back. So after hours, we were able to fully clear the ice. And as I stated in the previous notice, we once again completed the work ourselves. I do not feel the contractor placing salt on top of salt is a reasonable payment of $137.38 as the charges appear. We took the steps necessary to make sure the sidewalk not, was not slippery and when possible worked very, very hard to remove the ice. I feel it's unjustified to be charged this amount when we actually clear the sidewalks even with the conditions from my husband's back. And I completely understand these charges if the contractor did conduct the work on our sidewalks, but we were informed on the notice that that's when the charges will be placed. And so these charges are not valid because we completed the work ourselves on both occasions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Vicente, are you on the board to ask a question for the delegation? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Abdu, for coming here and uh, advocating for your situation. Uh, in a similar fashion to the previous delegation, on today's agenda, we have some discussions with regard to your item and with regards to overall winter maintenance here in the city. We understand that many residents are frustrated uh, for a variety of different reasons, and so we will be having a wholesome discussion later on today. So. I would like to thank you for coming. We're hearing you and others. And uh, I would like to move for receipt of this delegation as well, Mr. Right. So, um, Councilor Vicente has moved receipt. Uh, we're going to have a fulsome discussion later on regarding this. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, all in favor? That carries um, 6.6. .6, uh, sorry, before we get to that, um, there's a request for an added delegation 8.14 uh, in regards to uh, the report 8.2.6. Uh, Sanju Katara, um, and we need a two thirds vote to add this to the uh, to delegate to the agenda. So it's an added delegation right now. It's just come in now to to my attention to snow removal, right? So do we have two thirds? All in favor? That vote, that carries. So Sanju, Katara, if you're here, you're, you're not yet. So that's gonna be 8.1, 6.14. Well, yeah, just hold on, we'll get to you in a minute. So if Sanju Katara is here, you'll be, that's Sanju? Okay, hold on, let me just clear things up, one sec. 
So Th through you, Mr. Chair, so the, the, the paper I gave you with the added delegation, I understood was in addition to 6.5 and 6.6, right. but my apologies, it looks like Sanju has already been listed on the delegation. Okay. So he is 6.6, .6. he is the next oh, person so he's to delegate. Okay, our apologies, so we take that back. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here just to, uh, I'm from 76 Addington Crescent, and uh, we've been clearing the snows and the sidewalks and everything, but we've still been added with some charges of $900 plus for snow removal charges, which I would request everyone to wave this off to me, as this has been a serious uh, issue with me, and uh, I don't know why we have been charged with these charges, as there was no notification, nothing, just a letter's been issued for the snow removal charges with the contractor, plus the admin fees of $300 each twice. So I could request if you all can look into this, and uh, same thing, adding it to the city to request to waive this off. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, again, we're going to have a fulsome discussion on this, and so um, there's a couple people on the board right now. Are there are there questions towards to the delegate? Yep. Okay. So we'll be. You have a question for the delegate? I do. Okay. So um, we'll go to Councillor Paleshi, and then after that, Councillor Fortini has a question for staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming. Um, you had said in your delegation that you received no notification, just a letter. Yeah. Just the, the charges, and we have been uh, penalized with the interest charges and those uh, city char charges for uh, twice for $167.90 for contractors' charges plus $300 for admin fees, and that has been twice plus the interest charges. And that was indicated plus in the letter, or the letter indicated that you needed to? to I just got a letter indicating to pay it along uh, with my taxes. Oh, it was a letter of payment. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That was my uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fatini, question for staff. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, that's why I always say registered mail is always the best, and we always look at uh, not sending it and just putting a notification because it's our word against their word and it goes back and forth. When it's registered, at least we know what they have. Uh, just to stop, so what did we do? I think some other people came in in the past. What did we do with them? Do we know? Uh, the other four people? So through you, Mr. Chair, so that is the purpose of Report 8.2.6, which is on today's agenda. There were a number of delegations at the May 15th meeting, and staff are reporting back in regard to that. Okay, so we'll have to carry it over. I guess we'll have to wait for that report, see what they're doing, and then this one, I'll, I'll talk about this one after. Okay. We, we can discuss this in 8.2.6. Councilor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Same type. I'd like to move for receipt of the delegation. Thank you. And so, um, so... Sanju, you there? So we're going to have a discussion on this on 8.2.6. So we've taken uh, note of what you said. Uh, again, just in, in Councillor uh, Vicente's moving receipt of your uh, delegation today. So we thank you. We'll, we'll, we're going to discuss this a little bit later. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thanks so much. I appreciate everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so all in favor of receipt? That carries. Uh, and so that concludes... No, 6.7 is... That's 6.6, 6.7 is not here. Um, and so what we're gonna do is this. Um, we're gonna move up 6.12, um, Bill Bring, uh, just because um, he's indicated that uh, he has to travel out of town. Uh, so we're gonna move 6.12 forward, um, and then we'll, we'll carry on with the rest of the um, delegations, which is 6.9 again, which is Sylvia Roberts. So, um, Mr. Bring, do you want to come up? So, sorry, if the clerk can just uh, speak to this. Real quick. Through you, Mr. Chair, this delegation is in regard to the report 9.2.1 on today's agenda, which deals with the budget amendment in regard to natural turf and maintenance equipment for pit cricket fields, cricket pitches. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council, and uh, thank you, staff, and Honorable Mayor Brown uh, for uh, having me uh, presenting myself here. Uh, I'm a president of uh, uh, Brampton Warriors Field Hockey Club, uh, working on a sports only uh, because I, it came into my attention that, uh, you know, we are uh, funding cricket 
and at the same time, my concern is what about the other sports? Uh, reason being, uh, we are discussing funding only the one for, uh, sports, but uh, we are neglecting the other sports. Uh, even during the elections, it's been an agenda of, uh, at the election that if we can put more toward all the athletes and we can have more funding for the athletes and uh, sports and recreation, keep them off the streets and off the drugs and put them into the sports and uh, recreation, which will eliminate crime and which will uh, make them have a better life. Uh, reason of me uh, coming over, uh, cricket, uh, yes, it's a growing sports. Along with that, field hockey is also a uh, uh, growing sports within the GT area. Uh, in the uh, cricket, most of the players are, athletes are 25 years above. And they're all working people. They can afford their own expenses, whereas in the field hockey, all the youth is from age of six to age of 18 and they are relying on their parents, and their parents have already been uh, paying all the expenses of their sports and recreation along with the uh, high city taxes, high insurance, and traveling south for work. And uh, that is extra burden on the parents uh, for that. Uh, BC, uh, British Columbia, they have water-based tutors, which is free of cost for any of the organization to use. And that is the reason they are having maximum athletes into the national team. Uh, whereas we uh, have only one water-based turf, which came into Canada, Brampton in 2012, 2013, uh, 2012. And uh, we only was able to hold the first Pan Am Cup and first nationals. After that, uh, that ga those games has been moved to University of Toronto fields because uh, Panam Committee and the Trillium Committee came to City of Brampton uh, to fund uh, City of Brampton to build another turf, but we turned that down, and that moved to uh, University of Toronto. And ever since, all the national, international, and provincial uh, events has been moved to Toronto as well, and we are not benefiting from it. So, reason uh, for me coming over, uh, not only outdoor uh, field hockey is also being played indoor. When we originally built uh, uh, Dixie Soccer Center, it was in the agenda at that time, in the planning, that there will be allowed for indoor field hockey, which was after once it's built, it was never allowed to play field hockey because field hockey is being played with a hard ball and all the uh, uh, facility have a glass. So there is alternative can be made uh, by having a net against the wall and uh, to uh, play field hockey, but it's never been brought into the attention and never been paid attention to bring that kind of, uh, uh, you know, alternative to allow indoor field hockey as well. All the clubs within the GT area having a hard time. So, sorry, uh, you went over the um, time <coughs> limit, and I believe Councillor Medeiros wants okay. to move extra time. Okay. Right. So all in favor of uh, extra time? Um, that carries. I'm going to finish in two minutes anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, even after that, Casey Campbell got built. Again, same problem. Uh, at the uh, basketball course, they also have the glass and where uh, field hockey cannot be used. Now, uh, in Ward 7 and 8, we are thinking, of, uh, city is thinking of rebuilding the Victoria Park Arena. I would just put uh, my thoughts in it to have that arena to be rebuilt, uh, looking at uh, keeping the field hockey into the consideration where we can use the same facility for the basketball as well as for the field hockey indoor, and which can help uh, our youth to grow. And uh, it, it's very uh, properly situated in the area where we can benefit from the Brampton clubs as well as from the Mississauga clubs can use that as well. And uh, so that is uh, uh, only on, on that, like how we can work on the uh, field hockey side. And second of all, our achievements in the field hockey. Uh, Ontario got first water-based turf in 2012, but even before that, in the international team, we had three athletes from in Canada team from Ontario and th two athletes from the Brampton uh, who represented in the last Olympic. Uh, they were from Brampton. In Mendor indoor national team, 
12 out of the 16 athletes are from Ontario. Uh, in the current achievement, national women's team, eight athletes from 24 are from Ontario. And the national men's team, two athletes out of 24 are from Ontario. And national junior squad, 10 athletes out of 24 are from Ontario. Even having a lack of a facility, we are still working hard to send our athletes uh, to represent our Ontario and Canada. So if we are having a proper facility, uh, we can definitely represent our city and our area, our province better uh, at the map of uh, Canada. Right. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brinkus. Hang on, we got some questions. And, um, sure. Um, we appreciate you coming here today uh, to, um, um, to speak about field hockey. I understand that you, what you said was that you appreciate uh, cricket uh, in the funding that we're giving, uh, but you feel that um, there should be attention given to um, to other sports as well. Other sports. And so yeah. that's where the conversation is, I guess. Uh, it, it does relate uh, to uh, the discussion. And so um, we're going to begin by uh, going to Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming and delegating. I'm happy to move receipt of the delegation. And just to let you know, maybe Jasbir, um, you can reach out to the to the delegate to let him know some of the great things that are coming around, uh, around field hockey here in Brampton. Um, we actually have a meeting set up either later this week or next week with Councillor Dillon, <laughs> Councillor Singh, Mayor Brown, and myself to uh, to discuss uh, field hockey in Brampton and, and turf. So I uh, completely understand. I think it's a great opportunity now to recognize the late uh, Regional Councillor Paul Pleshi, who did bring the first wet field uh, field hockey um, pitch here in yes. Brampton. So uh, uh, thank you very much for being a part of that and, and coming here today. And I'm happy to bring forward the report on the cricket turf and move that report now as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. So, Chair. So, uh, Mayor Brown? Yeah, um, there's a lot of interest around field hockey. This report is on cricket, so I think it's probably better to, uh, um, this. Th I, I think your intention was to give a delegation on field hockey, not talk about the um, the level of grass that should be that should be cut for, for cricket. Um, but no, we do have a report coming on field hockey that there's a great interest in expanding field hockey. We were even discussing some of the potential with some of the new recreation changes we're doing. Um, we even had the discussion with, uh, with, with Victoria Park. And so I was at the field hockey championships tournament uh, in Mississauga this weekend. Um, they got some great fields there and uh, we're eager to have that in Brampton. So we are working towards that. Um, but this report um, is only on um, the cricket equipment necessary to uh, ma maintain the fields. Um, so I think uh, we can't, we, it would be out of context with the report to um, include your deputation in that report, but I think it's fair to say we all hear the, um, the general message and that uh, there's uh, broad support for investments in field hockey and, it's, um, it, and that's the direction we're heading. Thank you. And so Thank you. The the the, um, the move remove. Uh, sorry, uh, Council Fletcher has moved receipt. But uh, uh, just to uh, just beer, can we work with um, staff? Can work uh, and start discussions with um, Mr. Brings group going forward. Through the chair, definitely we will do that. Yeah. We'll, okay. Uh, so touch appreciate base that. With them and, yeah. Uh, we'll work with you. Yeah. Excellent. So we appreciate you you coming in today. I think it's very important that uh, somebody from field hockey does come in and, and let the uh, views know, uh, known of uh, uh, of your group and uh, other groups as well. And so, uh, Mr. Renault will be uh, in discussion, close discussion with you and uh, the rest of the field hockey uh, groups as well. So thanks so much. My main motive was to just to bring uh, this sports into the attention of the uh, rest of the council as well, because our Canadian team itself is top 10 in uh, in a worldwide ranking and a top three, uh, actually top two in uh, Panam uh, ranking. So. Which, this sport is being neglected, and we want not to be neglected because it's, it's uniting a lot of, lot of uh, athletes, and they're all Canadian youth. Absolutely. So that is the main motive. It's not uh, migrated youth. It's Canadian youth who is uh, in this sport, and uh, they definitely need uh, more attention to it. Absolutely, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, maybe if you guys can connect. Um, so move by Councilor Pleshi, move the receipt. And he's also we're also bringing forward... Uh, 9.2.1 as well. Um, so moved by Councilor Pleshi, and I believe that uh, uh, Mayor Brown wanted to second that. Sure. 
Uh, all in favor? Thank you. Um, Six point uh, a seven, I believe the delegation uh, actually was here. Kush Sagar. Is Kush Sagar here? No. Nope. Yes, Kush. Is Kush Sagar here? So Kush Sagar, we're going to move on from six point seven then. Um, we've done six point eight. Um, six point twelve is now done. Sorry, is anybody on the board? Are you Kush? So, what are you here for? Okay. Um, which so, through you, Mr. Chair, perhaps the, the the person can identify his property, and if it's something that's not listed on the agenda, there'll be a two-thirds vote yeah. required. So, what what address do you live at? Uh, Sorry. So you're in here regards to the snow clearing, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so were you, was your name already listed on here or are you just walking in? No, sir, I'm since morning at 9 o'clock. No, I'm I understand here. that, but was, sorry, I'm looking at the clerk, was, uh, was he on the... Uh, uh, even last list? time I was here. Th and just give a second. So yeah. through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, if, if this person was a delegate last time in May, um, yeah. all those delegates were notified about uh, the report 8.2.6 on today's agenda. And those that wish to wish to delegate and were made aware of the clerk's office, we listed them on the agenda. Um, you, yeah, I understand he was here May 15th delegating, um, but he's now attended and he would like to delegate. So the committee would need to add him to the agenda. Right. So, um, what's, can you state your name? Khalid Malik, sir. Sorry. Khalid Malik. Khalid Malik. Yes. Okay. Sir. So uh, we need two thirds to add Mr. Malik to the uh, agenda. He's speaking on eight point. Uh, 2.6. We need two thirds. All in favor? Okay, that carries. You got five minutes. Yes, sir. I only need two minutes because even last time I explained myself and uh, without uh, wasting your time, sir, I want to discuss this ma uh, uh, the merits on the, on the case. I received the notice. Uh, right away, I uh, did clean the snow with, uh, with my wife and daughter. After a few weeks, my landlord told me that he got the ticket because, of, uh, because I did not clear the sidewalk. Then I came to this office and met the city clerk. Uh, she happened to be here. And the, uh, she sent me to enforcement officer office. There I met the officer over there. <coughs> he told me th uh, to come to uh, other time so that he, uh, he can see the file. Uh, he, he, I went other time, and he told me that uh, I did clean the snow, but I did not, maybe I didn't clean it very well. If you see the pictures, uh, I'm glad that they have a picture. If you see the pictures, you will find out uh, that my driveway, which I hope they will not claim that uh, they were so nice to cle uh, clear my driveway. I'm sorry, I'm a hard patient, so I'm a hard patient. No, I have to finish it fast because I'm, okay. I'm not, uh, how you call it, rude to, or, or to humiliate you, but uh, I, I came here and then uh, five times and wasted so much time to save my $467 because I, I'm a pizza delivery guy and uh, I, Five times I was here uh, just to save my $467. And uh, I don't know, how you all guys make a very good money, but uh, believe me, it is very hard to make a bread and butter for, for myself. And uh, that's all my case. And uh, I hope I don't have to come other six times. And, uh, my landlord came uh, on first to uh, collect the rent, and he told me, uh, oh, you have to pay this one too, uh, without waiting uh, your decision even. And uh, it is the same, like maybe you understand more, maybe you can explain it to them too. That is what is happening to me. 
And that's all. Sir. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. That all I have to say, sir. Right. I think, um, so is there any, is there any questions for the, the delegation? Mayor Brown, are you on the board still? No. Um, so, uh, Councillor Vicente has a question, please. Sure, sir. Thank you, Mr. Malik. You lease the property? Sorry? You lease the property where yes, you sir, live? Yes, I'm uh, rented that property, sir. Okay. And in your lease, uh, does it require that you clean the sidewalks in front of your property? Yes, sir. And I do all the time, sir. Okay. And does your lease also require you to be responsible for any levies or charges that may be levied against your house or the house that you live in? Like what, sir? Like this one? So in, in this case where, you know, if, if there's a tax increase or in this case a tax surcharge, so are you... Sir, I don't care how much you put tax on him. I don't care for that. <laughs> Only did the, but it does not come on my back that I care. Yeah, this kind of, uh, I have and to, pay. this is my responsibility because he came right away to okay. me. He thank came you. right so, away to me. So and thank you very much. Oh, well. yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to make, to see that. So uh, you have been made responsible for these fines. That's what yeah. I wanted yeah, yeah, to yeah. know. Thank you for coming thank here today. You. Thank you very much, sir, for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> I'm and sorry to be. And Mr. Chair, I'll move for receipt of the delegation. Right, thank and you so, very so we appreciate that. Uh, and it's sometimes it is tough to speak up there, but you did very well. Uh, and so we're gonna have a very thorough conversation uh, of this on 8.2.6 when the time comes, right? Okay? No worries. Absolutely. I cannot afford that much more no. money. Right. And, uh, five times, I mean, believe me, I waste, uh, lost my m money, I mean. No. Lost my bread even. Right, no, Thank you, we understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so it's moved by Council Vicente. All in favor of receipt of the delegation? Can I see some hands? Yep, that carries. Um, So that was, uh, Peter, what was that added delegation? That was the added delegation 6.14. So in in agenda order, the next delegation is 6.9 okay. from Sylvia Roberts regarding carbon so, emissions related to transportation within the um, So we have, sorry, we have 6.9 left. We have 6.10 uh, left. So 6 and 6.11. 6, 9 and 6.11 are, are Sylvia. Um, and then 6.12 is, is um, Jermaine Chambers, and, and I do understand that um, our, our common procedures after two and a half hours to take a break. So I'm looking around at council if um, if they want to. No, I know. Yeah. So can you wait, Sylvia? Right. So we can do um, Jermaine, uh, and then we sorry we have six point ten, which is. Uh, uh, Brian Bishop. Yeah, the staff can staff. Does staff want to? I don't know if staff wants to. Yeah. Can you? Sorry, can you get on board? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a reminder to members of council before we consider to uh, take that lunch, if you do, if that is your wish, we still have a delegation for the stormwater management charge and that presentation associated with that and the experts are standing by at a cost to the city and I would uh, encourage members of council to consider that. Thank you. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll get to Sylvia after, we'll do um, storm water now uh, and then we'll do Jermaine and then we'll take a break and then we can, we can uh, discuss uh, with Sylvia after. So um, we'll move to six point first, right? Okay, so 6.10. Um, Council Willens. Just, uh, I was just curious, the person that pulled this out of consent is not here because he wanted it, Councillor Singh, so I don't know if Councillor Singh is in the building, but he was the one that asked for this not to be put in consent, and we understood that the consultant was here, so we wanted to put it in consent, but he pulled it out and he's not here, so... 
I don't know where he's gone. Are there any questions in regard to I, the, I had no questions. The, I don't think is there, any, is there, is there uh, any questions into the related to the report? I'll just move the report if it's possible because Councilor Singh is not here. Is there a desire to see the presentation? So, Councilor Williams, you're still on the board. I think uh, that Councilor Vicente, who's the chair of Public Works, made it pretty clear that we'd all been briefed on this stormwater report at the start of the meeting, and Councilor Singh pulled it out. So I'm not sure where, what to do now. I apologize to the consultant for being here all day, but uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. but I'll let the uh, I'll let the chair of uh, Public Works speak, please. What, what, what number is it? To you, you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, it's 6.10, the presentation, and the report is 9.2.2. Councillor Vicente. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I uh, initially, at the... Um, Approval of the uh, consent uh, portion of the meeting I had asked for this item to be entered into consent but I believe there were some members of council including yourself uh, mr. chair who wanted to ask some questions and that's why we are here uh, if there are in fact no questions and then I would move for receipt and moving of the recommendations in the report I did uh, have questions so but I don't know what if if, if if you guys want to see the presentation, we'd go straight to the questions. See the presentation. We're going to go straight to the presentation then. Yeah. It's up to the chair. I got questions. I don't need a presentation. I just got questions. If you can. Stop. 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 I would, I, I, I would request to Councilor Pelesi, if you're going to speak to the chair, speak a little bit respectfully. How am I not respecting the chair? You said you had questions, Mr. Chair. If, if you have something to say, get on the board. Councilor Vicente, you're done. What I tried to do right now was in, in respect to, in respect to, you're not on the board. Chair, you're not on the board. Councillor Vicente was on the board. Now I'm speaking. Now I'm speaking. Now. So what we tried to do was in respect to time, in respect to time, try to get through things. And Councillor Singh had questions, uh, and I do. Point of personal privilege. And I do have uh, a couple of questions. But what what I thought was at the indulgence of. Council to see if there's no you'll wait until I'm done to see if there's a, a, a if there's a will of council to see the presentation but there was questions I do have uh, and so if there are questions uh, we'll let council ask them and so um, Councilor Fatini you're on your next you're next on the board point of order Councilor Fatini I just wanted a presentation. Okay, so we'll do the presentation. Do you have something to say, Council Fletcher? I do. Well, I think so. Yep. Um, Mr. Chair, you indicated that I was being disrespectful to you as the chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, get my point across that uh, nobody had indicated they wanted to hear a presentation. You had indicated that you had questions. So I was encouraging you to ask those questions. Next time, would you like me to say please? How was I being disrespectful to the chair? So through you, Mr. Chair, you've asked which item on the agenda are we on? We're on item 6.10, which is a presentation um, from uh, consultants on behalf of the city regarding the Brampton Stormwater Management Charge presentation. And this relates to staff report item 9.2.2 on a Brampton Stormwater Management Charge. That's the item that's before right. the committee. And so time. what we'll do is we, I did have questions. I did have some concerns about this. Again, what I was trying to do was to see if there's a will to have the presentation. Uh, Councillor Pertini has asked that he wants to see the presentation. There's a couple of concerns that I did have. 
general ones. Uh, and to respond to you, there's, a, there's a, a respectful way to speak to somebody. You don't order somebody, especially if they're the chair. It doesn't matter who it is. And so you've made your point, and that's fine. Uh, and so we'll go to the uh, presentation Sorry first. That you felt that I was ordering you, but I You're out of order now, and we'll go to the presentation. I wasn't ordering Thank you. you to do anything. That's not my place. You said you had questions. You're out of order so now, said, and we're going to go to the presentation. You're being disrespectful still. I'm we're going to go to the presentation. Wow, disrespectful. You're abusing the power of the chair. Councillor Pileshi, please. Can we please? Chair, you have, can, can we? Can, we got a presentation. We apologize. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Brian Bishop from Wood. Um, before I introduce uh, my other speaker, we were going to ask for some additional time to give the presentation. We were going to ask for 10 more minutes, but we would respectfully ask for five more minutes. Yep, yep. so moved by Councillor Pileshi. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Um, also presenting is Peter Simsisco from Watson & Associates. And we also would like to thank Michael Harrell from the uh, Environment and Development Engineering Department for preparing the presentation with us. So, In terms of the current term of council priorities, a number of them are listed, but we're going to focus on the fourth one, the stewardship of your assets and services. Stormwater management is a core service delivered through an extensive network of stormwater assets, which protect people and property from flooding, erosion, and sorry, treats also polluted stormwater before discharging it to the environment. Uh, stormwater runoff is that portion of rain and snowfall or snowmelt that runs off the land. And generally, the more hard surface you have, the greater amount of stormwater runoff that you will have, comparing pre-development where as much as 50% might infiltrate into the ground. Uh, under post-development in a high-density uh, location, um, very much less gets into the ground. So. Um, in this case, example, almost five times as much stormwater can run off the land. And as we've noted, stormwater uncontrolled can cause flooding and damage to property and infrastructure, damage to the environment, and potentially loss of life. Stormwater management works to collect and direct this water, control it, and reduce and eliminate these potential impacts. So Brampton stormwater management assets, it's actually the city's second largest asset class behind transportation and roads. There are over 1,800 kilometers of storm sewers, uh, 180 stormwater management pond or facilities, 420 kilometers of open water course, which is also part of the infrastructure, and 38,000 catch basins and 13,000 manholes. Naturally, storm sewers, catch basins, and manholes are, are not very high visibility. Um, the total replacement value of stormwater assets is estimated at 1.12 billion. But again, a lot of the assets are out of sight. And what that brings us to is the current situation for funding. Your stormwater operations and maintenance is funded from taxes, property taxes. And it's currently at about $6 million per year. That's 3.8 in capital and 2.2 in operating. And our study has shown that when you look at the stormwater infrastructure and maintaining your assets at a reasonable percentage of the total, um, there's actually a shortfall, persistent underfunding of approximately $16 million a year. Um, so the study has shown that 22 million is required to keep your assets in good order. And the additional 16 can be broken down roughly into about 14 and a half million in capital, such as storm sewer repairs, and three and a half million for pond cleanouts, and two and a half million for pond retrofits, and another 800,000 for water course um, cleaning and uh, maintenance, all of which is in the report which is attached. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Peter from Watson and Associates. Good afternoon. 
So once the funding gap that Brian was uh, just speaking about was identified, uh, the next, que next question was, um, how can a city address this funding gap with respect to stormwater services? And more specifically, looking at what sources are available to the city uh, to recover the cost of this important service. And what is critical in coming up or creating an adequate funding strategy that's defensible, uh, that's equitable, uh, that's stable, very importantly, is to create a rational nexus between the service and the fee that's ultimately paid by any particular user of the system. And when we look at um, the way that the, the stormwater system is funded currently and the service as a whole is funded currently through property taxes, um, about 78% of the city's tax revenue, a uh, property tax revenue that is comes from the residential sector. So residential users are paying about 78% of the property taxes and therefore are paying about 78% of the cost of the stormwater system currently. Looking at the actual characteristics of those residential properties and how much they contribute in terms of runoff into the stormwater system, that percentage is more closer to 44%. So we have users that are contributing about 44% of the demand onto a service but paying about 78% of the cost. And so the question we're asking when, when assessing the appropriateness of a funding mechanism is how close is that relationship between the service and the fee that's ultimately paid. The stormwater management financing study uh, that, that is in front of you did investigate a number of approaches to funding stormwater services uh, and based on an assessment of uh, various criteria which I'll describe on a subsequent slide um, and also through stakeholder input that we received through the public engagement process, uh, what is ultimately being recommended is that the city proceed with, it, with a dedicated stormwater charge. Uh, that would also align with uh, recent trends that we're seeing in other municipalities across Ontario. So even within a general approach of funding stormwater services through a dedicated stormwater charge, there is a spectrum of options that exist. Um, there are flat charges per property, for example, uh, charges based on total land area um, or charges that are tied to water consumption of a particular user, just to give a few examples. Uh, the various funding uh, mechanisms that are available to the city were assessed against a range of criteria including the fairness in apportioning the cost of the system, uh, the transparency in calculating a charge that's ultimately assessed against the property, as well as the cost of administration. Um, and ultimately a user fee that's based on the amount of stormwater runoff or that it, at least approximates the amount of stormwater runoff generated by a property uh, was indicated to be the, the preferred source um, of funding for the city. And what that would allow the city to do is to shift that cost burden for the service uh, to those users who predominantly place uh, demands on the system. Um, then to establish also a balance uh, between the, the optimality of the charging structure, but being cognizant of the cost of administration um, required to actually maintain a billing database to assess these individual properties, what is being proposed is uh, for the residential side for there to be five tiers um, of uh, residential rates uh, that are dependent on uh, the measured roof print of building space on, on a given parcel. Um, most of the residential properties would fit into the um, single detached medium category, which is meant to represent an average and about 44% of the residential parcels would fall into that category. Then the next uh, largest uh, category would be the residential small, which would see about 29% of the city's residential parcels falling into that category. And then as well, followed by about 29% uh, falling into the townhomes, or sorry, pardon me, 21% uh, falling into the link homes and, and townhomes and similar type of development. And then approximately 6% of residential parcels would be this uh, larger uh, residential category. In terms of the non-residential properties, uh, so the commercial, industrial, and institutional uses, what is being proposed um, are charges that are based on actual measured impervious area of individual properties. Um, and that would help capture the large differences that often exist between individual properties even within those sectors, as well as to more accurately assess charges within uh, the sectors that produces most of the stormwater, stormwater in the city. This next slide, we did a, a market scan uh, focused more so on, on Ontario, but also Canada-wide and, and uh, the rest of North America. But the focus of this slide is looking at Southern Ontario and look, showing you the proportion of the population in southern Ontario that resides in municipalities that uh, charge uh, for stormwater services with a dedicated funding mechanism. So that's the blue portion of the chart, or about 54% of the, 
of Southern Ontario's population now resides in these municipalities that have a dedicated funding source for stormwater. And then and the, the remaining, uh, the, the remaining 46% of the population uh, lives in, in municipalities that continue to charge uh, for stormwater services based on property tax revenue. And in fact, when we look at the 10 largest municipalities in Ontario, eight of them currently have a dedicated stormwater uh, funding mechanism, and the two that don't, uh, the City of Brampton included in that top 10, are currently reviewing their options in that regard. The City of Windsor is the other municipality that's in that top 10. So we're certainly seeing a, a shift um, in terms of the municipal practices in this regard to adopt dedicated funding mechanisms. And I think it's um, clearly to recognize the importance of the service um, and the fact that there's a need to provide adequate and stable funding for these services. Uh, when we look at um, the, based on our initial assessment, the annual charges that have been estimated based on that assessment, uh, we see that the annual charge for the average or medium house, so the second line down, would be approximately $77 um, annually, uh, which works out to about $6.42 per month. Uh, and because the billing structure is based on a concept of a billing unit, uh, the remaining residential categories um, and their assessed charges are based on um, how big, on average, those other property types are relative to that medium. So, for example, um, a typical roof print of a townhouse is about half the size of, a, of that medium single detached residential home, so that type of property would be paying about half the charge of that medium single detached home. And then, as discussed um, a little bit earlier, the charges for uh, the non-residential sector would be based on actual measured impervious area of each individual property, and that rate would be uh, $3,290 per hectare of impervious hard um, area on those properties. And then the following couple of slides just provide a little bit of uh, context in terms of um, where those charges are in the context of this broader municipal um, segment. Um, I would note that each fee is very unique um, as it's dependent on a number of factors, the extent of stormwater infrastructure in a given municipality, the levels of service that a municipality has set out to provide, as well as the funding mechanism that's ultimately employed. Um, and so looking at the residential charges, uh, we would see that they're, they're moderate uh, relative to that market comparison uh, with the city of Brampton uh, being well within the range of, of charges that we see in other municipalities for that average single detached dwelling. And similarly for a typical large non-residential property, which to, to put that into context uh, of this comparison would be something like a large plaza uh, with a number of commercial uses, perhaps some standalone buildings with fast food uh, restaurants and a vast parking area. So that's, that's the type of scope of development that this would pertain to. And again, similar to the residential comparison, uh, by going to this dedicated uh, stormwater funding charge, we would see that or expect that to be well within the range of, uh, of fees that we see elsewhere in the market. And so having looked at the overall magnitude of the city's stormwater program costs, um, the proposed means of recovering those costs uh, through dedicated user fees, as well as the comparison of, of the calculated rates, I will now turn it back to Brian to provide an overview of the public engagement process that was a very integral part of the study uh, process, as well as the next steps. Thank you. So, uh, very briefly, the study was paired up with a number of public uh, engagement forces, the standard contacts through the website and uh, social media, newspaper, their newsletter, e-newsletter, the Jumbotron, um, information was posted at rec centers. Some engagement was done at some of the community centers and farmers markets, including uh, an online survey, and then there was a public information center held. And the stakeholders were represented in a stormwater advisory group with whom we met four times throughout the process. And what we heard was that maintenance of infrastructure is a priority. A Brampton stormwater charge should be in line with the average charge by other municipalities. The charge should be kept as simple as possible and everyone should pay their fair share. And the stormwater charge should be easy to administer for the city and also easy to administer for businesses, uh, commercial and institutional users. So should council adopt the proposal for a stormwater charge, staff would begin to work with the region of Peel to implement billing commencing in the first quarter of 2020. And staff will also establish uh, communication and uh, outreach initiative in conjunction with the Region of Peel prior to the implementation. And finally, just next steps after this June report to Council, 
would be aiming for the first quarter 2020 implementation, uh, we would undertake a detailed billing analysis of your approximately 140,000 parcels of residential parcels in the city. Um, we would need to work out and discuss uh, potential exemptions, credits, and adjustments to the charge, and then ultimately update your bylaws and development of administration policies and procedures, and all, all the while uh, an intensive communication and outreach program. Thank you. We do have um, some questions uh, and comments from uh, Council. We're going to begin with uh, Councillor Fortini. Through the Chair, uh, thank you for the presentation. A couple of questions. So if we do this uh, uh, cost of a single family and they're all uh, the average big home and small home, how could we balance it between a guy having a wider driveway, all, this, all the runoff he's got more than another neighbor, and he's paying for him? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the calculation is based on impervious area and uses air photos as well. So um, each residence would be uh, calculated. So if their rooftop and driveway total is more than their neighbors, then their their charge would be slightly more as well. So I think that's what uh, Mrs. Saga is doing. Uh, if their driveway is a little bit wider or their backyard has more concrete, they got more water flow. That's why the whole idea was perfect. They actually pay the fee, so you know, their driveways cut and stuff, but they get actually charged, but they still have to leave, I think, 43% green space, am I correct? So that water really affects all the extra flow? Yes, because the, the, the storm sewer infrastructure is designed based on average impervious coverage in a, a residential area, which could be 45% or 50. And yeah, so in case of a bill, billing unit, if an individual property has much more hard surface, then they would be um, proportionately charged more. So how do we do that? Do we have a house by house and see how much concrete someone has in the backyard and how big their driveways are and measure every house? So there are a number of ways to possibly do it, and that's one thing that the city has to decide the level of effort and administration. You could do it for every parcel, or you could take averages based on that. And you would want to revisit occasionally, but you would decide how often you'd need to revisit. Um, in, in most cases, it is an average in a neighborhood based on a, a random sampling of, of uh, specific properties. And that's why I find it unfair. So if I, I have no concrete, I have no patio, i like my neighbor, I have no runoff. Is that what other the Maori municipalities are doing? They take an average or they actually so, yes, uh, sir, to that point, the one thing that needs to be discussed are adjustments, exemptions and credits and adjustments, where an individual can come in and say exactly that and say, I'm being charged at this level. However, here's proof that I'm at a lower level and there can be a mechanism for them to get a reduction. Okay, thank you. I'll move the, wrap it around the report. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so, I, my council, um, my council partner, ward partner here, just kind of answers some of the questions or asks them. But, you know, in Ward Seven, um, in a portion of Ward Eight, we do not have any catch basins, and um, you know what we're finding is that there is an increased amount of flooding that is happening in the area. And so I, I understand how this is a great strategy to hopefully deter people from um, either patio stoning or concreting their whole backyard or a portion of it. But do we, is there another uh, mechanism that we are, are exploring for um, some type of enforcement or reporting kind of system? Is that also brought into this? If uh, a neighbor wanted to report on another neighbor saying there's only such and such portion of their backyard being that is uh, impervious. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, yes, that's one of the things the city has to decide is what level of enforcement they want to do. So it does mean more staff to potentially be put into a stormwater program to go around and respond to things and check on things to make sure that people aren't uh, doing what you're suggesting. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a, it, it then becomes part of the cost. So. Mm -hmm. The estimate that we've put forward is based on uh, a moderate amount of administration and staffing, and there is a breakdown of how many people 
are required, um, and initially more people are required to get this rolling, but once it gets going, more the, you can pare back the number of staff required. So, but that all does enter into the total, the 22 million that we suggest, okay. includes people to do some of that, yes. Okay. So, and also with the communications and outreach, um, are we doing a communication and outreach that um, focuses on the charge that's coming, or are we able to start focusing on the need for this and the impacts that um, enlarge, you know, making your driveway larger or a patio stone in your backyard, the impacts that it's making on our, our um, stormwater? Are we able to focus on, on those areas? Because I really wonder if many in the community don't really understand the impacts that it's having. And uh, you know, it's extremely important for the community to understand that. Yeah. If I could jump in on that, sorry, I just, mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking some of these questions may be slightly unfair for our consultants to have to answer, oh. uh, but certainly that would be a part of that communication is to look at not only what the charges are, why they're in place, what, what citizens can do to help control stormwater costs, and as a result, keep the rate uh, affordable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, and either to the consultants or staff, whomever is most appropriate. Um, when Councillor Vicente and I were um, going door to door during the election last year, um, a lot of residents had complaints about natural heritage and store around stormwater ponds, around um, drainage infrastructure, etc. And uh, they wanted to see everything groomed. The problem with the grooming is that it actually puts more pressure on our stormwater uh, storage infrastructure in general. And so I think it would be great um, as part of the education component when we're looking at costs and, and letting the residents know about these uh, stormwater charges that we do a bit of an education piece perhaps on the importance of natural heritage so that we get less complaints about weeds, et cetera, and more support for natural heritage as the more efficient way to mitigate and uh, manage stormwater. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the stormwater management charge has an education and outreach component that is gonna be comprehensive. It is gonna educate the citizens of Brampton, Brampton on what stormwater management means, how they can reduce the burden on the system, and also um, give them information on the charge and how it's calculated, what they can do to mitigate that charge, and hopefully just improve their uh, understanding of stormwater management in general. Yeah, that would be great, but I think um, it's a lot of, and it, sometimes when you break down the costs and you put it into numbers, they just don't, like, it's really difficult to understand. But if you show, share with them that natural her heritage around this area is important because it's gonna save you X number of dollars um, and help our, our uh, relieve some pressure off the stormwater storage infrastructure. People just don't see the connection. They just wanna see groomed grass, cut grass, everything clean. So I just bring that up because that we heard a lot about that um, when we were going door to door. Thank you. Councillor Fortini. Yeah, uh, th thank you, through the chair, I forgot to ask. So, so I know that certain areas we're going to be charging, but what do we do with areas like my, where I live? We don't have a storm in a cemetery. Everything's in one. There's no plumbing there in the middle of the road. It's only a 12 inch. And those are the areas that are really getting flooded unless you put a backwash valve. Now you get the new areas, anything built 19, after 1974, they got a storm and they got a cemetery. Other areas, especially around the Queen Street, Balmoral, or certain areas of Brampton, they only have one. So I'm paying for them, and they got two different types. Um, if I can, through you, Mr. Chair, maybe I can start off. Michael, uh, certainly jump uh, in uh, and correct. But, um, you know, to put it in context, it, it's taxpayers who are paying for those costs today, and, and really this is just looking at a different technique for for actually collecting the funds. There will be need for improvements to the storm right. system throughout, and this provides that funding mechanism to right. do it. So it's not really intended to be whether or not you have the storm sewer in front of your house. It's, a, it's right. much okay. like we do with the road system. So the region appeal gives a, a credit, or if you take it down, spouts out. And that's what I'm trying to So we got two different types of sewers on the road. So if you're giving a credit to take the down, spouts out, 
and we don't have it. So it's going on the, on the road, on the driveway, and it's going on the sewer. So they're actually adding water. That's what I'm separating. Or am I wrong? Uh, if I can, through, through you again, Mr. Chair. So we certainly can look at some of the, those okay. details. The, the challenge, and, and someone else has noted it, is we're trying to keep the administrative costs as low as possible because the higher the administration of dealing with the specifics of individual properties and that drives up the rate for everyone. And so it, it's trying to find that right balance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patini. Councillor Singh. Yeah, um, I had a lot of my questions answered with uh, Councillor Williams when we were uh, in that uh, workshop, uh, you know, just learning about Brampton stormwater system. It was quite informative. Um, but the intention behind this, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it is to um, take away the pressures, I guess, from the tax base as well and move to a pay-per-use model, essentially. And, and I know the implementation might be tough, but I think... Uh, what suggestion, what's suggested here in Q1 2020, it, it, it's not going to be overnight. It's going to be rolled out. And I think um, I was going to raise the same point as Councillor Williams. I think we're just a little bit concerned about making sure the communication goes out. And I know most uh, councillors have echoed that. So if we can make sure the communication is there, I mean, this is the right thing to do at the end of the day. I, I do believe that. So thank you for all the work as well. And just be mindful of the communication aspect to this uh, change. Thank you. Councilor Pileschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for uh, for waiting today and, and providing us with the uh, presentation. I'm happy to move receipt of the delegation and uh, move the report forward. Right, so um, it's moved. Uh, I have a, just a couple quick um, concerns that I do have. Um, so the increase in, in, in water runoff, that's related to climate change in your opinion? It's related to the change in land use. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's related to the change in land use from the normal natural condition mm -hmm. to covering it with hard surface driveways and your house also has a rooftop that allows, that right. doesn't allow rain to get into the ground. Um, if we delay this, what are the ramifications? Sure, Mr. Chair, um, there will be a need to address the needs of the stormwater system in the future. We've already looked at what it means for a tax base. If we were to fully fund the uh, stormwater capital works that are going to be required, we're looking currently at quadrupling the tax contribution to stormwater services. Currently right now, we've estimated it at $33 per taxpayer. That would go up to $124. Mm -hmm. So you, implementing a user rate actually reduces that, in, that tax impact. Right, and so I think some of the concerns that uh, a couple of residents have uh, addressed to me is that it's quite a bit and it's very quickly this is coming into place. And so if Mississauga had implemented this uh, uh, fee in 2016, why has it taken us, us three years? Why didn't we, uh, I guess, address it, address it earlier? We have been working on this since 2017. We came to council and asked for permission to go ahead and look at this, and we have been working on it for the last two years. Right. So it it's does take a lot of work to prepare for a charge. Yeah, just to clarify as well, this is something that most municipalities are going through, is that correct? That's correct, okay. and many Cor more are already studying the issue. Yeah, across Ontario or across Canada? Across, North, uh, across Canada, across North America. There's right. currently about 1,400 municipalities across North America. Right. And so um, something just for staff now, is this, um, I guess this is a really pressing issue that's coming up uh, across the country in, in, in North America from what I heard. Um, is this being something that has been discussed or that we can discuss at uh, uh, AMO or FCM? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, so certainly the issue of, uh, of flooding, of... Uh, the impact of, of the severity of climate change in the way that, uh, you know, the, the pattern of weather that we're getting. Uh, I know there have been discussions at FCM, and, and I'm not too sure exactly about AMO on that, but the, those would be appropriate. I think the stormwater charge approach itself is, a, as indicated in the presentation, you know, you have about, uh, I think it's 55, 56 percent of, of the major cities have already moved to it, so I'm not too sure what the dialogue on that particular topic would be, but on the topic of the impact of, and the costs that municipalities 
are facing in general on uh, on managing stormwater would be a uh, I think an appropriate discussion. And so, um, have there been because we've had just passed a zero percent uh, increase for tax? Has there been discussion on how we can, uh, aside from as an alternative to to taxing our residents, how we can come up with this additional sixteen million? I probably need to look to uh, to the treasurer and that to to discuss that. But I think what the message here is is that this is trying to reallocate the cost to be uh, more in line with the impact that you actually have. So so generally, what this is doing is reducing the impact on a resident and, and placing more of it on the uh, the non-residential properties. I'm looking to the experts, and they're nodding their heads. So I've got that statement correct. <laughs> Well, yeah, obviously, it's a it's a concern because uh, anytime, um, whether it's the residential or non-residential, have to pay more. Um, you know, it's not always the funnest thing to do, and we want to make sure that, even though I guess uh, a disproportionate amount that uh, our residents are paying, we don't we we want to make sure that it's easy to do business here, but it's also easy to live. And so, um, the final question is: Could this have, like, I'm thinking that it would have been. Um, more appropriate to even have this discussed during budget time as well. Um, so, but you know, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And so, but my, my concern though is uh, this: this it's a huge cost, 16 million bucks extra. Um, and, you know, I know we split up the cost that for different types of homes, it's a different amount of money. But uh, um, I'll, I'll get to the other uh, speakers on the board. Council presented. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I want to thank uh, staff and works for all of the work that they did on uh, developing this new direction forward. Uh, if we explain to the residents of this city that over time they have installed a, a system of stormwater management that is worth over $1.2 billion and that it has a serviceable life uh, expectancy of 20 to 30 years, and that in 30 years they are expected to pay for the replacement and upkeep costs of maintaining that system. And we tell the residents of this city that they uh, contribute uh, uh, currently 78% of the, to the total cost um, through their taxes, um, and then they are responsible for replacing and repairing this system in the future when it eventually needs repair. Um, they would say, okay, I guess we'll pay that when the bill comes. What this council and what the city is now doing is they are taking a realistic look at who uses the system the most. Mm -hmm. And currently, from the report, it shows that more than half of the water that enters the stormwater uh, storm system comes from non-residential ratepayers, commercial businesses, businesses that tend to have uh, a lot of uh, impervious land area associated with their uses. And so this is about being fair and making sure that our infrastructure and the costs associated with upkeeping it is paid for by those who use it the most. And so it, we're rebalancing how the costs are paid for in this city. And I think that this is a very good news story. And uh, I think that when residents understand these points, they will understand uh, the, uh, the, the real wisdom behind this move. And uh, we want to just thank staff for taking us through this. They briefed every single member of council prior to this. And um, we want to make sure that the residents of this city pay for only what they use, not a penny more, and that um, those who use the system more pay for their share. And so I think this is the right move for this city at this time. So thank you very much for staff for walking us through this today and to our advisors for taking us through uh, the fine points of this initiative. Thank you. Councillor Willens. Thank you, through you, Chair. I wasn't going to speak to the report, but thank you for uh, doing the presentation. Thank you for the staff's comments. Um, 
Councillor Vicente mentioned that, that it is just switching it from residential to more of the commercial and institutional and uh, industrial. Uh, I think I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, but Canon Canada is doing their own stormwater management on their property now. So there's an example of a big company headquarters in Brampton are taking initiative on their own to reduce the stormwater management and reduce the storm that uh, the runoff that's going into our storm systems. And also, uh, I believe Orlando, who is one of the largest uh, property owners that have s square footage wise, as far as parking lot and stuff, are in favor of this in favor of this report as well. So there we have two examples in Brampton that are speaking highly of this report. So I don't see this should be much of a, a challenge to get this communication out to our residents. So thanks very much for coming forward and thanks for uh, the report by staff. Thank you. Um, there's no more speakers and so um, the motion has uh, been moved by Councillor Pleshi as well as receipt. Okay. Um, Councillor uh, Vicente. Uh, has moved, uh, receipt and report. Uh, all in favor? Thanks so much for your patience, guys. Jermaine, welcome. Thank you, and you have five minutes. Um, this should better reflect that this is a delegation on behalf of um, Brampton Family Festival and not necessarily from me um, personally. So Brampton Family Festival is scheduled to take place right here in Brampton on August 4th, uh, scheduled to be at the Mount Pleasant Go Station right here in the city of Brampton. Um, the principals for the festival are here today. Um, on my right we have Mr. Lloyd McDowell who is no, probably known most by from James Jerk, a well-established business here in the city of Brampton, has been a businessman in the city for over 26 years, um, has three well-established companies here in Brampton, serving the residents of Brampton and around. He also hosts on an annual basis a community barbecue, which, she, which sees over 3,000 people in attendance uh, for his barbecue each year. Also, the other principal for this festival is on my left, uh, Mr. Carlton Wilson, um, who operates an entertainment company called Nitro Entertainment, um, been in the city as well for over um, 20 years, um, hosts an annual barbecue which draws a much larger crowd of over 5,000 people each year, um, promoting uh, special events to the Caribbean diaspora and beyond. Um, these are some photos of some of the festivals that they have held and how, how large they have been in terms of the support. So they have come together to see if they can bring a much larger festival to Brampton and hence the Brampton Family Festival. So the inaugural event, as we said, will be held on August 4th here in Mount Pleasant. That date was chosen primarily because they want to take a good spin-off of the Toronto Carnival, uh, which is popularly known as Caribana which always take place in Toronto on the third each year. And um, so this normally, bring, Caribana normally brings in a lot of tourists into, into the city, into the city of Toronto. And it seems a long weekend, they are normally looking for something to do after that big event. So Brampton Family Festival is positioned to take, both to serve the residents of Brampton and to take advantage of this wide amount of tourists who will be in and around the city. It will be a, a family-focused event uh, that has a big uh, kids' entertainment village, um, providing both free entertainment as well as free meals to the kids who come out to this, um, to this festival. Uh, important to point out that it will be a music festival with live DJs and not necessarily a concert. Uh, the concert is a different concept. Uh, so this would be like a music festival that will take place, um, celebrating black and Caribbean culture. They are also proposing to have a major fireworks at the end of the show to close off the night. Um, there's a scholarship component to the program where they will ha have uh, kids in high school who will enter an essay competition and then winners will be chosen and scholarships will be presented. So it's also giving back um, to the community for this festival as well. Um, so the stats tells us that there are probably over 82,000 um, individuals in the city of Brampton who identify as being from the black community. Uh, also important to point out that you know, the Caribbean culture 
includes many others who, do, who don't necessarily um, identify as being black. You know, there's a large Chinese Caribbean community, a large um, Indo-Caribbean community. So there's a large community to be served um, by hosting this festival here in our city. Um, so these individuals are asking that the city partner with them for this event. Um, they are asking for um, a grant program of 12,500. It's important to, in the, to point out that they had applied to the community grant program um, with this festival. However, they made uh, two errors on the application, and unfortunately, the application process did not allow for them to correct those errors um, in order to be considered. So hence, that's the reason why they are coming forward to you. So I want to point out that they do respect um, your wishes in terms of the grant process. Um, they did apply, um, but because of these two errors, uh, this is the avenue that they have to seek to see if they can get your assistance um, for this. Important to point out that you know, MP, MP Kamal Kiro in Brampton West has fully endorsed uh, this event, um, so as uh, MPP Amar Johnson do, and they are working very hard with this team to make this event a reality in that part of the city. Um, some events, some, some, some good impacts from the festival in my last slide. You know, we're expecting up, up to about 7,000 people to attend this festival. Um, we want as well to partner with the city to have the city come to do displays as well. Other community partners, whether it be Boys and Girls Club or mental health uh, counselors, be there to kind of display their, Jermaine, their, Jermaine, their you stuff. Read, you're, you're about 20 seconds away. 20 seconds, yeah. Minutes. We're expecting a good economic activity up to, up to about $500,000. Uh, we're expecting that, you know, it's a good potential for other vendors and others to come. So against that background, we're seeking your support um, to endorse this festival as a major event here in the city of Brampton. So thank you for the presentation. Um, Councilor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to move or see the delegation. Actually, maybe we don't have a staff presentation in front of us, all the, or a staff report in front of us. My apologies. <clears throat> We've had other um, grant applicants make errors on on their uh, submissions, um, and a uh, report came back to council um, outlining some of those some of those errors. And so we don't have anything before us, Jermaine. I, I'm just, I guess, my only question to you is, um, what took you so long to come before us? So in terms of um one of the things that when they when they received the information that um, the application was denied, they met with staff to discuss it, and uh, staff indicated that uh, the the next uh, avenue would be to appear before council to mm -hmm. get that done. So it's a matter of just um, for them, they wanted some more time to kind of uh, they took some time to meet with the committees and to fine tune some stuff with the festival, mm -hmm. and um, I guess this is the best time, the earliest time that was available. Um, for us to come to make the presentation. Okay, when was when was the submission uh, first put in for the grant? So it was done, um, the, so the application came in before the deadline. So I think the deadline, the application time was back in February? Somewhere. Back in February? Yeah, so it was in before the deadline back in February. But I think it took some time for the report to come back as to whether they were approved or not. And then when he got that, he approached staff, and staff indicated that he would need to approach council. Okay, so I think that there's there's some additional questions, and because we don't have a report before us, I'll go ahead and refer this back to staff, maybe to be able to respond to uh, um, some of the statements uh, to council of next week. Is that, uh, is that enough time? Through the chair, uh, yes, we would be happy to take this uh, matter back and report back to council next week with uh, additional information on the subject. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Council Williams. Uh, thank you, through the chair. So, um, I, I think it sounds so exciting, but I know we've spoken before, and you know, uh, Jambana has been endorsed by the city, and that is on the same day. And um, it is also a Caribbean um, festival, and it's at Garden Square. It's a free event. So how would your festival differ significantly enough for the, there to be a distinction or a difference? Um, what is different with that, as you see, 
I think Garden Square can, if we have all the people that's here, 82,000 decided that they want to go that weekend. Garden Square can hold that much people. Plus the guests that's coming from other the country, the US, the Caribbean. I've been um, involved in many music festivals over the Caribbean weekend. There are hundreds of events that's taking place mm -hmm. all over in Toronto. And they all been successful because people want place to go. So I think having two events in Brampton, Brampton have enough resident and people here to host two big events and to make them both successful at the same time. And so just to add to that to Constance as well, it's, um, so it's two different concepts. Um, so those who, I think what Jambana are proposing is like a, more of a concert kind of concept. And this is more like a music festival. So you have two different attendees. And uh, so just looking at the numbers, the amount of persons from the community who are in Brampton, uh, we think that there are sufficient members in Bram numbers in Brampton as well as those coming in um, to, to host two great events. And just to add to that as well, there's always an event that took place in, in Bonn um, that had a fail last year. So that event is no longer going in Vaughan. So this also position also take advantage of all that number of people who would normally go to Vaughan on the same day. And knowing that Jamban and that event in Vaughan were two major events on the day. So the Vaughan event is no longer on. So that crowd is looking for somewhere to go. And this position will also take advantage of that audience. So through the chair, I, I would appreciate the report back from staff because you know when we look at um, events, especially events that it, I'm assuming this is going to be ticketed, right, at the door? Yes. Yeah. It would be a ticket, ticketed event. And then with Jambana being a free event, also we have to see, you know, all of the, the, the impact, the financial impact that an event that is ticketed compared to a free event would have in the city. Um, so I do support some uh, report or some direction coming back for next week so we can just like, really explore all the options. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, thanks for coming in today. Um, I know that you came to share with us uh, beforehand what this was about, so I appreciate that. Um, and I do think that this particular event festival is a good complement to Jambana. I am concerned, though, that um, the community grant process has closed for 2019, and I appreciate your coming here to the table to ask, so certainly look forward to the report. Did you, have you looked at other sponsors to cover the 12-5, or are you approaching Kamal Kara, the MPP, and Amarjat Sandhu, who say that they're supporting you just as much? Because there's a lot of pressure on the city, um, especially given all the downloads from the province, and money not being released from the Fed. So any way that Kamal Kara, MP Kamal Kara and Amarjat Sindhu can uh, cover some of that 12.5 would be great because the community grant process did, did finish already. Yeah, so, um, so we, are, we are still awaiting a decision from, um, from the federal government on, on, their, on our requests for sponsorship. Uh, so that's something that's been waiting on. Um, the same errors that took place with the grant, with the city's application, also took place with the provincial grant, um, application, and that process. So we're, we're still working with the MP, MPP MRJO to see, you know, if we can work that situation out. Um, so, but that's where we are right now. So we are waiting a decision from the federal um, partners, and. Um, we're trying to see if we can make any changes at the provincial level. So I have an idea. Um, I would suggest that we find out the date of the Ford Fest, and you guys head over there to the Ford Fest, <laughs> shake hands with the Premier, and ask him for 12.5. And hopefully that will help. <laughs> okay, I'm actually serious. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. I received a text from him this morning, actually, about Ford Fest, so we'll we have the date and time. <laughs> so, so Mayor Brown is on next. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jermaine, for being back at uh, Brantha City Hall. Um, it's uh, nice that uh, Kamal Kara and Amarjot Sandhu support this, but uh, like Councillor Santos, I'd point out that the federal festival funding is about 1,000 times larger uh, than the funding we have available, uh, and it's right on the Heritage Canada website, and so if she supports it, it would be um, not even... Uh, uh, a piece of sand in their budget, uh, where in our budget it's uh, a larger percentage. And so it's almost uh, uh, comical that an MP would write in support when they have a budget that's much larger to allocate for things like this. And same thing with the Trillium Foundation, with the, the province. It's a uh, hundred times larger uh, uh, than the budget we have. Um, uh, so we can use this as a challenge to them, 
uh, to come up with uh, uh, the funding to support this, this festival. Listen, I, I think Lloyd, I've been to his events before, they're great, this guy is all about community, and I know that any event you're, you guys are involved in is gonna be terrific. Um, the challenge is we've turned down about 40 groups already who have come in asking uh, for um, funding after the application closed, and if you make one exception, it sort of opens the doors wide open to everyone in the city. Having said that, you did put an application in, and I'd like to know, just like other councils have said, why, well, what the errors were. Um, we had one case uh, where, from the Tamil seniors where the application uh, was completed but not submitted. Um, it might be something innocuous like that, and I look forward to that report, but if, if it's about some of the general guidelines that, that we adhere to very seriously in terms of it being Brampton vendors, a Brampton focus, uh, um, whether it's a not-for-profit, there are some general concepts that are the cornerstone of the community grant program, and as long as it's not one of those, uh, um, I'd like to know if it was simply an innocent mistake, and I think that uh, that uh, staff report back can, can give us that uh, insight. But uh, you know, we'll do our due diligence, find out what it was, find out, uh, and hopefully have a better leeway um, next year, um, but we should really challenge our other partners uh, if they want to support this event, uh, then they should uh, um, get involved. So, so just, to, just to, to, to shed some light on that, so there were two issues with the application. Um, one was the issue of the insurance, the event insurance. So as a business plan, he had um, talked to his insurance uh, provider who had used his business insurance, just extend the business insurance to cover the event. And apparently when that was sent to the city, the city, the city um, indicated that they weren't able to use his extended business insurance. So that was one of the issues. So they wanted to get a specific insurance for the event. And there was some issue with the registration of the event. So both those have been, um, have been rectified. Uh, the, proper, the proper event insurance and registration um, were done after receiving the feedback from the city. But you're free to review that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so, Councillor Vicente then Singh and questions to the delegation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, uh, kind of uh, hop on uh, what uh, my colleague, Councillor Santos, uh, said before, uh, and just as a public service announcement, that uh, Ford Fest will takes place on June the 22nd, and both our Conservative and PPs, I am certain, will be there. Uh, if I can, I will try to go. Um, with respect to festivals and other events that are held in the city, the city of Brampton is clear that we support uh, festivals and events and residents in all of the activities that they undertake to build upon the community spirit here in the city of Brampton. And just this week, uh, we did a workshop uh, with our folks at Economic Development on how we plan to move forward with the community grants program and how to make it work better for the residents of Brampton. Perhaps I'd offer staff an opportunity to comment just on some of the highlights of the discussion that we had and what the city is looking at doing on a go forward basis to make, uh, to help events like yours in the future. Through the chair, thank you, Councillor Vicente. Uh, yes, uh, this is one of many examples of current pain points and challenges uh, that we've heard about from the community, as well as from uh, Council overall about the current approach to the community grant program. Uh, one of the proposed directions that we're looking at taking with it is splitting the program basically in half, where the community grant program itself would remain focused on community development and offer a range of granting opportunities some open year round to address emerging opportunities or those who you know, perhaps during one window of time had uh, several issues that could be corrected later. That provides them with the opportunity to reapply throughout the year. And also in the investment side of the program that we are looking at uh, creating for the 2020 cycle, it would be focused on uh, tourism and events and things that have significant economic impact and marketing potential for the city of Brampton, uh, which uh, if Brampton Family Fest, that would be another opportunity in a future program for them to be considered, uh, given the potential of um, tourism and, and visitation and whatnot. 
Um, I would be uh, happy, of course, to address all of the um, comments that have been put forward today in a report back to Council next week. Just to echo Mr. Chambers' comments, um, there were some, some issues around the application during the program call. I understand at the time uh, the organization had applied um, using their private business license and at the time didn't meet the requirements to be either a registered charity or a nonprofit. Since the community grant program call has closed, staff have met with them and I understand that the organization has taken the appropriate steps to become a nonprofit and to pursue the required insurance. At this time, uh, we would be pleased to support them through the neighborhood initiative stream of the community grant program. However, that has a ceiling of $1,000 in matching funds. We would be happy to, of course, recommend providing that. Um, and we can discuss uh, any further recommendations beyond that $1,000 for uh, Council's consideration next week, as well as other resources that may be out there from other levels of government to support your event. Thank you, uh, Victoria. And through you, Mr. Chair, just another follow-up question. In terms of all community festivals that take place uh, within the City of Brampton with uh, funding from the Community Grants Program, the City, in other words, the City of Brampton, we require these festivals and events to be insured. Is that correct? Through the Chair, that is correct. And um, can you just explain uh, to members of council and to the public who are watching um, why it is so important that these events are insured and what kind of insurance it is that they need to procure and secure. Certainly. Uh, through the chair, uh, as a baseline, uh, the community grant program requires a level of uh, $2 million comprehensive general liability insurance for the organization. And that's not just for an event, it's the organization as a whole. Uh, that helps to protect the organization, uh, their attendees, and the city as well from any um, potential risks or liability that may arise from uh, the activities taking place around that event. And through you, Mr. Chair, is, is it the city's expectation that just the um, event organizers seek that insurance, or do we also expect, expect that insurance coverage to apply to all of the vendors and all the participants that are in that festival. In other words, do we require blanket coverage from festival organizers? Uh, through the chair, I would need to confirm those details. I don't have that information right in front of me, but I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you very much. So there's no further questions. Um, these, this information can be referred back in the report. Uh, it's been moved by Councilor Pileshi. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks again. So um, right now we uh, are going to break. It's uh, it, it's two o'clock. Uh, time is it? Two almost two o'clock. Uh, and when we come back, we will uh, do six eleven and six nine, both from uh, Sylvia Roberts, and those will be the final uh, delegations. And so. Um, I'm looking at council right now, how long we should take. So do you guys want to do in, sorry, just looking at uh, around the table, is there a desire to do a in camera and lunch at the same time or lunch? Uh, I know some people might have some calls to make, some emails to send, uh, and then do you want to do uh, in camera after that? Right. So we'll do 30 minutes, lunch, uh, and then uh, we'll come back and then we'll break to in-camera. Can we just break to in-camera now and we there at 2.30? So, so it's the will of committee. Do you want to get on? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that uh, we move a motion to move in-camera and recess back at 2.30 uh, at the in-camera where we... I don't know if it's going to be downstairs or upstairs. Fourth, it's in the fourth floor. So a 30-minute break and then uh, reconvene in, in camera, camera at 2.30. Yeah. Can we do that? Yep, yeah, fourth floor. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. All in favor. Question. Excuse me, candidate 18, please. Are we doing that now? Mm -hmm. yeah.
So let's let's do 45 minutes and we can do the uh, the video recording. Yeah. Right. Good so idea. we'll meet back at the fourth floor. 245. We'll meet back in the in camera room on the fourth floor. Let's go through the recording now. Candidate message. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, um, from closed session. So I'm going to um, – so we're going to report out uh, what happened in closed session. Uh, so 13.1, uh, well, a proposed uh, or propending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Um, this item was considered in closed session. Direction was given. Uh, including the following, the following motion be considered in open session. That bylaw be passed to authorize the Director of Economic Development and Culture to execute all documents necessary to terminate the current lease at 24 Queen Street with Market Square Inc. and to execute all documents necessary to enter into a lease with 52, 56 Queen Street Development Inc. for 52 Queen Street East for a one-year term with renewal options as directed by council and all other supplementary uh, agreements as may be required in connection therewith, each on terms and conditions acceptable to the Director of Economic Development and Culture or designate and in form accept acceptable to the city solicitor or designate, and that a budget amendment be approved in capital project number 191900-018 Interior design services be established in the amount of $145,000 for the expected costs associated with the move to 52 Queen Street East and with funding of $145,000 to be transferred from the general rate stabilization reserve. That is the motion. That is moved by Councillor Willens. Sorry. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Vicente. All in favor? Carries. The next item is 13.2, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Uh, this item was considered and direction was given to staff. 13.3, uh, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Uh, this item was considered and direction given, including that the following motion be considered in open session. Um, that a bylaw be enacted at the council meeting of June 19, 2019 to approve and ratify the agreement of purchase and sale uh, regarding those lands legally described as Block 585, Plan 43M-1550, City of Brampton, Ontario, being all the lands described in PIN 14366-2620, Ward 6, executed by the Corporation of the City of Brampton, and the previous owners of the adjacent 10799 Credit View Road, Brampton, Ontario, and that the Commissioner of Public Works and Engineering be authorized to execute any ancillary agreements or other documents necessary for the completion of the city's sale of the property on terms acceptable to the senior manager, realty services, and in a form acceptable to the city solicitor or designate moved by Councillor Willens. All in favor? 
carries. So 13.4 uh, was added to consent, uh, received, uh, appro was uh, approved, uh, in closed uh, uh, session direction was given. Um, through, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, the, there is a public motion. So this is, so I'm going to uh, look to the CAO. So potentially it could be earlier earlier than July 1st. So when it's when it's done and signed. If you just delete data as of July 1. Thank you. So 13.4 uh, was advised that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board, uh, not considered in, uh, was not considered in closed session, uh, was appro approved via consent, and direction was given. We're going to have to take a vote on this motion in public, so you can read the motion. Okay. That about that passed. So through you, Mr. Chair, 13.4 was added to consent, uh, so direction was given. As a result of the direction given, there is a public motion to be considered by committee. Yes. So um, this motion reads that a bylaw be passed to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the legal risk management agreement with Justice Risk Solutions, Inc., together with such other documents necessary to give effect thereto in a form acceptable to the city solicitor or designate. This was moved by Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown. Move it. Okay. All in favor? Carried. 13.5 uh, was uh, an added item, uh, which was the labor relations and employee negotiations and a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or, or local board. This item was considered in closed session and direction was given. Uh, lastly, 13.6, an added item, which was a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations, negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. This item was considered in closed session and no direction was given. So we are back to uh, our regular agenda. Closed session uh, is uh, uh, done, uh, and so we are going to proceed with uh, 6.9 and 6.11. Uh, so uh, they're both by uh, Sylvia Roberts, and so we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll do one for 6.9. We'll move on to the next one after that. Yep. So you got five minutes. week or last meeting you declared a climate emergency so this is someone addressing that here is a chart from your emergency management this is city data so as you can see 59 percent of emissions in the city of Brampton come from transportation of that of the total 47 percent is gasoline and 12 percent is diesel I'm speaking on transportation the rest of the stuff will happen at a planning meeting <coughs> This is from the Environment Commissioner Office of Ontario, their final report. A major portion of the report was specifically dedicated to sprawl because as the last environmental commissioner phrased it, Ontario suburbs are the equivalent of the oil sands. That, that is how she phrased it. If you look here, you have a chart showing that a GO bus reduces by 87% the amount of emissions in a city bus, a TTC bus, is 93% emission reduction compared to a car. Here, here is also from the Environmental Commissioner's Office. So the city's largely been operating off the growth plan. However, the Ministry of Finance shows, in fact, we have vastly more people coming than the planners have been told that they have to plan for. For Peel, we're looking at almost two, so about 240
thousand people. That's a lot, and most of them are going to come to Brampton. So we need to figure something out for the transportation situation and from a climate emissions point of view. When we talk about Brampton's emissions, we actually also count the highways. So if someone travels along the 407 without stopping in Brampton, the emissions on that count against Brampton. <laughs> if there is an additional highway added to Brampton, that will also count against Brampton, even if they don't actually start or end their trip here. So if we're going to have this, if we support this highway, then we need to come up with a way to offset this increase in emissions. So the idea is to promote transit because there literally is not a way you're going to meet your climate targets without a strong focus on transit. The logistics of electrification are such that even Tesla says that the mineral supply to get electrification of cars on a mass scale is an enormous threat to vehicle manufacturing because there are physically not enough minerals and the places where they're harvested from, war crimes are involved in acquiring these resources. So 47% for gasoline, Brampton Transit can largely take care of that, 12% is diesel. We've got multiple highway access, we're right by the airport, so if we wanna be a logistics hub, we need to think about how we're going to get our emissions down from trucking because we have a huge amount of trucking, all the warehouses, the highway access, and while for cars, electrification may be the best approach because of the distance freight has to travel and the refueling times, and there's weight caps on trucks, hydrogen may be the best approach. I believe Councillor Willens during the climate emergency had commented, there's a company in Mississauga that's working on that. We may want to look at doing pilots because most of the warehouses now, they're moving from lead acid batteries from their, for their forklifts to hydrogen. So since they're now consuming hydrogen on site already, it may be worthwhile to look at working with them to have pilots for hydrogen trucks. So now they're no longer spewing diesel exhaust. I'm sure you've seen those trucks rolling around Brampton with the black exhaust shooting out of them at every single light. That's lots of carbon dioxide, but also a lot of nasty stuff from a health perspective. So I would like the city to be a role model. Part of it's being an employer. You have a large share of the employment base in the city. It doesn't think of itself as an employer, but you are. Last council meeting you're talking about parking. About for staff, it's a case of if you continue to subsidize parking, by making driving the easiest option and actually going out of your way to make it easier, you're contributing to the problem. So by elimination of subsidies, it may not be terribly popular, but it will help reduce the amount of emissions. For downtown, having people take the bus, you do have a bus terminal very close to City Hall, and if you count the square as part of City Hall, the Zoom bus literally stops next to City Hall. This picture is from your budget. This shows just how many people fit in a bus compared to cars. This will dramatically help your situation for traffic in downtown too. So it's, the requests are to look into hydrogen pilots to deal with logistics companies such as freight, and then also look into bus expanding transit, but then also as an employer, work towards having subsidized transit passes. You think that, well, so here's the thing. You think that transit is subsidized, but your parking garages are also subsidized. They do not actually recover enough to pay for how much money it costs to build them. You're the, even for the public, they're subsidized. So transit is subsidized, but you're subsidizing the parking anyway too, and you're subsidizing staff on top of the subsidized rate. That's my pilot. That is my presentation. Thank you, Sylvia. Apologize for a little mishap here. Uh, we have Councillor Pleshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> before I move receipt of uh, the delegation, um, I just wanted to um, set the record a little bit straight about some of the um, uh, media outlets decided to go after uh, Brampton on um, <clears throat> supporting the um, climate change and then also supporting um, what some of the media outlets decided to call four-lane highway, and that's not what we did. We supported uh, an environmental assessment of the need for something to be out in, in the Northwest, and we also talked about two-way all-day go. 
Um, and we also set that uh, goal, like Armajat Sandhu, uh, MP from Brampton West, had stated um, after moving the motion to uh, go back to the 2015, because in 2015, that was prior to the, um, the group of, of people that the province, uh, the then province had put together to look at um, and eventually shut down the, uh, the process of, of the EA. So we're not saying that it's a four-lane highway. We don't know what it is. <coughs> we're just supporting an environmental assessment to determine mm -hmm. what we need out in the northwest. And, and one of those items um, is, is definitely two-way all day code. Mm -hmm. We needed it 10 years ago, not mm -hmm. five years from now. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, I didn't mean to pass any kind of values judgment on improving no, I'm, it. No, I was it's taking your opportunity. I was taking okay. the opportunity that you provided me just to get it out there, and I'm not saying that you that you had said that. But happy to move receive the delegation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Yep. So, um, no other speakers. Moved by Thomas Question. All in favor? I see some hands. Yep. Do we? All in favor? There. Good. Thank you. There's not enough hands up. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to move to the final delegation, also you, mm -hmm. do you want to start? you got five minutes. <laughs> All right. So last, yesterday it was added to the staff report on the situation for the funding for transit. And well, the province is not very forthcoming on the delivery of federal funds for it. And one of the things in there is for the bus depot, there is a big amount of provincial and federal money going to that and you're going to need that my concern is because of I, were, I was there when the report was delivered to council basically saying we need this as soon as possible or else and w with not very good consequences if we delay it any further and the concern is if you are trying to wait for that money it may take time and it may have adverse consequences so what I would like council to do is to commit to funding that bus depot. If you, I'm sure the head of Brampton Transit can explain that there's a lot that the situation has, there's, we haven't had a less need for the new bus depot. We've had a greater need for buses since the original report was delivered to council. Transit has continued to rise faster than expectations. And that, that you have to manage that somehow. So sometimes council needs to decide what is the most important things. It's the Center for Innovation. I know you all really want that, and I totally understand why you want that. However, sometimes you need to ask, do we need this as soon as possible, or are there other projects that the city has that must be done immediately and have to have that ball rolling? You may need to look at whether you pull back some of the planned spending on the Center for Innovation, and wait a couple of years because if you don't have this bus depot, you will come up with a situation, you now need to buy multiple years worth of buses all in one year. And that's very hard to come up with the money for. But it's not just that. These pieces of equipment have, have wear and tear and you need to replace stuff. So it's not just the purchase of this, it's that in six years when they need one component of that, I believe some of the components are every six years and some are every eight years that they need to be replaced. If you buy a double core cohort now, think of back when we got rid of grade 13, that posed a lot of problems for the province then, but also there were years of ramifications after that. If you have to buy a double cohort of buses, you're talking about affecting the city budget for 20 years. And that's if you delay it by a single year. That's not counting the fact that prices may have changed. It may become more expensive in the future to build it. And the system is at capacity right now. In February, the snow, there was a huge amount of snow. One would think that with all of that and all the traffic, the buses would have become even less reliable and less likely to make their time frames. That didn't happen. And the reason for that is the buses are so overcrowded that at every stop on some of the lines, the amount of time to get people off and get people on has now eaten so much into your reliability that dealing with ridiculous amounts of snow that we have not seen in a long time was actually less of a problem to deal with. The situation is not going to magically get better if you don't buy the buses. So it's, I would like council to commit 
that they will build that new bus depot, regardless of if that provincial money comes. If the province decides to upload transit and you fund this with that, well, then they get the debt too, because it's built into the transit department. So effectively, you've created a poison pill if the province decides to seize your transit department considerations for how to fund things. That's my delegation. Councilor Santos. Thank you. Get on the board and I'll get, get you on. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Sylvia, for the presentation, and I'm happy to uh, receive the delegation and also move the report. I am in support of the staff recommendations in this particular transit uh, report. I think um, staff have done a good job in doing their due diligence to find a solution and a workaround given the uncertainty that we are facing right now with the province. Um, certainly things have to get going now in order to build what we need four years from now. So I support this report and the recommendations and hope that my council colleagues will as well. Thank you. And um, so there's no other speakers and moved by Councillor, uh, the receipt of the delegation moved by Councillor Santos. All in favor? Sorry? In approval of the uh, recommendations. Um, so that was moved. We'll move it again. Uh, we'll vote again. All in favor of the recommendations? Carries. Thank you. So finally, we're done the delegations. We're going to move on to um, the agenda, uh, which is economic development and uh, culture. Um, there's no staff presentations, uh, reports, so recommendation, uh, 7.2.1, uh, transfer of public art investment funds. Does anybody want to move that? Councillor Williams. Councillor Vicente. Okay, uh, all in favor? Carries. No correspondence. Um, council's questions, councillor's question period, 7.5. Oh, I missed them. 7.3.1, innovation in post-secondary matters update. There's nothing. Okay, correspondence, none. Council question period, none. Public question period. Uh, you have a five lim minute limit regarding any decision made under this section. Is there any member of the public who'd like to ask a question? Seeing none, uh, we're going to move on to uh, corporate uh, services, and I'd ask that uh, Chair Singh come up. Uh, staff presentation. I think this was uh, in consent. So moving on, uh, I see everything in consent until 8.2.6, uh, which is the assessment of the implications of waiving snow. Or was that uh, discussed during the delegation? No. Okay, so it's still before us. So does that anybody have any comment for 8.2.6? Uh, Councillor Vicente? Uh, so uh, we've now seen um, at two different meetings where members of the public have come forward to request that uh, council consider a uh, waiving of um, administrative fees related to them not having cleared the snow from their sidewalks. And um, I think that um, we have a report here that recommends that council makes no change. Um, that certainly would be consistent with um, a, uh, a vote that we had here at this table beforehand. Um, and keeping in mind that uh, a little bit later we're going to be talking about uh, winter maintenance, is there any member of council who um, has any comments on the recommendation? Do they wish to ch have change it in any way, shape or form? or defer it until after we've had the discussion later on? Seeing none, then I'll be happy to move the recommendation in the report. Mr. Chair. Oh, Councillor Fertini there. 
Thank you through the chair. I just wanted to ask, so when we're sending these notices out, are we doing registered mail or are we just going to leave them there? Or like that person said, he didn't receive them. Uh, it's our word against us, and I do believe he did get it, but we also think we did get it. So. We do not send it register mail. We post it on the, on the door. door. Okay. And this is just so that we you understand, the bylaw does not uh, comply us to issue an OTC. We're simply doing it right. as a courtesy to the residents okay. to provide them with an order to comply. Just to, I feel kind of bad when they come here and say, I didn't receive anything. And it's our word against theirs. Okay, just ask it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion to receive uh, uh, three approve the recommendations by Councillor Vicente. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, moving on, uh, other things were dealt with in consent except uh, 8.2.9, uh, which is the uh, Mayor and Councillor's expense policy proposed amendment. Uh, Do anybody have any questions? Okay, Councillor Williams wants to move it. Uh, all those in favor? No. no? So, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. So this is an information report that uh, presents the amendments that committee has considered. So presumably then the committee is accepting all the amendments. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Williams has moved it. All those in favor, please show your hands. Okay, that carries. Uh, 8.3.1, Councillor Fortini, you had requested a discussion on driveways. Okay. So are you not, is that a motion to defer? So through you, Mr. Chair, if we're deferring it, it's deferring to the next committee of council meeting the first week of September? Yep, I think Councillor Fortini is okay with that. Um, motion to defer the discussion on driveways. All those in favor? Okay, that carries. Uh, Councillor question period. Does any of my peers have any questions? No. Nope. Seeing none. Uh, public question period. Seeing none, we are in the public work section. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members of council. Uh, we are now uh, in the public works and engineering section. We don't have any staff presentations today, and we've already uh, dealt with item 9.2.2. Would that be correct, Mr. Clerk? And items 9.2.3 through to items 9.2.7 are in the consent agenda. So our next item is item 9.2.8 a report on traffic and public operations through the Public Works and Engineering dated May 1st, 2019 regarding Vision Zero. Do any members have any questions? I have uh, a mover, I have Councillor Williams with some questions. Councillor Williams. Yes, um, thank you, through you Chair, to staff. Um, is there a list of roads that are being reviewed under the Vision Zero? Uh, I didn't really see any in the report. Uh, th through you, Mr. Chair. So, no, I don't actually have a specific list. It, it, it's meant to be citywide to, to okay. apply universally. So, as part of that, as we go through a program of looking at annually the stats about collisions, where they're occurring, and so on, we would focus our priorities on those and bring you that information. But in terms of the overall program of Vision Zero, no, there's no list because it is a citywide initiative. So, so you're saying, saying through you, Chair, that when you do have uh, an actual list of the areas that have had high collision rates, you'll bring that to Council at a later date? Uh, uh, yes, as part of our, our routine reporting on collisions. And then 
the other thing, and we mentioned it in this report, is that as we do a design of a, a, a particular roadway, if we're doing an environmental assessment, we would then, of course, incorporate Vision Zero with that capital project. Okay. When, sorry, final question to you, Chair. When do you see us uh, coming back with some kind of idea on those collisions in high hot spot areas? When is that coming? So if I, if I may, and I'm not sure we've, we've uh, given proper consideration of that, but I think it, it probably is an appropriate thing for us to have on our performance dashboard to, to give you an annual kind of reporting on how we're doing on that and, and to, uh, to show that. Doing it any more frequently than annual is difficult because we don't get the data from the police frequently enough on collision data to summarize it more frequently than, than annual. Could I request that we get it in the, in the fall, um, especially after the summer, after the winter and then after the summer, the fall might be a good period for us to receive an overview? Uh, if I may, through you, Mr. Chair, I just question, so are you speaking in about four months' time or in 16 months' time? No, four months' time, uh, of, and that would be a snapshot of the year. So certainly through you, Mr. Chair, we could provide information at that point. It would be base, it would really be baseline because we wouldn't oh. have implemented all of the changes, but it, it would still have value that way that we know what we're working from. So yes, we could certainly provide that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And seeing no further questions, just to note that uh, both uh, myself, uh, Councillor Santos, and the Councillors from Wards 2 and 6 uh, were briefed just recently on work being done on the Bouvard corridor. And the uh, corridor requires some updates and uh, reworking. and. Part of that work is going to now encompass uh, principles for Vision Zero to make the intersection safer, to reduce the chances of accidents on the turns and the light and the traffic lights. And so the city in so many ways, as the opportunities arise, um, is undertaking Vision Zero principles when they redesign and rebuild the various parts of the city. And so. Uh, City of Brampton is well on its way in this regard. So I have a motion from Councillor Fortini to move the recommendations in the report. Councillor Fortini is in the room, I see him. And so, all in favor of moving the report under 9.2.8? Carried. I next have items 9.2.9 .9 through to 9.2.12, which were on the consent agenda. So moving forward, our next item is new business. We have item 9.3.2, discussion on winter maintenance. This shouldn't take too long. Uh, we have a motion that was prepared uh, by staff to uh, encompass the discussions that took place this week at the workshop on winter maintenance and I'll ask the clerk if he can put the motion on the screen. Mr. Clerk. And uh, we'll just put this up, um, we'll put this up and um, have a conversation with regards to what is contained in the motion but also I would welcome uh, any uh, amendments or improvements or suggestions to the motion to make sure that we capture this and get it right because we all know that the residents are looking to this council to make improvements to our core services. So the motion reads, whereas members of council attended a winter maintenance workshop on June 10th, 2019, hosted by Public Works and Engineering Services staff and whereas part of this workshop during part of this workshop, members of council provided suggestions for consideration by staff regarding possible winter maintenance program and service delivery improvements, including but not limited to service delivery, service levels, and public communications and awareness. And therefore, be resolved that Public Works and Engineering staff be requested to report to Committee of Council before October, by October 2nd, 2019 on various possible winter maintenance program and service delivery improvements, including consideration of other service delivery models for completing winter operations, such as but not limited to in-house staff versus contracted staff delivery and its impact to winter and summer operations, increasing the service level, level minimum threshold 
for plowing on local roads from 7.5 centimeters to 5 centimeters and utilizing alternative removal and mitigation methods other than salt for service delivery and improved public communication, education and awareness programs related to winter operations to assist in managing residents' expectations and cooperations. That's the motion as read. I have a speaker on my board, Councillor Fortini. Thank Councilor. you. Just for clarification, where it says uh, roads from 7.5 centimeters to 5, and then it says other than salt. So that means we're not putting salt? Different methods? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So, so I guess my interpretation of what we heard from Council is to consider other methods as well. It wouldn't necessarily be to eliminate any use of salt, but it would not be to focus on simply increasing well, the amount of salt to do it. What methods? It's going to snow. We got to clean it or put salt. So, <laughs> so that there are other uh, other less uh, hazardous chemicals that that uh, can be considered, and okay. you know we I'll we wait. would come back to you with uh, with options. Thank you. If I could, Mr. Chair, just while I'm speaking, uh, it's probably important to point out that while this talks of a report coming back for October 2nd, uh, that report will then discuss our ability to implement changes for the coming winter. And I, and I would want to point out that, that that would be somewhat limited about our ability to make changes for this winter, though we would, of course, take whatever direction Council's giving us, and it would be more building it into subsequent programs as well. Thank you. I have Councillor Bowman. Councillor. Joe, do you want to speak before me or after me? Okay. okay. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. Um, this uh, motion talks specifically about maintenance programs and service delivery improvement options, but I don't see anything in here about additional costs for lowering the standard to five centimeters. What would that mean in terms of additional plows, additional manpower. It doesn't talk to whether that impacts our current contracts, which we have for seven years um, at 7.5 centimeters, our contracts are. And it doesn't talk to impacts on our um, unions and employees and union negotiations. So if we're going to do a fulsome report on these options, I think those points should all be included in what comes back to council. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that was my assumption that we would have to cover those issues off, some of which we, by October 2nd, we may not be able to have complete fulsome coverage of, but we would provide as much information as possible. Okay, do we need to include that in the motion or is that direction? Uh, I think it's clear to me, uh, I'd leave it to council whether you want it to be more explicit. If, if I may, uh, through the chair, challenge we have is that that October 2nd they they may not be done that analysis so I'm wondering if that could be delivered after October 2nd because I don't know that that has an impact nece necessarily on um, changing service levels uh, in whether that are identified in B and C and then the cost implications of that because as to you know Councillor Bowman's point that is a very complex issue uh, that not only has impacts to that that agreement we have with that con with the contractors it's also the qp agreement and the implications of that so we would need to have that fulsome discussion um and how that would be rolled up okay so i don't need to include that in the motion it's uh, as far as for for uh through the chair no uh, it's just if a third party consultant is doing the helping us do the assessment for a I don't believe they're going to be done in time to do October 2nd. We can stipulate as part of their contract when they're looking at public services, if this one piece, if it's possible to prioritize that that be done first in time for this, we can attempt to do that, but we may not have A done for October 2nd. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bowman. So just as a follow-up to uh, the CAO, um, is it then our understanding that without... Um, reports or work being done together between the city and KPMG that uh, works cannot provide council with the, an the uh, ask that is being placed here? 
to the chair, I, I'm happy to start, and Bruce, if you want to jump in. There's no reason why we cannot proceed on B and A, B, and C. B and C can be done, hopefully, in time for October 2nd with the cost implications, and then any uh, potential uh, impacts, either positive or negative, in terms of the ability to implement and meet for this this uh, this coming winter season. Uh, A hopefully will be done in terms of being able to present that with all the implications and cost options and impacts, uh, but it may that A may be done at a later date, say uh, November. So, uh, th uh, I was going to say through the chair, I am the chair. Uh, to the clerk, if we could pull A out and add it as a uh, third uh, resolution or a second resolution, and that will uh, encompass that to have a later deadline. My next speaker on the board, Councillor Fertini. Yeah, thank you. So, Joe, uh, if we don't have this done by October, that means we're not going to have no service. We're not going to have this ready for this winter coming. That means we're going to have to go out for the following winter. Uh, th through the chair to, to the commissioner's uh, comment, it would be ex going down to a five centimeter service level, whatever those cost options are, and depending on what options are chosen by council, we need to give the vendor enough time, whether it's additional uh, equipment, additional staffing resources to get all of that in place. And they may have enough time, it'll be really close to get that in place, they may not. Okay. So uh, I think to, to be fair and, and, and to Bruce's point, that was the concern is we can come back with that information and look for that direction. We may or may not have that in, in, in place for this coming winter season. Uh, and that's fair enough because I, they won't have time in October by the time we get the equipment. So since they're not going to have the time, I could see it. It's going on for next year, which is good for the 2000. Can we look at the contractor? It says, look, these single axles that carry six, seven tons, put them on the smaller streets and the bigger triaxle, put them on the, big, on the bigger street with a, with a wing and they could do the whole street the same six feet away from each curb. Because those big trucks can come on the small ones, and the small ones are too small for the big, bigger roads, like the older area, the build in the 80s where the roads are wider. Uh, three, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, Councillor. So some of those points were raised, uh, I think you raised on Monday. We, we're taking those back in consideration and looking at, like that would be part of our program review is to have a to look at that. Thank you. If I could, to help Council with the, the time frame, I think what I'm, I'm saying is that in the event that we get to the point where we've got information and you decide you want to drop to the five centimeter, for this coming winter, we could certainly take that as a goal and achieve it depending on weather patterns, but we may not be able to achieve it all the time because we wouldn't necessarily have all the extra equipment, have the space in our yards for all of that equipment and so on. So it's not that we would have to pause and wait a year, but we, we would have, it might be a phasing in period to get there, so to speak. Well, so then I'll off the board now. So, I, and, I, and I get that, but we might miss a storm or two. If we're, they're using the same equipment, they're still doing the same roads. So why would they need extra equipment? If I may, through the chair, to hit the timelines. So we could still hit the, the amount to get it down to five centimeters, but it may take us longer than the 24 hours. Right. Well, if so it went out to seven, you go all that five. It's the same route, same trucks, same everything. So. But you, but you might be going twice, two days in a row, so skipping a day. So I might get one. Okay, good. We got it. Thank you, Councilor Fertini. So uh, if, if Council were to make a decision in October that instead of going out for having to go out for every 7.5 centimeter snow event, but now having to go out for every 5 centimeter snow event, we would somehow need more resources? It's just going out more frequently, correct? Yes, so through you, Mr. Chair, and I don't really recall at the workshop, we discussed the, the labor laws that apply to how many hours a driver can actually drive a vehicle. So if, if we get a pattern of storms that are coming too fast or too frequent, that would limit our ability to necessarily get to that. that that's all I'm saying. I, I'm sorry, I'm in a way prejudging and trying to make sure that I don't disappoint you in the fall if I come back with some 
some uh, hesitation on our ability to deliver it right away. In, in, in other words, you're saying if, if the city were to experience on three sequential evenings, five centimeters of snow every single evening, that would uh, potentially pose a challenge. That's okay. it, exactly. Thank you. My next speaker, Councillor Plushy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I recall numbers coming at um, council, I don't know if it was this council or the or, or last council around uh, lowering that threshold. I think, so there's kind of a report all the, already out there, is that right? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. We did a report in, I believe it was 2015, uh, that had had numbers on it, so so we would update some of that information, and I'm not sure that, uh, that it's uh, exactly the, the way this motion is, that there's maybe a little bit of variation, but yes, some, quite a bit of the work's been done. It's really refreshing that. Okay, and then, um, so hiring an outside consultant to do what? If I can, and, and maybe I should defer to the CAO, but it, it's the follow-on to the KPMG, KPMG report to look at efficiencies within our organization and how we can approach uh, different things. So they would be looking at, particular in the case of this motion, uh, part A, which would look at how we deliver the service. Um, and uh, the opportunities for the balance to be shifted on in-house versus contracted. And is it typically, is, do we hire a consultant to undergo, to undergo something like this? Um, you know, a company that, that strictly looks at that, um, you know, the numbers, the service delivery, or is it somebody that actually is involved in, uh, in the field where they can kind of think of something outside of the box and I, I just keep hearing uh, some towns out west and some in Europe are, are doing things a little bit differently where they're starting on the inner streets and going out from there. They do main streets uh, when it's a certain amount of, of snow and they don't do the inner streets. But I guess kind of what I'm finding is when you travel down my street that hasn't been done and you go on to Kennedy Road that has been done, it's just snow from every street coming out and it's you're tracking all that snow so you know a minion like me i'm just looking at it saying wow maybe we should get rid of this snow first but or start from the north and go south because that's kind of the way the traffic's going but are there companies that would be able to look at that or are they strictly the numbers so if, if i may through the start chair the north Part, part of the what I'll call the phase two for the value for money assessments was in fact to look at those opportunities, KPMG. Sorry, Joe, give me a second. They're still laughing at my jokes. <coughs> Go ahead. The, the, the second phase to the value for money assessments and looking at those opportunities KPMG had identified, a number of which were alternative service delivery options, and, and part of it was looking at outsourcing further as well as um, looking based on this direction whether we should bring some of these things in-house to imp potentially improve service delivery. We're going out and look, doing an RFPQ, so we're looking for qualified vendors to look at every line of business for us. So we're looking for specialized firms who have done this type of work specifically for public works and, looking, and part of their scope of work is gonna be doing that type of benchmarking that you've identified. So we're looking for specialized firms who have that expertise to be able to do that, not just, you know, uh, bean counters and uh, that just look at you know pure and applied numbers as someone who understands the business mm -hmm. looking at those best practices from around the world uh, and in particular those who get significant uh, seasonal uh, precipitation events and how they manage that snow uh, that will uh, feed into looking at those efficiencies and opportunities as well and we'll be reporting back on that okay. thank you mr. chair thank you Councillor Pleshi my next speaker mayor <laughs> So I just want to add a little bit of context to this discussion. Um, I understand that we're all frustrated uh, um, with the, vo the volume of calls we had who felt that uh, the winter maintenance wasn't up to uh, par. And the last year was also particularly um, hard winter. Um, and I've, we've had a lot of talk over the last year about this seven-year contract. And whatever misgivings we may have, the reality is we're in the midst of regional governance review. And we're going to know in November uh, the reality uh, of, of what's expected. We have regional roads right now that are on a separate contract. They may become our regional roads. And so 
I would just put caution on anything significant prior to November when we could be in a position where we have to negotiate our own combined contract. Or, or, or maybe there won't be any review, but just be mindful of that November date approaching rapidly. And I, I don't think it hurts to get additional information. That's why I, I welcome this, this motion. Uh, but, I, but I'd say that we may have to do this all over again in November um, if, uh, if there's anything significant to the regional governance review. And I would note the regional governance review has been booted from August to November under the assumption that they didn't want anything interfering with the federal election. And so that means there's likely, it's likely not uh, a situation where nothing's happened. It's probably a situation where there could be change, and I think we need to work on that basis. Because we never want to be in a position where we renegotiate contracts in October then have to do it again in November. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next speaker, Councilor Medeiros. Thank you, Councilor Vicente. And um, I guess this, uh, to pick up on a delegation we had regarding uh, sidewalks and accessibility. So if we can put that in the motion uh, for us to also look at um, about that through, I guess, reducing the 24 hour. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, I think that was very pertinent to this discussion. Through you, Mr. Chair, that would be an amendment to add a D, Part D to investigate um, what you're suggesting is the city take on a program to clear sidewalks. Or look at the requirement of the 24 hours to reduce, Sorry, okay. to reduce it. And, um, and then after, I guess, look at where we have responsibility over sidewalks, or especially around bus stops, to ensure that they're cleaned. Um, I think it's an important uh, point not to lose the, the accessibility aspect to ensure accessibility is met. Because I, I did notice that, and uh, Chair Vicente was uh, pointing enough to nudge me to remind me to include this. So well done, Councillor Vicente. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. And so we, we have the motion that's uh, just being uh, completed uh, on the screen. Do any other members have any other questions or comments? So we'll just wait uh, for the clerk to be. Oh, Councillor Pleshy, by all means. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And really quickly, just with the last added item, the review of of, of 24 hour requirement. Um, with the in, is that the intention to reduce that 24 hour, so give them a shorter time frame to clear shorter their snow? Time frame, yeah. um, I may, Councillor, uh, the delegation uh, that uh, appeared earlier today raised the concern that uh, we require residents to clear the sidewalks within 24 hours after the end of a snowfall, which could mean uh, that uh, an entire day uh, the sidewalks are not accessible to pedestrians. And so if the city, uh, which, you know, Clearing the sidewalks is a responsibility shared by the city and by the residents. That's what we uh, discussed at our workshop this week um, for that requirement to be reduced, not just by residents, but also by city to increase the accessibility of sidewalks across the entire city. The floor is still yours. Okay. Um, and this is just asking for that to come back and, and to yeah, just capture in the report. Okay, thank you. I see no other speakers. You have the motion before you. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item is item 9.3.1, the minutes of the Brampton School Traffic Safety Council from June 6, 2000. That is in consent. Thank you. We have no correspondence. Our next item is Councillor's question period. Do any members have questions of staff regarding matters within the jurisdiction of this section? Seeing none, our next item is public question period. Do any members of the public have questions regarding any item covered under this section of the agenda? <coughs> Hello, see. my name is Sylvia. Um, so my question is on Vision Zero. One of the issues I've noticed throughout the city 
is I, it wasn't really mentioned in Vision Zero, is there's a lot of places where the light coverage of sidewalks is very poor. In Ward 3, I think it's like Shirley and Bach, the sidewalk, the crosswalks are actually not covered by the light. And so if you are a driver, because there is no stoplight, if you're going to make a turn, you wouldn't realize there's a pedestrian there until you're about to strike them. And there is apparently enough foot traffic that the city has put bus shelters in. So there's actual foot traffic and it's got school crossing signs. So I'd like the city to look at, could the city please look at in Vision Zero, please look at ensuring that crosswalks are better illuminated because some places it's very difficult for a driver to see a pedestrian that's actually in a crosswalk where they have the right of way. Thank you. Uh, so looking to staff, if you wish to comment or answer. Uh, three, Mr. Chair. So, so certainly the, uh, you know, Vision Zero is meant to be a complete, uh, complete review to uh, reduce any serious injury type collisions. So certainly we can, we can look at that. We, uh, the intent with Vision Zero, and maybe I should have emphasized that earlier, is to, to change the approach so the assumption is no longer that people will do the right thing, but that people are human and humans make mistakes. And whether you're driving, whether you're riding a bicycle, whether you're walking, whether you're on transit, you may make an error. And so the idea behind Vision Zero is that we make the system more resilient so that if you make an error, there's less chance of a bad outcome. So I, I would agree with the, with the delegation that uh, the lighting is an issue and, and we've got to look at the balance on that. We're doing a lot of upgrades with our LED street lighting and so, um, so we'll have to look at, uh, at those types of issues. In some places the light physically does not cover. It's not a question of, bad, of the light and the quality not being good. It's just there is no illumination for the crosswalk at all. Thank you. And, and I think that uh, as we mentioned before, one of the aspects of Vision Zero is that you apply it to new design and new development. And then in existing development, as the uh, infrastructure requires upgrades and resurfacing, you take advantage of that opportunity to uh, change the environment and the conditions to achieve the goals of Vision Zero. Any other questions? Thank you very much. So we are now done the work section. I now turn it on to Chair Santos to chair the community services section. Thank you. We're now at the community services section. There are only a few items, a couple items actually. So item 10.2.1, report from uh, Kathy Duncan, Manager Animal Services, Community Services dated May 6, 2019, regarding possible amendments to the dog bylaw. Um, do any members have any questions or comments regarding the staff report? Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kathy, I, I recall the meeting, um, I don't recall the discussion, um, and I've read the report. Can you give us kind of a high level of what has led up led us up to, you know, what we, why we have this here in particular, the absent councillor to my left, councillor Willens, um, request for this uh, to, uh, to come forward? Through you, Madam Chair, I'll do my best, councillor, however, I was not at that meeting. <laughs> might not have been either. either. Um, and so the uh, council directions are included, I think, as the background. Uh, my understanding is that the councillor in question had, um, questions and concerns related to the current bylaw and the wording thereof regarding the fact that there are no provisions to deal with specifically dogs left out of doors on an extended basis, whereas some municipalities do have those provisions written into their bylaws. And included in the direction was um, information related to looking at not only dogs left out of doors and the associated sheltering that they would require, but also the tethering of dogs for periods of time and the um, keeping of animals in vehicles. And so we have um, in here <coughs> included the SPCA's um, kind of the recommendations, um, but yet we, um, any changes that, that we want to make, we want, we would 
like to be made to protect dogs um, either outdoors or in vehicles uh, on leash. Um, we feel that we're confident with this bylaw that uh, it would be upheld. No, the recommendation, no, the, the information from legal was that um, the Municipal Act does not contemplate municipalities um, striking bylaws which are specifically directed at the welfare of animals. We can direct bylaws related to public safety, which is what we do when we're looking at dogs running at large or biting people or um, cats running at large, et cetera, but not when we're contemplating a bylaw that is specifically geared towards the welfare of animals. Uh, legal's perspective on that is that the Municipal Act does not permit us to do that and we would be open to challenge and that has occurred in some other municipalities, not many. Um, there have been a lot of changes over the past couple of weeks, which through you, Madam Chair, I'd like to make sure that Council is aware of. So at the time of writing of that report, uh, I indicated that the Ontario SPCA had given notice to the province that they would only be um, enforcing the legislation until the end of this month, the 28th of June. On the <clears throat> 17th of May, the, the province brought forward regulatory changes in an effort to try to ensure that um, affiliated humane societies not run by the Ontario SPCA could continue to enforce the Ontario SPCA Act. The report before you outlines the fact that currently the Ontario SPCA Act only permits enforcement either by police or by the Ontario SPCA inspectors or agents. Um, so municipal law enforcement staff are not able to or authorized to enforce that act. Um, other, mi other ministries, uh, such as the Ministry of Natural Resources or the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, don't have the authority to enforce that act. Uh, so it will be left to police after the 28th of June across the province to enforce. Um, the, the province then brought forward amendments to the act itself, which were passed uh, last Thursday, the 6th of June. Those amendments um, allow the province to appoint a chief inspector and that chief inspector is then able to appoint any person or prescribed class of persons uh, to enforce the OSPCA Act as inspectors. Uh, I met with the province on Friday and they're relatively closed mouthed at this point as to whether those inspectors could include municipal law enforcement staff but we did make it clear to them that in the Greater Toronto area, there is not an affiliated Humane Society or SPCA that has an interest in enforcing the legislation. There is only the provincial office of the SPCA and they have said repeatedly and very loudly and clearly that they will not do it. So um, I can say that the, the Peel Regional Police and York Regional Police and Toronto Police are not interested in taking it on no. for obvious reasons. Yep. Um, and I can say that already, even with the Ontario SPCA, um, animal services and the city are the ones that receive the most calls with respect to concerns by residents related to animal welfare. We redirect them, um, but uh, at this time, you know, it's my feeling that it's quite likely the province will allow municipal law enforcement staff to enforce the legislation. Uh, it's my feeling that there is not another agency in Brampton that has an interest in doing it, so it's most likely the expectation of residents will be that will be us. So there will likely be a need to increase staffing rather quickly um, and uh, certainly an increase to the requirements. In conversation um, with the province, uh, both through AMO um, and our own professional association, uh, every conversation has included the fact that they need to, they need to fund this mm -hmm. um, and it needs to stay at the provincial level because we, the other issue with changing the bylaw is that it doesn't provide for the same type of um, provisions that the SPCA Act does. Uh, you know, it's all well and good to go and if it's a minor concern, issue an order to comply and if the people don't comply, issue a provincial offence notice or a summons to court and take them to court. But in those cases where there's a significant concern, the animal's in serious distress, that needs to be remedied immediately and that can't be provided for in a bylaw. So. Well, 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Madam Chair. I corrected myself. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Majeros. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, I guess just uh, uh, following up on, on Councillor Kalashi, and I know this has been a passionate issue for Councillor Lawrence. So he he, uh, <laughs> he made sure that uh, he twisted my arm to make sure that I. Um, but I, I think the message is uh, I'd like to put forward, and uh, you talked about you know continue to do what staff's doing and sort of providing uh, that service as as you know there's no there's no other protective agency uh, doing that and. Um, uh, I know it's an important function, and, and I would be supportive of uh, further resources uh, to need it. I, I think we just need to ensure that I would suggest a communication uh, plan go along with it to let the residents know that, again, this is another uh, area in which the city had to step up due to uh, provincial action. But uh, thank you for all your work, and I know how passionate you are about it, and it's so important uh, to the community there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fortini. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you just put your seat. The dogs are left out in the winter outside. Yes. I've called. Yes. Who do we actually goes out there and says uh, the dogs have to be minus 30, have to be inside? Um, well, based on the legislation, they can be permitted to be left out, but they have to have adequate shelter provided. Right. Uh, so, at this point, all of those types of calls would have been forwarded to the Ontario SPCA. That's the agency that has been enforcing the legislation related to animal welfare. Yeah, I've called. Uh, I know there's one family, there's two or three dogs out there, there's minus 20. And they responded so long as they got water. They don't understand, I guess, water freezes at zero. But there's no shelter there. And, you know, like, you might get a husky, might be okay, but some other dogs won't. Uh, just this cruelty and there's, there's nothing they could do really. through you madam yeah. chair there, there have been ongoing challenges counselor with the spca and they are a charity they did receive funding from the province however it was 5.75 million dollars to cover the entire province with respect to enforcement um you know i've heard it compared to that that would essentially cover the number of special constables that are currently employed with the TTC. So we as a bylaws cannot do nothing? Can't put the owner outside, put the dog inside? <laughs> <laughs> Not through the bylaws, sir. See how it feels? Uh, one more other thing. I remember that, that dog that killed the other dog. How come when, so you get a certain dog, like a pit bull, it could be a German Shepherd or a Husky, uh, actually kills another small dog. They don't actually take the dog away. You know, once it tastes that blood thing, I have that old fashioned, it, it's very hard after uh, to, to control that type of dog. Meanwhile, we, we give it back to the resident and the poor person lost the dog. Through you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, you remember that incident? What happened I do, and, and as a matter of fact, what, what you don't know, likely, mm -hmm. is that in that particular circumstance, mm -hmm. Those two dogs were removed from the property. There was, we went through the court process. So that happened in September of 2017. Yeah. We held the dogs, two of them, um, and that process was finally concluded in the courts in April of 2019. Okay. So we had those dogs contained in the kennels at the shelter for very nearly two years. Uh, and the court did ultimately order the destruction of those dogs. So they were humanely euthanized and um, the owner did not seek an appeal with respect to that particular case. No, I wasn't talking, I know which one you're talking about. I'm talking about the one that, that had a Bichon, like my dog. The lady was walking on the sidewalk and that pit bull came out and grabbed it and dragged it to knock the lady down. She was crying and killed the dog. With the respect dog to that, with that particular case, uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, we never received appropriate evidence from that dog owner to support her allegations. And um, so we were in a position where we had some evidence, but not enough to move forward with a case. Thank you. Okay. And um, thanks for your very passionate stories and love for dogs, Councillor Fortini. Uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so do we, I know we were, we're, you were talking about the province and um, things are maybe changing with the OSPCA. Do we have a rough estimate on how much would the, we would be taking on 
um, financially if we were to absorb some of those costs? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, the SPCA is not able to provide those statistics. They service the area based on the regional municipality, so they did not break down their call volume uh, by municipality, so we don't know. Um, I would say, based on conversation with the staff that had done the job in our area, who told us quite clearly that in the region, the city of Brampton was their busiest area, that we would be looking at, um, at the minimum, uh, a, a, an additional supervisor and two to three investigative staff. To, um, in order to do what they uh, that, fill that gap. Yes. Okay. And the associated vehicles related to that. So is that potentially what we're looking at next year? Is that what we is that really what we could be faced with? Through you, Madam Chair, depending on what the province decides to do as far as who they will appoint as inspectors or agents, that could come as soon as June the 29th of this year. Of this year. Are we, to you, uh, Madam Chair, are we prepared for that? I don't know if you see this. <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Madam Chair, uh, you know, we, since we don't know what the province is actually going to do, and we've been in conversation with them um, about this since a uh, Superior Court decision was rendered in January. Um, and they've, had they've been gathering information but not sharing much about what their plan is. The um, amendments that were brought forward, the, the regulatory changes that were brought forward were done so uh, to the best of my knowledge and understanding without the knowledge of any of the stakeholders and the um, associated changes that were brought forward by the Act were done in consultation with affiliated humane societies but not necessarily municipalities prior to the amendments being brought forward and passed. So um, I, I'm trying to plan ahead. Uh, it's difficult recognizing as well that, you know, we know we won't be able to cover it with the staffing that we have. Um, and so ramping up to that level that quickly will be very difficult. Okay. And my Final question, um, seeing as how Queen's Park, I think they're recessing for the next four months or so, <laughs> will they, are they talking about making a decision um, at the end of, when they resume, or? Through you, Madam Chair, the, uh, I did meet with the province on Friday last week after the act was changed, and um, their comments were that they were looking at both the short term and the long term, that they intended to continue conversations with stakeholders. Ultimately, their plan is to change the act completely, mm -hmm. um, and they're looking to have that completed by the end of this year, which is a very aggressive goal as well. Um, so they have committed to staying in touch with respect to the changes and what they're, because we asked them point blank, will this include municipal law enforcement staff? And at, at that time on Friday of last week, they said, we're not sure yet who, who it will include. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Kathy. I think there's a common theme in what you said, which is depending on what the province decides to do on this, on Bill 108, on regional governance, <laughs> um, it is very uncertain and there are financial implications. Yes. So it is depending on what the province uh, decides to do. Um, can I get a motion to receive the report and the recommendations from Councillor Williams? All those in favour? Thank you, that is carried. Um, next item of the agenda is, I believe, and Mr. Clerk, correct me if I'm wrong, is item 10.3.1, but that was brought forward by Doug Willens, who is no longer here. That's correct. What would you recommend we do? Uh, committee could uh, decide to refer that to council next week or to defer it to the September 4th committee meeting. Councillor Fortini would like to speak to it. Thank you through the chair. So yesterday we were at a golf tournament and uh, uh, for a charity for the hospital and they had, they had someone speaking there that, you know, the short in wheelchairs. So I think uh, since uh, Councillor Wellens is so passionate for the hospital, he wanted to put a motion that we all put $200 each each councillor and that way they could buy uh, six wheelchairs for the hospital. This is not going to one individual, it's going to anyone that needs the wheelchairs and we might need it one day. 
and that's what the motion we wanted to put there. Put $200 each council to win so we could buy six wheelchairs for the hospitals. So, so do we need a motion for that? And you'll second it? And uh, we have a motion uh, from Councillor Fortini. Yeah, second seconder. by Jeff Bowman. Second by Jeff Bowman. All those in favor? From our expense accounts, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Opposed? That motion is carried. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Councillor Medeiros, you're on the board. Did you want to say something about it? Yeah, it's okay. Councillor Fortini stole my thunder. Okay. <laughs> Next item of the agenda is the ref is public question. No, councillor's question period. Do I it? Yes, point of order from Councillor Pileshi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I realize that what we essentially just did was a good thing, but I don't believe that any members of council should dictate to another member of council that they should be spending money out of their expense budget. So I think maybe we move that in terms of maybe requesting members of council. Okay, that's not how the clerk's office took it. So I just wanted to reopen and. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor, for clarifying that this is a request of $200 from their expense account and they could choose to do it or not. Um, Councillor question period, Councillor Bowman. Thank you. Through you. Madam Chair, sorry, Kathy, I just wanted to ask, it, it wasn't to do with the dog thing. Um, I just wanted to find out, we've, we've had um, a, a complaint which our um, bylaw people have looked at, a woman feeding rats in her backyard. The bylaw people went out there, talked to her, uh, and then got back to me and said, there's no bylaw against feeding rats in the city of Brampton. So, uh, I'm just wondering what, what, what is there that can be done because rats do potentially pose a health risk and uh, neighbors, neighbors in this neighborhood have been setting traps and catching literally four and five rats a night. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor, there's actually a rat population explosion in the GTA. So uh, whether or not people are intentionally feeding them, they're around and in significant numbers anyways. Um, and I certainly don't want to step on the toes of the bylaw enforcement staff, and we've had this conversation back and forth. My feeling is that there is provision in the property standards bylaw that, you know, includes that they have to keep their properties clean and tidy and, and not attract vermin. Um, <clears throat> so I'm certainly willing to have a conversation with you offline. There isn't anything in the, um, in the animal control bylaws that speaks to wildlife feeding. Um, truly, we didn't really feel like that was related to animal control. Um, but I, my understanding is that the property standards staff are looking to update that bylaw with respect to some of those provisions as well if they don't feel that they can ac accurately address things okay i would like to take that offline because this yeah. person is actively feeding them taking bowls out and putting them down and and through you again madam chair with, with all due respect there are lots of people out there that actively feed various types of wildlife but the wildlife can't read the memo about who it's supposed to be <laughs> for so <laughs> whether they're intending to feed rats or raccoons or coyotes because we had one lady uh now i remember that one yeah who is actively feeding the coyote because she liked to let her cat out and didn't want the coyote to eat her cat so <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll take this offline i just wondered where we can go with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we are now at public question period. Do any members of the public have any questions regarding a recommendation that was made by the committee today? Um, this section. Nope. Okay. Referred matters list, item 11.1 .1 is a list of outstanding business referred or deferred by council or a standing committee. The clerk reports quarterly with the list and it's available online. Uh, do any members have any questions about the referred matters list? Nope. Seeing none, public question period. I have, 
Yes, go ahead, Sylvia. Um, after a closed session, you read several motions and approved them. They did not appear on these screens, on the large screens. Was there any particular reason for that, or was that just an omission? Through you, uh, Madam Chair, it was an omission. It was I was provided them to the chair and councillors to read out. They will be included in the minutes. Okay, because normally the motions are on the big screens, too. And then um, for animal control, uh, given that we may be seeing several more people being offloaded to the city with probably without funding because that's how this province seems to roll, do we have any idea of what we're looking at so far in confirmed downloading to the city and what we might need to look at in order to increase revenues to make the budget actually balanced in the coming year? Thank you, Sylvia, for the question. We do have a workshop that's coming up talking about a number of these different things, I believe, on June 26. Um, and uh, also throughout the various conversations on Bill 108, regional governance, and even here now, and through government relations, we've been asking um, continuously for a tally of all these downloads and to mm -hmm. eventually make it public how much it's going to package cost the mm -hmm. taxpayer. Given that we may continue to see for four years more and more downloading, can we have uh, periodically actually see what the running total is? So there's a, a report that's coming to the region tomorrow to address this exactly. So I know you'll be there tomorrow, and maybe you could ask those questions then too. <laughs> Sorry, I got work. But I mean, like for the city specifically. For for the city specifically. Yes. Um, we will be bringing something forward. Where we are supposed to be having a town hall in the summer summarizing the impact of Bill uh, 108 as well. So all of that information will be coming forward then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we dealt with all the items under the clo in the closed session. We now are at adjournment. Uh, motion to adjourn. All those in favor, opposed. Motion carried. Have a great evening.